Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I call the Leader of the Government. Thanks. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion circulated in the chamber. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Uh, I move the motion as circulated and move the motion or, and ask the question be now put. The question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is the motion be put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith teller for the ayes. Senator Seawitt teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 48, noes 10. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt teller for the noes.
Thank you. The result of the division is ayes 48, noes 10. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I move that consideration of the Corporation's Amendment Corporate Insolvency Reforms Bill 2020 be postponed until after consideration of the National Emergency Declaration Bill 2020 and a related bill. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. Government business order of the day anti money laundering and counter terrorism financing and other legislation amendment oh, bill. Sorry, Senator Patrick, I was looking elsewhere. Yes, Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you. I seek leave to make a two minute, sta uh, two minute statement about uh, the order of business today. Leave is not granted. Leave is granted for one minute. Pursuant to contingent notice of motion, motion I uh, seek to, uh, to suspend standing orders insofar as it permits me to make a two-minute statement. Leave is granted for two minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr President, so here we have on the last day of sitting a, a, a motion to extend hours to deal with a number of bills uh, which will be uh, subject, likely subject to a gag at the end of the day. I have no problem with extending hours. I don't mind working the long hours, but there's a process problem here, and that is that uh, uh, we, we will get to the end of the day, we will have rolling divisions, and I point out that we'll have rolling divisions in circumstances where people don't get to have a chance to say about, uh, at the, about the bill, but perhaps more importantly about amendments. I watch uh, you know, the crossbench often play a critical role in amendments, and I watch uh, uh, One Nation. I watch uh, Senator Lambie come in here, listen to what is being said, and often make up their mind on the basis of the speeches that are made in support or against uh, particular amendments. Um, and so, what, what happens with these rolling gags is we actually end up getting a perverse outcome. Uh, well, sorry, these rolling divisions. We end up getting a, a perverse outcome where people haven't had the opportunity to properly consider. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the amendments that are before, uh, before the chair. This year we've seen, uh, and I understand that, that we had COVID, this year we, we've seen parliament rarely sitting, uh, flippant decisions made to cancel, cancel the, the sitting of parliament, uh, and that's led us to a situation where there, are, there is a backlog of bills. But I'll also point out that we're seeing bills come on and off in a willy-nilly fashion, quite disorganised, and it is uh, um, uh, symptomatic of a government that hasn't got their act together. Thank you. I call the clerk to continue. Clark. The government business order of the day: anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism <laughs> financing and other legislation. Member Bill 2019. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. Money laundering and terrorism financing are not just problems for Australia; they are global problems. They threaten Australia's national security and the integrity of Australia's financial system. This is why Labor is supporting this bill as it implements a second phase of reforms arising from the recommendations of the report on the statutory review of the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act 2006 and associated rules and regulations, the statutory review report tabled in Parliament on 29 April 2016. The bill will also address some of the deficiencies identified by the Financial Action Task Force in its mutual evaluation report on Australia's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing regime in 2015. It is crucial to note, however, that the bill does not address all of these deficiencies. Australia's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing regulatory framework Will, rem will remain non-compliant or only partially compliant with many of the recommendations made by the Financial Action Task Force in its 2015 Mutual Evaluation Report. Labor has consistently called for this government to ensure Australia's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing framework continues to evolve. Labor is concerned about the slow pace of reform by the Morrison government to improve Australia's ability to combat money laundering and terrorism financing. It seems quite unusual that the Minister for Home Affairs seems to be so disinterested in cutting terrorists off from access to their money, which is what strengthening Australia's financial crime legislation would do. Indeed, we have seen over the past few months, via the New South Wales Casino Inquiry, just how large the gaps are 
in Australia's AML CTF framework. Through the New South Wales inquiry, we have heard allegations of widespread money laundering and terrorism financing taking place in casinos through junket operations. These money laundering and terrorism offences have been taking place for years. The government knew all about the risk from with casino junkets because Australia's financial crime watchdog, Austrac, told them about the risks. In 2017, Austrac warned that the government that compliance by casinos appeared to be generally more with the letter than the spirit of the law, and casinos used these technicalities to absolve themselves of conducting robust due diligence in relation to the source of the funds presented to them. Of greatest concern, however, is that Austrac told the government that the current laws were not fit for purpose. This is a limited extent to which state-based regulation could be said to mitigate the gaps in Austrac's regulation of junkets. And what has this government done in response? Nothing. This government must do more. Australia cannot become a weak link in the global financial system and a soft touch for organised criminals around the world seeking to launder the proceeds of crime. I will also say that Labor has considered the Greens amendment. And while we support the intent of the additional designated services proposed by the Greens, Labor does not believe this is the right way to achieve considered law reform. We are concerned about the unintended consequences of this amendment and want to make sure our counter-terrorism financing laws make it harder, not easier, for money launderers or terrorist financiers. I'd like to conclude my remarks with these thoughts, Mr President. Money is the lifeblood and motivation behind organised crime and the ability to prevent money laundering and detect the flow of the proceeds of crime and terrorism funding is an essential part of deterring and disrupting serious crime and terrorist activity. The emergence of new technologies and faster and more efficient ways to move money around the world means that international cooperation between financial intelligence units has never been more important. They are powerful word, words, commanding, forceful. Sadly, they are only words. They are the rhetorical and empty words from the man who is responsible for anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing in this country, the Minister for Home Affairs. Since becoming minister, Mr Dutton has barely stepped up to the flat plate to fight money laundering and terrorism financing. Of course, he's not the first coalition minister to not deliver the reforms Australia needs. Since 2013, the coalition has repeatedly missed in its own anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing reform timetable. Australians are becoming more and more accustomed to this kind of governing. Government, this is government Scott Morrison style a Prime Minister who loves making announcements but doesn't deliver. Australians need a government that delivers. It's time for the Prime Minister to deliver on real anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing reform. Thank you. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. This legislation makes sensible and progressive reforms to Australia's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing regime, and the Greens will be supporting this legislation. However, this bill is quite remarkable. It's remarkable for what is not in it, rather than for what is in it. Once again, what is not in this bill is an expansion of the scope of Australia's anti-money laundering laws to include real estate agents, accountants and lawyers the gatekeepers as providers of designated services and require those professions to report to Austrac. These are the fabled tranche two reforms, promised right back in history, lost in the mists of time in 2006, but still yet 14 years later to be brought to this parliament. LNP governments, ALP governments have failed in their duty to bring these fabled tranche two reforms into this parliament so we can crack down on terrorism financing, so we can crack down 
on the international crime syndicates against whom Australians are bidding for homes at the moment, at auction, and competing for properties with in an already overheated property market that is pricing young people out of the great Australian dream of owning their own home. And part of the reason that so many people can't afford their own home in this country is because the international crime syndicates are buying them out from them, using their deep pockets to outbid them at auction and deny them their dreams of owning their own home. This is a gaping hole in the system that is meant to protect Australia and protect the world against money laundering and terrorism financing. Australia is now one of only six countries in the world not to have included the gatekeepers within the scope of anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing laws. And we are alongside such luminaries as the United States, China, Madagascar, Mauritius and Mongolia. The failure to include these gatekeepers by Australia and this handful of other countries is the weak link in the global fight against money laundering and terrorism financing, particularly money laundering through the real estate sector. As former AFP officer John Chevis recently told 60 Minutes, everyone in the world who is involved in anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism financing knows that lawyers, real estate agents and accountants are well used by people who have illicit wealth to transfer. Austrac estimates that $1 billion in suspicious transactions flowed through the Australian property market from just one country, which is China, in just one year in 2016. And you can bet your bottom dollar it's a lot more now. Yet this government, and as we've just heard, facilitated by the Labor Party, once again is failing to do what needs to be done to stop dirty money being laundered through the Australian real estate sector. I can only conclude that the major parties in this place are OK with prospective homeowners having to bid against terrorists and international crime syndicates at auction. I can only conclude that this government is more interested in appeasing those in the property industry that donate so handsomely and who benefit from dirty money going into real estate, uh, into real estate than it is in protecting Australia's integrity yeah. and reputation. We can only conclude that this government is happy to signal to the kleptocrats of the world, to the dictators of the world, that if they want a safe place to park their ill-gotten gains, then Australia is open for business. Because it's not as if the major parties don't know about this problem, and it is not as if they have not been warned. The Financial Action Task Force is the world's standard setting body for anti money laundering and counter terrorism financing, and you know what? Australia is a member. And in the Financial Action Task Force's 2015 Mutual Evaluation Report, they said, and I quote, Australia is seen as an attractive destination for foreign proceeds, particularly corruption related proceeds flowing into real estate from the Asia Pacific region. In other words, if you're from this corner of the world and you're looking for somewhere to launder your money, Australian real estate is top of the list. And of course, the Financial Action Task Force recommended in 2015 that real estate agents, accountants and lawyers be brought within the scope of the Act. And what have we had from this government? Deafening silence. Now it's interesting, isn't it? You hear a lot about terrorism from this government. You hear a lot about the need to crack down on terrorists from this government. Every time they need a look over here distraction, they roll out Minister Dutton and frighten Australians about terrorists so they can take away our country's freedoms and our country's liberties. But what do you get when you propose cracking down on terrorism financing? When you propose trying to take a bit of the heat 
out of the massively overheated property market in this country so more Australians have an opportunity to buy a home. What do you get from the government? Crickets. Absolutely nothing. In 2018, the Financial Action Task Force follow-up report noted Australia was still not compliant with international standards. Again, crickets from the government. And interestingly, the Financial Action Task Force was due to arrive in Australia last summer to begin a new round of evaluations. They never came. Why didn't they come? Still hasn't been an explanation from government. And it's not just the Financial Action Task Force. There's been a plethora of other people calling on the government to plug this dirty hole in this country where the dirty money flows. In 2017, the OECD recommended that Australia address the risk that the real estate sector could be used to launder the proceeds of foreign bribery. In 2019, the IMF called for real estate agents, accountants and lawyers to be listed as providers of designated services. And earlier this year, the Tax Justice Network said that Australia is undoubtedly a host of significant quantities of illicit funds from outside the countries. Even the banks, even the banks want this fixed. Here's the Australian Banking Association in 2017. The ABA recommends progressing tranche two reforms as a priority. It is vital that Australia closes the current gaps in the Australian money laundering terrorism financing regime. Now I'll tell you what, when the government's lagging behind the Australian banks on money laundering, my word, you know something rotten is going on in this country. This is a government of its mates, by its mates, for its mates. And this Prime Minister is the Property Council's Prime Minister. The failure to include lawyers, accountants and real estate agents within the scope of anti-money laundering laws has turned Australian property into the washing machine of the Asia Pacific. And that is why the Greens will be moving an amendment to this legislation which would require the government to introduce into this parliament by 1 July next year an amendment to the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act to expand the scope of the Act such that lawyers, conveyances, accountants, high-value dealers, real estate agents and trust and company service providers are providers of designated services and are subsequently reporting entities. Now, the Australian Labor Party have just got up and, uh, with a small caveat, have made effectively the same speech I did wringing their hands about how long it's taken to bring in these fabled tranche two reforms. Yet then Senator Kitching got up and said that even though they agreed that these reforms should be brought in, they weren't going to support the Greens amendment, which would actually require these reforms to be brought in within six months. Now, let's make no mistake about it, the Australian Labor Party gets plenty of donations from the property sector as well. And here we go again. Dirty money buying outcomes in this parliament from the major parties and, ironically, on legislation that's actually supposed to be about cracking down on dirty money, cracking down on money laundering. And who can forget Mr Bowen before the last election? grandstanding away in the Australian media, promising that Labor would introduce these reforms, saying how terrible it was that the Liberal National Party hadn't done it. And then the first chance the Labor Party gets to put its money where its mouth is, they squib it. I mean, what actually is the point of the Labor Party in this place? What is the point of them? The refugee-torturing, neoliberal, coal-hugging, strip-mining our order. forests party. Senator, Senator Kitching on a point of order. I'm loath to interact with Senator McKim on this, but I do think that that's a breach of Standing Order 193, Sub-Order 3. Um, I didn't hear anything that was personal in nature, Senator Kitching. When 
Um, insults, despite them being objectionable, are not are directed collectively. That doesn't necessarily mean they're a personal reflection, as long as the language is not unparliamentary. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I stand by that description uh, of the Labor Party, and I repeat again just what is the point. And uh, seriously, there is no argument for the Labor Party not to support the Greens amendment. And I'll make a prediction. I'll make a prediction here. This amendment will fail for one reason only today, and that is because the Labor Party are not going to support it. If the Labor Party had supported our well, uh, if the government wants to support our amendment, uh, Senator Cash, I look forward to it, and I will congratulate you if you get up and say you are going to support it. And uh, I am uh, at the moment not talking about you, um, but you can place your position on the record, and I'll respond to that in due course. But, but on the basis uh, that I think uh, I stand to be corrected, but I do think it's unlikely that the government will support our amendment. Um, if that is the case, then it will fail for one reason and one reason only, and that is the that the Labor Party has squibbed it. And of course, why have they squibbed it? Because they want to look after their donors in the property industry as well. And I say this to the Labor Party. I say this to the Labor Party. By failing to support the Greens amendment this morning, you are placing the interests of international crime syndicates and the finances of terrorism around the world ahead of the interests of ordinary Australians who want to buy an affordable home for themselves and their families. That is what you are doing today by indicating that you will not support it. And just on your excuse, just on your Weasley pathetic excuse, Senator Kitching, I will say this. I will say this. To talk about process and to talk about needing to make sure things are done carefully, it's been 14 years. It's been 14 years. I mean, how much longer do you need? 14 years since these fabled reforms were promised. As I said, lost in the mists of time. And yet, even though we have done the responsible thing in our amendment and offered a six-month window to the government—in fact, uh, over six months window—for the government to do the work necessary, to do the consultations necessary and to bring it in to this place, that's still not good enough for the Labor Party. What even is the point of them? So we're very disappointed, obviously, that Labor is not going to support our amendment. I hope that the government will, and we'll wait to see what Senator Cash says about this. And as I said at the start of my speech, this is an unobjectionable bill that the Greens will support. But this is a massive missed opportunity to crack down on money laundering in this country, to crack down on terrorism financing in this country and do something, just something, to take the heat out of the housing market, to allow more Australians, particularly young Australians, an opportunity to buy their own homes. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just give a, a short contribution today on this bill. We obviously have a very full agenda ahead of us. However, just before getting started on this bill, and, and Senator McKim just spoke a lot about uh, the interactions with uh, uh, donations to political parties in that speech, but I will remind those listening that the largest single donation ever in Australian political history was to the Greens Party. Uh, uh, and uh, it is greatly ironic that Senator McKim gets up in here speaking about an anti-money laundering bill uh, and turns it in to an attack basically on the Labor Party. Now, whilst I, 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 would, I would never stop the Greens and Labor uh, fighting with each other over the other side of the chamber, I, I think it is very important to remember that anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing is actually an extraordinarily important issue. Um, 
who knows, um, to the future of this country. And this is an area where we are in, as a nation, a constant arms race. In a constant arms race. Uh, the techniques used Order. by criminal organisation, by terrorist organisation, are constantly changing, constantly evolving, and so the law in this space must constantly change and evolve with those who wish to involve themselves in illegal, activ illegal activities or the financing of terrorism. Uh, now, obviously, this government is absolutely committed to strengthening our anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing regime. We are reducing compliance costs in this bill by around $3.1 billion over 10 years by allowing industries to work more closely together to discharge customer identification and verification obligations. We are improving and streamlining obligations relating to correspondent banking relationships, customer identification and verification procedures the sharing of financial intelligence and cross-border reporting of monetary instruments. And we're also addressing barriers to the successful prosecution of money laundering offences. Uh, the bill also makes it an offence for a person to dishonestly represent that a police award has been conferred on them. And obviously we had uh, a situation in West Australia quite recently involving a member of parliament with uh, uh, particular claims of uh, a particular history of um, uh, police uh, service that turned out not to be true. Uh, so again, I do not want to make this a long contribution. We do have a lot of material to get through today, but this is an extraordinarily important area of law reform and something that this government is strongly committed to, and I commend the bill to the House. Senator Henderson, thank you for your flexibility in your speaking list then. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. It's my uh, great pleasure to rise and speak on the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 2019. Uh, the Morrison government's focus on keeping Australians safe is, is one of our most important priorities, and this bill is, uh, represents further measures to keep Australians safe. It's a critical element of our commitment to dismantle the criminal business model that this bill passes, and I am pleased to hear that uh, this bill is receiving the support of all parties in the chamber today. I, I do note Senator McKim's comments and his reservations, and I respect the fact that he has got some reservations, but in referring to Senator McKim's contribution, I do want to just take note of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, which conducted an inquiry into the bill and made a recommendation of, um, shared by all members of the committee that the bill be passed. And uh, Senator Wish Wilson, in his opening paragraph, in terms um, in relation to the Greens' additional comments on that inquiry, said, "On the whole." This bill makes sensible and progressive reforms to Australia's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing regime. So that was the opening position of the Greens. Now, I understand the Greens are seeking uh, an amendment in relation to including real estate agents, accountants and lawyers as designated services under the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act. 2006. I appreciate that, but it is important to reiterate the Greens' strong support for this bill, albeit that the Greens is seeking uh, an amendment. It is always um, interesting to hear the Greens and Labor at each other's throats in this place, uh, and I do. Um, I won't. I certainly won't take issue with Senator McKim's statement. What is the point of the Labor Party? And. A very strong point, and so hopefully, when the Greens are thinking about their preferences at the next election, they might reflect on that, uh, because we have seen a, a very sorry history. No matter how much the Greens Order. are at odds with the Labor Party and, and how disgusted they are in the Labor Party, we do see a situation at elections where the, the Greens roll over. They they don't tend to look at the substance of what other parties are offering, including our party, and they will roll over and do a cosy, cosy deal with Labor in exchanging preferences, as does the Labor Party. 
And that certainly uh, happened very uh, sadly in Corangamite when I was running in the last federal election. So I hope that all Australians can reflect on that very profound statement of Senator McKim, what is the point of the Labor Party? And of course, Senator Watt, many Australians did ask that question at the last federal election when Mr Shorten was your leader, and of course they made a very uh, significant decision not to, not to uh, put the Labor Party into government. This is a very important law reform. And just very briefly, and I'm just going to make a, a brief contribution, uh, the bill implements a range of measures to strengthen Australia's capabilities to address money laundering and terrorism financing risks uh, and generate, to generate greater regulatory efficiencies. And it includes amendments to expand the circumstances in which reporting entities may rely on customer identification and verification procedures undertaken by a third party, uh, amendments to explicitly prohibit reporting entities from providing a designated service if customer identification procedures cannot be performed. It strengthens protections on correspondent banking by prohibiting financial institutions from entering into a correspondent banking relationship with another financial institution which permits its accounts to be used by a shell bank and it requires banks to conduct due diligence assessments before entering and during all correspondent banking relationships. The bill expands exceptions to the prohibition on tipping off to permit reporting entities to share suspicious matter reports and related information with external auditors and foreign members of corporate and designated business groups. It provides a simplified and flexible framework for the use and disclosure of financial intelligence to better support combating money laundering, terrorism financing and other serious crimes. And so I just also want to make the point that in relation to Senator McKim's contribution, where he tended to focus mainly on the real estate market, the bottom line is, in this country, anti-money laundering is not acceptable in any form, for any purpose no matter what it is, and that's what this bill is all about. It also addresses barriers to the successful prosecution of money laundering offences by clarifying the existence of one Commonwealth constitutional connector is sufficient to establish an instrument of crime offence, and by deeming that money or property provided by undercover law enforcement as part of a controlled operation to be the proceeds of crime for the purposes of prosecution. The bill also expands the rulemaking powers of the Chief Executive Officer of Austrac across a number of areas. And another important amendment, the bill amends the AFP Act to make it an offence for a person to dishonestly represent that a police award has been conferred on them. So, Acting Deputy President, uh, this is very important law reform. Uh, the Morrison government is committed to doing everything possible to stopping criminals from exploiting hard-working Australians and their families. We are committed to combating transnational, serious and organised crime, and that's why this bill is so important, and, and I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Scar. Mr Acting Deputy President, I think Senator McKim might have been watching a bit too much Netflix over the, uh, over the, last, two, over the last year. Obviously, he's, he's watched a lot of episodes of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, which I must say is one of my favourite spin-offs of, uh, of, uh, of a TV series. But he seems to have this view that the Australian legal profession is infested with uh, people who are prepared to engage in money laundering practices. And the reality, the truth of the situation is far, far removed from that. With respect to my profession, the legal profession, and I note that uh, Senator Watt across the other side of the chamber is an extremely honourable member of that uh, most noble, noble profession and practised with great distinction in my home state of Queensland. And who knows where that may lead Senator Watt in the future. I, I should say, I should say, 
that uh, the legal profession has many, many legitimate concerns with respect to the extension of anti-money laundering laws to the profession. I just want to quote from a submission from the Australian Law Council. And I note Senator McKim often refers to submissions from the Australian Law Council, and I myself do the same thing. And in this regard, this is what they said, and I quote, if a client is not able to rely, and this is, I should say, this is in the context of anti-money laundering legislation. So I'll go to the start of the quote again, and I quote, if a client is not able to rely on the security of client legal privilege from the very outset of their relationship with their solicitor or barrister, it risks diminishing the effective and proper administration of justice." End quote. That is from the Australian Law Council. So when the Australian Law Council raises legitimate concerns, legitimate concerns with respect to the extension of any money laundering legislation into the domain of their profession, I think I think we should all in this place play great heed. And this isn't some sort of rhetorical flourish or some sort of hypothetical. The reality is that actually in Canada, in Canada, the Canadian High Court has actually struck out parts of Canadian anti-money laundering law on, the, on that very basis. On that very basis, Mr Acting Deputy President, that it inappropriately infringed upon that all-important lawyer-client professional privilege relationship. So this isn't fanciful stuff. This isn't Senator Scar getting up and, and seeking to uh, put obscure hypotheticals. The fact of the matter is that the Canadian High Court, the Canadian High Court actually struck down some of the Canadian anti-money laundering legislation on the basis that it improperly infringed upon that lawyer-client professional relationship, that extremely important uh, client privilege relationship, which, goes, which is one of the things that goes to the heart of rule of law in our country. Well, it, I'll take that interjection from Senator McKim. These are very complicated issues. Very complicated issues, Senator McKim. Very complicated issues. And if you, if you don't take appropriate regard with respect to institutions such as, such as lawyer-client lawyer professional privilege, then you'll get the result that they got in the, into in Canada, where the Canadian High Court actually struck down anti-money laundering legislation because it inappropriately infringed on that all-important lawyer-client professional privilege. In relation to real estate agents, which Senator McKim referred to, and I must say, I, the, the characterisation of this, of Australians going to their local auction and competing in bidding against money launderers and terrorist organisations, etc., and as they're bidding against each other, the price of houses go up and up and up. It did, it did, it did, tend, it did tend to go into the realms of fant fant fantasy, absolute fantasy. Absolute fantasy, Senator McKim. The last auction, look, I, I like many Australians. I like many Australians go to my local auctions in my local area. Can't resist myself. Can't resist myself. I tell my beautiful wife Louise, I'm happy where we live. I'm happy where we live. We don't need to move. Very happy where, where I live. But we can't resist the urge to go to auctions in our local neighbourhood. And I must say, I must say, when I attend my local auctions, I don't see them particularly well populated with money launderers and terrorists and others bidding up auction prices um, so that good, hard-working Australians are kept out of the property market. Quite, um, quite the contrary, actually. Quite the contrary. I, I just have, uh, I, I think, uh, Senator McKim's flourish, and he, he, he does give great rhetorical flourishes, I must say. And I've been in this place for nearly 18 months, and I do admire watching Senator McKim talk. Sometimes some of the phrases are somewhat repetitive somewhat repetitive, government for the mates, by the mates, etc., etc. There's a few stock standard phrases that get repeated from time to time, but he's extremely effective in what he says. But I think Senator McKim lets himself down. He lets himself down when his rhetorical flourishes enter into the world of fantasy. I think it actually erodes, erodes from his arguments. So the practical concern that has been raised by real estate agents across this country is that the vast majority of real estate agents do not come into contact with money laundering activities, the vast majority. 
and the figure that I've seen in the literature that I've read is in the realms of 80 to 90 per cent of real estate agents are not at all exposed, not at all exposed to the activities of, of those who launder dirty money. So in this debate, as with everything that comes before this chamber, I think we have to strike the right balance. We have to strike, strike the right balance between regulation that promotes the rule of law, regulation which promotes identifying the rotten fruit which uh, grows from the evil tree of uh, organised crime and terrorist activities, etc. I think we need to balance that concern, legitimate public concern, with the cost of regulation that would be imposed upon a whole range of professions if Senator McKim were to have his way. And I think that the bill before the chamber strikes the right balance. And I think Australians should be heartened, in fact heartened, that both the coalition and the Labor Party in this place sees the bill as striking the right balance. I think that's a pretty good touchstone, actually. I think that's a very good touchstone. The last point I'd like to make is I commend the provisions of the bill which deal with identification procedures. Now, in my prior life, I've had, the, uh, I've had cause uh, as a company secretary and general counsel I have to deal with these what are typically called know your customer, KYC, know your client, know your customer identification procedures. And I can remember in one occasion dealing with a finance transaction where there were 10 banks involved having to produce folders and folders of personal identification data. And going through that process, all the parties in that transaction going through that process, that repetitive administrative process, was, in my view, in my view, an example where there were opportunities for regulatory savings to be made if, if businesses could meet their obligations in a more cost-effective manner and streamline the customer experience with respect to those know-your-customer identification procedures. And it's actually estimated that the streamlining of those procedures, not undermining, not undermining, not undermining the actual intent of the, of the legislation to tackle money laundering, not undermining that intention, but it is considered that the reforms which are contained in this bill will result in potentially a gain of 80 per cent reduction in the costs of customer verification, an 80 per cent reduction in the costs of customer verification. And that has to be a good thing. And these arrangements are expected to generate a regulatory saving of about approximately $3.1 billion over 10 years. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'm very pleased uh, to commend this bill to the chamber. Senator McLaughlin. Acting uh, President, I rise to speak uh, to the anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism, financing and other legislation amendment bill, and I'd like to um, associate myself with many of the remarks of Senator Scar, who, like myself, has spent some time in regulatory and corporate positions. I would start it. Oh, well, I'll get to Senator McKinn in a moment. I, don't, I actually do have, um, whilst I don't have much knowledge or a great deal of knowledge, unlike my honourable friend uh, Senator McKim in the property market, but I would have thought when I was listening to his uh, submission or um, contribution to the debate that these provisions would act upstream to, uh, to regulate or observe the flow of the money before they came into the real estate's bank accounts. So I'd have to say, uh, in response to Senator McKim, I wasn't entirely convinced by his arguments, and uh, I'll reflect on those part after the debate. Uh, I do notice, with some interest as a legislator, that we are also, on um, Part 7, uh, putting in provisions to dishonestly represent the conferral of police awards, which is an interesting uh, amendment in what is a very uh, complex and considered bill uh, addressing money laundering and counterterrorism. I should reflect that I've always found it uh, of interest that some people feel they need in life to confer on themselves awards for personal advancement, and certainly uh, I would endorse those amendments since uh, police officers work very hard and contribute much to our security and society and our sense of safety, and uh, their awards uh, are justly deserved and they should not be undermined by the actions of those 
seeking to improve their own standing, social or otherwise. But back to the substantive matters of the bill. Uh, I too have had to grapple with the compliance obligations associated with anti-money laundering, and I fully endorse uh, the, the thrust of this legislation and the acts that came before it and will come after. It's certainly an area of law which is, has to be constantly revisited and readdressed. We are fighting an ongoing battle with an innovative uh, crime syndicates who are, who are constantly trying to undermine our regulatory arrangements. As a consequence, we must be increasingly flexible as a legislator, as a parliament, to be able to address these things. Uh, at the same time, every time we try to uh, shut the gate, as it is to uh, a particular innovative measure, we increase compliance costs on the industry, and those compliance costs are then inevitably passed to the client or the, or the, or the Australian, or the ordinary Australian that deals with financial institutions. So we need to be also very careful and, ba and balance our response that we don't increase the costs for the ordinary Australian. The same Australian that Senator uh, McKim was pointing out is having to, in his view, suffer from higher house prices, although I don't necessarily accept that point. So we have a trade-off. And it is pleasing to see that this legislation, uh, when if passed, will reduce the compliance costs. I know, uh, in an, as I said in a previous life, uh, complying with Commonwealth legislation can obviously, in the end, be an industry in itself, and, the, and you often reflect, are you really protecting the state at the end of the day? And I think that it is to, to, uh, I commend the government for this initiative from the basis that it's still achieving its regulatory intent, but at the same time with an eye on those that are using the system. Uh, the previous speakers uh, in this second reading debate have not addressed the issue of privacy. This is always, again, another difficult trade-off. The more you impose regulatory burden, uh, regulatory burden, the more that you require the exchange of information, which you always need to ensure uh, reg uh, compliance and uh, to, to restrain and hopefully uh, stop money launderers or uh, organ counter -ter uh, or so terrorism organisations from using uh, their, their monies, the more a client's ind individual and personal individual details have to be shared. Uh, in my understanding of this bill and my reading of its provisions, and also the submission of the Office of, Inform of the Information Commissioner, it does strike the right balance between the privacy impacts, law enforcement and national uh, security objectives. But of course, again, that is for any government a watching brief and a, a careful balance to maintain. The bill also targets shell banks and prohibits financial institutions from entering into relationships with those shell banks. It also uh, prohibits the tipping off of individuals, and this would certainly apply to private client advisers or um, banks that may feel that they owe a greater, um, incorrectly and wrongly, an obligation to their client over and above their obligation to their fellow Australians and keeping uh, law and order. There is also uh, a strengthening of cross-border movement of monetary instruments and physical currency. Again, these provisions reflect the, the efforts of the government to to match the innovation of the crime syndicates. Terrorism um, has to be financed. It's financed often with criminal activity, uh, more generally uh, in the world of drugs, is my understanding and my reading. So we have two effects to, to address. One is the actual criminal activity of, of drug dealing. The second is the uh, the money that comes from drug dealing has to be brought back into the legitimate financial, financial system, and that is what we're trying to prevent. And then there is also the flow, if it does manage to find its way into the legitimate financial service system, to organisations which have uh, ill intents and seek to uh, take on our way of life and challenge it with violence. Uh, 
In my, in my experience, this bill uh, is to the credit of the government, and I commend it to the, to the chamber. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. And I rise to sum up the debate on the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 2019. And I do thank all senators for their contributions uh, to the debate. Uh, and I also thank uh, them for indicating that they are supporting uh, the legislation that the government has brought before the Senate. Uh, this bill amends the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act 2006 the Australian Federal Police Act 1979, the Criminal Code Act 1995, the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security Act 1986, the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 and the Surveillance Devices Act 2004. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, this bill implements a second phase of reforms arising from the recommendations of the report of the Statutory Review of the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act uh, 2006 and Associated Rules and Regulations. Uh, in terms of the purpose of the bill, it will strengthen Australia's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing regime and ensure Australia's financial system is resilient to criminal exploitation. It will also deliver significant regulatory savings to businesses providing services regulated under the Anti-Money Laundering Counter-Terrorism Financing Act. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I also thank the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee uh, who inquired into the bill uh, and its recommendation that I have before me. One recommendation, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that the committee recommends that the Senate pass the bill uh, and that the bill be passed, I note, without amendments. Uh, some committee members have made comments relating to the Financial Action Task Force 2015 Mutual Evaluation Report. Uh, the government, I advise, is taking a phased approach to reforming the anti-money laundering counter-terrorism financing regime, which it signalled in 2016 when responding to that evaluation and a domestic review of that regime. Uh, the phased approach enables the government to more effectively consult with stakeholders and stagger the regulatory impact of new measures on regulated businesses. By phasing these reforms, the government is giving businesses time to understand their obligations, and this has uh, the effect, obviously, of thereby improving uh, those businesses' compliance uh, with the changes to the legislation. The government will continue to consider how Australia's anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism uh, financing regime can be further strengthened, uh, and we will be doing that to counter money laundering and terrorism financing, and we will work with businesses to co-design future phases of reform. Uh, one committee member recommended that the government introduce legislation to, recommend, uh, to regulate lawyers, accountants uh, and real estate agents under the Act. And I, uh, yes, and as Senator McKim said, that was him. And I understand that the Australian Greens, as they have indicated, will be moving an amendment uh, to this effect. Uh, the Australian government is committed to continually improving Australia's anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism financing regime and working with businesses to ensure that Australia's financial system is hardened against criminals and terrorists, but without placing an undue regulatory burden on industry. Expanding the existing regime to lawyers, accountants and real estate agents would capture as many as 100,000 additional businesses the majority of which are small businesses or sole traders and practitioners. Uh, it would also have a significant resourcing impact on the regulator Austrac, which would need to oversee compliance of these businesses. Any future phases of anti-money laundering counter-terrorism financing reform will be tailored and will be appropriate to the Australian context, and industry will be fully consulted with at that time. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, in conclusion, the bill will introduce the next phase of reforms to ensure Australia's anti-money laundering counter-terrorism uh, financing regime will continue to effectively combat the evolving and significant threats posed by transnational serious and organised crime. Uh, transnational serious and organised crime costs the Australian community uh, up to $47.4 billion each year, threatening not just our safety and wellbeing, but also our national security. Uh, the bill would give the law enforcement vital tools to address this threat, whilst reducing regulatory costs on industry by around $3.1 billion over the next 10 years. 
Uh, these reforms would ensure that Australia's law enforcement intelligence and revenue protection agencies have appropriate, timely access to valuable financial intelligence to protect the Australian community in the global fight against organised crime and terrorism. The bill will also implement key recommendations of the 2016 statutory review of the Anti-Money Laundering Counter-Terrorism Financing Act. Uh, additionally, Madam Acting Deputy President, the bill will criminalise the act of dishonestly taking credit for receiving police awards, ensuring that the bravery and heroism of our police forces is respected. Uh, and on that uh, note, I will commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The question I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the combating of money laundering and financing of terrorism and to the Australian Federal Police and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator McKim. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'll now move uh, Australian Greens amendment on sheet 1085. Uh, this is the amendment that I flagged in at my second reading contribution uh, and to distill it down. Uh, if it were successful, which it doesn't look like it will be, thanks to the Labor Party squibbing it, uh, it would have required the minister by the 1st of July next year to uh, introduce into this parliament a bill for an act to include the following professions as designated services. Uh, lawyers, conveyances, accountants, high-value dealers, real estate agents and trust and company service providers. And uh, As I said, these are the fabled tranche two reforms of Australia's anti-money laundering and, uh, and counter-terrorism counter uh, financing framework. Now, um, I'm sure senators could tell that I'm uh, very disappointed that the Labor Party is not going to support these amendments. And the thing is, you would have thought I would have learned over a fairly uh, lengthy career in politics uh, never to pin your hopes on the Australian Labor Party, but I'll confess I'm guilty of that once again. And uh, senators may be asking themselves, why did I have some hope that, uh, that the Labor Party would support our amendment? Well, I was relying, um, stupidly as it turns out, on um, uh, former Shadow Treasurer Mr Bowen, who uh, got into the Australian Financial Review uh, on the February 24, 2019, grandstanding away about how important Labor thought these reforms are. And I'll just uh, quote a little bit from that article. Labor will target lawyers, accountants and real estate agents under tough new anti-money laundering laws amid growing concerns over illegal hot money from China artificially inflating the property market. Shadow Treasurer Chris Bowen is promising to make cross-border financial crime a pillar of Labor's election campaign in the wake of the Hain Royal Commission. Well, well, it didn't take long, did it? Didn't take long for Labor to collapse into an absolute blancmange of a political party. Out there before the election, we're going to crack down on the lawyers, the accountants, and the real estate agents um, because, the, because we're very concerned about illegal hot money artificially inflating the property market. In fact, exactly the argument I made in my um, second reading contribution. And here we are today. The Australian Greens have brought in an amendment that would allow the Labor Party to put its money where its mouth is and actually stand up for something in this place. But as is so often the case, the Labor Party have collapsed into a spineless yes, mob of shellbacks. Now, I want to just very quickly, in uh, the little bit of time I have, um, respond to a couple of matters that were raised um, during second reading 
contributions. And we heard from um, coalition senators um, that, uh, that there are issues around this tranche too. And uh, you know we've had quotes from the law, so uh, the law council read into uh, the debate today. And, and what um, uh, those senators are actually saying is that uh, you know the law council's got it right, and the financial action task force of which Australia is a member has got it wrong. Uh, the OECD they've got it wrong too. The IMF you know, they've got it wrong too. Every other country in the world, bar the six, including Australia, who are yet to legislate uh, these reforms, uh, have got it wrong too. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, and it's not just those groups. I'll even quote from the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission. And remember, whenever Australia's security agencies ask this government to jump, the government's only got one question. How high? How high do you want us to jump? How many more powers do you want us to grant you? How much more of the freedoms and liberties that Australians have fought and died and bled and suffered to protect and enhance over the years do you want us to rub out of our legislated framework? Yet, when the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission says this, our stable financial markets and valuable real estate market make Australia an attractive destination for criminal groups and individuals looking to invest or launder the proceeds of crime. Suddenly, it's all the deaf ear from this government. They can't seem to hear that. And why is that? Because they've got to look after their mates and donors in the property market. Same goes. For the Labor Party, I might add, who support every grab from power from the intelligence agencies and the spooks in this place, every single time they vote with, uh, vote with the government to remove fundamental rights and freedoms from ordinary Australian people in this place, they're pretty quick to jump when the spooks ask for more power. And yet, when the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission warns about our real estate market being an attractive destination for criminal groups looking to invest or launder the proceeds of crime, suddenly nothing to see here, not going to take that advice. Now, um, I think uh, we heard from Senator Cash that she supports a phased approach. A phased approach. Um, you are certainly taking a phased approach, uh, Senator Cash. Uh, the passing of epochs is a phased approach. I mean, you know, I'm going to have a beard down to my ankles by the time we get some effective anti uh, money laundering and counter terrorism financing legislation through um, in this place. I also want to draw to the attention of Senators. Um, comments made in um, Sydney Morning Herald recently by Ms uh, Angela Jackson, who is an economist, uh, who explained very succinctly uh, the problem with money laundering through real estate. Uh, she said this, and I'll quote, there is also an economic cost to Australia from money laundering. Markets become distorted. Remember, I, I can hardly believe I'm up here trying to explain markets to the neoliberals in the Liberal National Party and the Australian Labor Party, but here we go, it's been that kind of year. Um, Ms Jackson said uh, mar uh, markets become distorted because money launderers are spending illegal cash, which isn't worth as much to them as legal cash is worth to you and me. To clean their money, they are happy to lose a bit of it along the way. Exactly. Exactly. This is not a level playing field. Dirty money per dollar is worth less to the international crime syndicates and the terrorism finances than clean money is to ordinary Australians. <coughs> that makes it a not level playing field when people are seeking to purchase property. Ms Jackson uh, went on to explain the money, and I quote again, the money launderers are willing to pay more for an asset than it is worth or charge less for a service than is profitable. 
This is the price of cleaning money they can reinvest in their illegal activities. It creates an uneven playing field where the money launderers win and legitimate businesses lose. End quote. Well, precisely, precisely, Ms Jackson, the criminals win and the legitimate businesses lose. I mean, here we find ourselves today, where the major parties in this place are going to make sure the criminals can keep winning and the legitimate businesses keep losing. The major parties in this place today are going to ensure that ordinary Australians keep losing and that finances of terrorism and international crime syndicates keep winning. That is where we find ourselves today. And I'll take the interjection from Senator Hanson Young, who mentioned Crown Casino. I mean, they're not alone in this country by any regards. But again, the major donors are buying outcomes. The criminals win, and ordinary Australians lose. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Stirl. Deputy President, thank you, Minister. Uh, as was stated in the second reading speech, the opposition supports the intent of this amendment, but do not believe this is the right way to achieve considered law reform. Given this and our concerns about its unintended consequences, the opposition will be opposing this amendment. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And, uh, as I indicated in my summing up speech, the government will also not be supporting uh, the amendment moved by Senator McKim on behalf of the Australian Greens. Uh, the Australian government, as I have stated, uh, we are committed to continually improving Australia's anti-money laundering counter-terrorism regime, uh, financing regime and working with industry uh, to ensure that Australia's financial system is hardened against criminals and terrorists, but without placing an undue regulatory burden on industry. Uh, expanding the existing regime, as Senator McKim proposes, to lawyers, accountants and real estate agents would capture as many as an additional 100,000 businesses, and the majority of these businesses uh, are identified as small businesses, sole traders or sole practitioners. Uh, if an extension was to occur, it needs to be done in a careful and considered way and with those affected industries fully consulted. Uh, but it would also have a significant resourcing impact on the regulator Austrac. Uh, again, as I've stated in my summing up speech, uh, the government has stated there will be further phases of anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism financing reform. Uh, these will be tailored and they will also be uh, appropriate in the Australian context. And again, I do just want to confirm uh, for the benefit of the Hansard record, uh, this was obviously uh, looked at by the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee in detail, uh, and I am pleased yet again to advise the Senate uh, that the committee did recommend unanimously one recommendation. Uh, the committee rends, uh, recommends that the Senate pass the bill uh, without amendment. Thank you, Minister. Um, if there are no other contributions, uh, will the question is that the amendment on sheet 1085 revised be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that the amendment on sheet 1085 revised be agreed to. Those of that opinion, uh, the ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt for the ayes and Senator McCarthy for the noes. There being 10 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bills stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 2019 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. Will the committee be adopted? The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. All of that those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. It will be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the com combating of money laundering and financing of terrorism and to the Australian Federal Police and for related purposes. Sen Sorry. Sen Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I advise the Senate that the opposition withdraws amendments on sheet 1155 to the Corporation's Amendment Corporate Insolvency Reforms Bill 2020 and on sheet 1180 to the Financial Sector Reform Hain Royal Commission Response Bill 2020. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acton, uh, Deputy President. I move that consideration of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill 2020 be postponed until after consideration of the Financial Sector Reform Bill 2020 and two related bills. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. All of that opinion say aye. aye. 
Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Government business order of the day number three, aged care amendment, aged care recipient classification bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Stirl. Deputy President, Labor will be supporting this bill. As outlined in the explanatory memorandum, the purpose of this bill is to enable a new procedure to classify recipients of residential aged care and some kinds of flexible care from 1 March of 2021. The amendments will allow for the introduction of a new classification system that focuses on independently determining the care needs of older Australians, assessing residential aged care and some types of flexible care. Labor does have one particular concern about this bill. The Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission will not regulate the estimated 250 full-time assessors. The regulation of these assessors will be the responsibility of the Department of Health. Australians know only too well that the aged care system under the Liberals is broken. We know that the Prime Minister, when he was Treasurer, cut $1.7 billion from the aged care budget. This has had an impact across residential aged care. Why do we know this? Because the families tell us, and it has, and the aged care workers tell us, these cuts have had a significant impact. Any recent funding commitments have only been announced when they've been under political pressure. That includes funding for home care packages and during the COVID-19 pandemic. The question is, why didn't the Morrison government put funding into the aged care system before COVID-19? Why did it wait until residents were dying to start putting back some of the money it cut from aged care, the billions of dollars? Over the past two years, more than 100,000 older Australians have consistently waited on the Morrison government's never-ending wait list for their approved home care package. More than 30,000 older Australians died over three years waiting for their approved home care package. More than 32,000 older Australians over two years entered residential aged care prematurely because they couldn't get the care they needed. Waiting times for aged care grew by almost 300 per cent under the Liberals, with older Australians across the country forced into lengthy queues for care. The 23,000 home care packages as an example that the government announced in the budget. Only 2,000 of these packages are level four, the highest level of care. Compare that to the number of people currently waiting for their approved level four package, and that figure is 15,873. In action on hundreds of recommendations from more than a dozen reviews, reports and inquiries. Complaints about aged care doubled to almost 8,000 in just one year, but the Prime Minister has failed to properly resource the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission for handling these complaints. The Morrison government has failed to fully implement even one aged care recommendation from a landmark report to stop elder abuse in aged care released in 2017. More than 110,000 calls for help went unanswered by the My Aged Care call centre over the last three years—110,000. The Morrison government delivered just ready for this, 38 emergency food packages to older Australians isolated because of COVID-19, after announcing it would deliver 36,000 with funding of 9.3 million. 38 is all they delivered. And on top of all this, there is a failed Minister for Aged Care who is not up to the job. He has lost the confidence of the Australian people and in the parliament after being censured. And the list of over-promising and under-delivering goes on and on and on. We now know the Morrison government did not have a plan for COVID-19. In black and white, this was stated in the Royal Commission's special report into COVID-19. We know the Morrison government was not prepared for COVID-19 in aged care. Despite the early warnings, it didn't do enough early enough. 
difficulty for aged care workers to access PPE, and I've heard from them yesterday. I couldn't believe workers were telling me they couldn't get access to PPE. No infection control training for aged care workers. No surge workforce strategy document. No idea of how many aged care workers are working across multiple sites. Reports not made public, hidden by the government. It is clear the Morrison government, Mr. Madam Acting Deputy President, has no plan to fix the aged care system. The leader of the Australian Labor Party made a speech at the National Press Club back in August outlining eight steps that the Morrison government could do now to address the issues in aged care. These include one, minimum staffing levels in residential aged care. Two, reduce the home care package waiting list so more people can stay in their homes for longer. Three, ensure transparency and accountability of funding to support high quality care. Four, independent measurement and public reporting as recommended by the Royal Commission this week. Five, ensure every residential aged care facility has adequate personal protective equipment. Number six, better training for staff, including on infection control. Seven, a better surge workforce strategy. And eight, provide additional resources so the Aged Care Royal Commission can inquire specifically into COVID-19 across the sector while not impacting or delaying the handing down of the final report. Now, we know that Australians are angry. They are upset and they want aged care fixed. But we also know that they don't trust the Morrison government or the current Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck, to fix the problems that have occurred under their watch. They also don't trust the Morrison government to act on the Royal Commission's final report. Be assured, Labor will continue to hold the Morrison government to account, both in the parliament and publicly on the issues that thousands of Australians are concerned about. Madam Acting Deputy President, older Australians, their families and carers deserve far better. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Aged Care Recipient Classification Bill 2020. And from the outset, I'd like to concur with Senator Steele's contribution in this debate. The amendments uh, before us will allow for the introduction of a new classification system that focuses on independently determining the care needs of older Australians, assessing residential aged care and some types of flexible care. Labor will be supporting this bill as it enables a new classification pr procedure to do a shadow classification of recipients of the residential aged care and some kinds of residential care in, uh, plans in Australia. Reform is necessary because we know that the current funding model has been broken for some time. Currently, the fiscal contributions that the Australian government makes to aged care providers is administered through the Aged Care Funding Instrument, ACFI. Now, we know that ACFI is a tool which assesses the care needs of residents and is the largest source of rev revenue for residential aged care providers. The ACFI is based on dependency. So there is limited incentives for aged care providers to actively encourage reablement and rehabilitation methods. This mechanism is broken, as I said, and we have known this for many years. There needs a complete overhaul if we are going to overcome our self-imposed aged care crisis. In 2017, there was a review of the ACFI, which found that this outdated instrument needed to be replaced. So that was in 2017, and we're now at the end of 2020. The government has been sitting on this report for three long years, but it is in line with their very slow, let's not have any reform approach to the aged care sector. Concurrently, many aged care providers are not commercially viable. 
These corporations usually employ complicated business structures, which, while being legal, cast a veil on their financial performance and transactions. Transparency must accompany this sector by increasing reporting requirements. This will allow for more informed policy and investment decisions. Labor also believes we need better transparency around funding. We also need to know how that funding is being used in aged care and what improvements are carried out to provide that quality care for older Australians. Labor has been saying for a very long time there needs to be more transparency for older Australians and their loved ones so they know what's happening. There are a lot of questions about transparency of taxpayer funds that go into aged care. You've got over $20 billion a year going into the aged care system to support older Australians to either stay in their home or to be cared for in residential homes. We need more accountability about where that money is actually going and more oversight of how that money is being spent. Under the amendments of this bill, there will be a move to a new instrument as a possible replacement for ACFI. This has been designed by the Australian Health Services Research Institute, University of Wollongong. The group undertook the Resource Utilisation and Classification Study in 2017, and on 10 February 2019, the government announced a trial of an alternate residential aged care funding assess assessment tool. It was called the Australian National Aged Care Classification Assessment Tool. While we support this bill, we do have concerns that the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission will not regulate the estimated 250 full-time assessors of this new instrument. The regulation of these assessors will be the responsibility of the Department of Health. We on this side are frustrated with a lack of commitment to reforming of the aged care system and returning quality of care to all residents. I have lost count of the amount of times I've stood in this place and said the same thing over and over. This government has been slow to act to bring about any reform and they keep hiding behind the guise of the Royal Commission that they called in to their own failings. In the meantime, older Australians are dying of neglect. They are waiting for home care packages, and this government is taking so long to roll out those aged care pa packages that we know that older Australians are dying after they have been assessed at needing a level three or a level four package. Then, if that's not bad enough, older Australians who have passed away are receiving letters regarding the approved aged care package. The indignity, the disrespect, the incompetence of this government is having a terrible effect on Australian families whose loved ones have passed away, waiting for aged care services that never arrived. Now let's look at the performance of this government when it comes to aged care. The performance is fundamental to a Minister of the Crown worthy of a portfolio of those opposite who never perform their duties. They take the Australian people for granted every minute of every day. Now, we know the first failing of every consecutive Liberal government that has been in power in the last seven years, and there's been a number of leaders, as we know, has never appointed a Minister for Aged Care who sits in the Cabinet room to be able to take the concerns of this sector to that Cabinet table. It's a failing. Now, Richard Colbeck, as the Minister for Aged Care, is perhaps the worst minister this country has seen who's had the responsibility for aged care. Now, this may be about him being incompetent, but it also could be just that he doesn't care about this sector. For the majority of this year, his lacklustre performance in this portfolio is seemingly accepted by those opposite, and particularly by the Prime Minister, who at the last election promised that he would make older Australians a priority of his government. Well, he has failed. He has failed. I have asked, and my colleagues have, countless questions to the minister during question time and in estimates. 
and I've been unable to get answers. Very few, if any, have been able to be answered by the minister. What I get is arms and arms, sh shuffling of paper, the disinterest and an incompetent answers, and that's an affirmative. Minister, I would like you to give all Australians an early Christmas present and to resign before the reshuffle and you're moved out. That would be a sign that you have acknowledged that you have failed in your responsibilities as a minister for older Australians. It would be respectful to older Australians to have a minister and to have a prime minister who lives up to his election commitments and makes older Australians a priority. It's all very well to make the announcements and have the photo opportunities uh, that this government is pretending they're doing something in aged care, when we in fact know that you haven't. You have failed. You make announcements about the rollout of new uh, aged care packages, but the reality is that we know tens of thousands of 30,000, in fact, older Australians, and it's probably more now, over the last couple of years have died waiting for their home care package, that they were actually accredited and advised that they were entitled to. Now, look, I'm sorry, but it's just part of human nature that if you're in your 80s and 90s and you've been classified that you needed a level four package to be able to keep you at home, the likelihood of you with that level of care that has been denied to you will not live for those 18 months to two years before you may, may I say, may get the level of care that you need. That is a disgrace and it is unacceptable. Unacceptable. Now, we saw here in this place last night that we worked here to midnight, which is fine. We're happy to do that because that's our job to be here, to pass legislation. In fact, if I could just remind some people who normally sit in this chamber that you actually get elected as a senator to represent your state and territory to actually vote. And we saw last night Senator Griff, who bailed on that responsibility and squibbed out, just as we have seen Bridget Archer, the federal member, a Liberal member for Bass, who squibbed out in the other place that she failed to vote on the legislation of the CDC and the cashless debit card that she spoke so passionately and raised her concerns but didn't have the commitment uh, to follow through and vote that legislation down. Well, Madam Deputy President, you'll be very pleased to hear that Mrs Archer will have the opportunity again today to vote down this legislation that goes back to the House of Representatives. And I would put my house on it that she will not vote that legislation down. I can guarantee you that she will squib out again and she will support the government's attack on First Nations people and the majority of people who have welfare, who she has uh, taken the action by abstaining from voting to ensure that their human rights and their dignity has been taken away and attacked again by this government. But let's get back to the failings of this government on aged care, because let's face it, I could be here all day with all their failings that they have failed to deliver for older Australians. This is a callous, heartless government who makes a, a commitment at election time. The Prime Minister loves a photo opportunity, but he fails to deliver on so many levels of responsibility and commitments that he gives when the cameras are focused on him. This government, this Minister for Aged Care, had ample warning to ensure that the aged care sector were prepared for COVID-19 when it happened. But what did they do? They wanted to blame everyone else, the Victorian government, everyone else except themselves for failing to ensure that there was PPE, that there was adequate training for the aged care workforce. And let's not forget, it was this government that called the Royal Commission into their own failings. Now, they can try and rewrite history and go back and blame previous Labor government, but they've been in government for more than seven years. The responsibility for the failings in aged care rests firmly with them. And the interim report from their aged care Royal Commission was entitled Neglect. 
That's the word that every Australian associates now with aged care in this country. It's their failing. But I would like to acknowledge and take this opportunity to thank those who have worked in the front line of aged care in this country, particularly through the COVID-19 pandemic. But more importantly, what they do for older Australians, whether it's in their home or whether it's in residential care every day and every night, that's their carers. It's their kitchen staff. It's the nurses. It's the cleaners. It's the maintenance crew. It's the admin. It's the boards, particularly for the not-for-profit uh, aged care providers, they do a wonderful job for their community. So a big shout out and acknowledgement for them and to wish them and their families a lovely Christmas, a Christmas that I'm sure is going to mean so much to all of us as we leave this place. Well, I have a Christmas greeting for the Minister for Aged Care and it's fantastic that he's in the chamber here today to listen to our contributions. Merry Christmas, Richard Colbeck. You are on the naughty list this year. So don't be surprised if Santa Claus doesn't come down your chimney, and I can guarantee you, you won't have to worry about it next Christmas because you won't be the Minister for Aged Care. Senator Siebert. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. I rise to make a contribution to the second reading debate on the Aged Care Amendment Aged Care Recipient Classification Bill 2020, which allows for the introduction of a new classification system of older Australians accessing residential aged care and some types of flexible care. It marks an important step towards a new funding model for residential aged care by allowing the Australian government to undertake shadow assessments using the Australian National Aged Care Classification ANACC tool um, uh, to enable that to occur. And we all know that this is so desperately needed because our system is so desperately broken. We know um, that the current tool, the aged care funding instrument, commonly known as ACFI, is no longer fit for purpose and it hasn't in fact been fit for purpose for a long time. This bill allows for, the, for 12 months of shadow assessments to be undertaken to collect information about how the ANACC tool operates. We know that ACFI in fact actually has perverse uh, outcomes and incentives where it enables them um, within its model that has meant that older Australians who experience greater pain, disability and fragility gained additional funding. Now, of course, we know that they need additional supports, but the perversity is that you get more funding for that, but once you get somebody well, the funding falls away. So, in other words, our aged care providers are not enabled and supported around ensuring the continual well-being and enablement of a person in residential aged care. That is a ridiculous situation. The incentive there is for a perverse incentive is, well, you want to keep people unwell or claim that they're unwell so you can get more funding to look after them. It's absolutely ridiculous. So, and that's been the case for a long time. We do need to have a tool and a funding process that supports aged care providers who focus on re-ablement and wellbeing of older Australians. And I've, there's so much evidence and research around now around the importance of that and what can be done. But that also costs money. It costs money to support somebody who um, is, does have, for example, chronic pain, does have a disability, is frail. It does cost money to provide the level of support and care to, main, to uh, improve their well-being, but, but importantly to maintain that well-being. The Australian Greens are broadly supportive of the measures in this bill, but have a number of issues that, are, that I'm about to raise, but also, just to let the minister know, we'll be asking a series of questions uh, in committee to ensure that we've got on record in this place. Um, to the responses to some of the issues I'm going to be uh, raising. As part of this measure, the government will need to recruit and train a new workforce to undertake 
uh, sh the shadow assessments. I understand that the assessment workforce will be independent from providers and assessors, and assessors will need to meet strict qualification criteria. And of course, that's really important, and we welcome that. However, I urge the government to ensure that assessors are well trained and offered permanent positions that has the capacity and capability to undertake the shadow assessments. That's just so important that we get this right. I also echo the concerns raised by the Federation of Ethnic Communities Councils of Australia, who have recommended that assessments of older people from cold backgrounds are guided by a diversity advise, uh, advisor, by a diversity advisory. This would help enable training of assessors including, um, that includes cultural competency, cultural safety and trauma-informed approaches. During the short inquiry into this bill, several submitters raised issues around the use of Section 29C of the bill, which enables the Secretary to arrange computer programs to make decisions on the classification of care recipients. Several stakeholders raised warning bells about the use of computer programs to classify care uh, recipients in light of the failures of the robo-debt program. And I won't take long uh, to diverse or remind the Chamber of the very significant problems that, that eventuated from relying on computer programs and taking out uh, the human beings in this process. The Australian Greens have strong concerns about how computer programs will be used to make decisions and classify care recipients under the ANACC tool. We don't want to see older Australians uh, fall prey to the repeat of errors that were made under the uh, illegal robo-debt program. We want to make sure that the safeguards are put in place. We're not necessarily tech-phobic. We just want to make sure that there's a human element built into the system um, so that the computer programs, the programs aren't making decisions that um, have long-term consequences for human beings. Um, I've uh, raised, uh, I wanted to just clarify some issues around that with the government. There are also concerns about what information the government needs to gather to, f to make future decisions about the new classification system after 12 months of shadow assessments. At the end of 12 months, um, ASIC, uh, the ACSA um, has suggested we need to understand whether the, alter the alternate resident classification delivers the required support for an indiv individual resident, the financial impacts at both the aggregate and provider level of a change from the current funding instrument, that's ACFI, to the alternate funding instrument, in this case it's the ANACC, whether the proposed 5 per cent stop loss is adequate in all circumstances, and the potential values assigned to the National Weighted Activity Unit of the ANACC. I'm hoping the government will do their due diligence, sorry, will do their due diligence and properly uh, collate and evaluate information received during the shadow assessment period. We need to have all the information possible to ensure we don't repeat the mistakes of, of the ACFI model. Council assisting the Royal Commission on Aged Care, of course, recommended that ongoing evidence-based reviews should be conducted thereafter to refine the model in, 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 intuitively. No, um, uh, and um, we need to, and, and for the purpose of ensuring that the model, <clears throat> that the model accurate classification, that they model accurate and classification and funding to meet assessed needs. We will be monitoring further refinement, uh, the further refinement of this process and ins to ensure that the new classification model meets the needs of older Australians. It's very important that this, is, um, this process is being undertaken, but we, need, we want to make sure that we get it um, right. This bill marks an important step towards a new funding model for residential aged care that is so desperately needed. It is part of the overall reform that is needed in residential aged care that we have spoken about at length in this place, about which the Royal Commission is going to be uh, in the very near future handing down its recommendations. So this, uh, we think it's important that this process does get underway. We know very well that uh, the funding process needs to change. We know um, it's part of the reform process. We want to make sure that older Australians get the best care that they can that comes from an approach of uh, enablement and well-being and ensuring their well-being. 
We also want to make sure that the providers who are being paid to deliver this service, of which, and I'm not saying all providers, but we know very well that some providers are not up to scratch. They're not providing the quality care. Now, they can say that's about funding, and yes, funding is part of that. But my argument is, is there some providers that aren't doing the job. They're not doing the proper job. We've heard about them in the Royal Commission. We've heard about them, I'm sure everybody in this chamber has had emails around the poor quality of care of their loved ones. They've also, I'm sure my colleagues have also had the emails around the complexity of the process of accessing care. We need to fix that process. We need to make sure that providers are also held to account, that there is transparency and accountability. And that's one of the things that I'm going to be, and I'm sure others are going to be, looking at this process very carefully at, to make sure that that transparency and accountability on providers to provide the level of care they're funded for is there so that the community knows what the providers are spending their money on. Because we know from the Royal Commission and, in fact, how some providers responded to the pandemic. Some did a really good job and some did a very poor job. And my argument is, is that, in some instances, the virus, the coronavirus, took hold because there were not good infection control processes there from the beginning, from the start, which enabled the virus to spread more rapidly in these facilities. This is a, is, is a good step. We do need to be starting this. We do need to be doing the shadow assessment. assessment. We need to get it right, but we need to watch it very carefully to make sure that we do get this new process right. The Greens will be supporting this legislation but I do want to seek some reassurances and uh, clarifications from the minister, on, as I indicated, on those questions that I have. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And it is a pleasure to rise today in the Senate to speak in support of the Aged Care Amendment, Aged Care Recipient Classification Bill 2020. This bill, Madam Deputy President, amends the Aged Care Act 1997 to enable a new procedure to classify recipients of residential aged care and some types of flexible care from 1 March next year. The bill introduces the option to independently assess the relative care needs of individuals in residential aged care by empowering the Secretary of the Department of Health to assess care recipients using a new assessment tool and to process assessment results to assign new classification levels. During the information gathering period the bill allows, providers will continue to use the existing aged care funding instrument to assess their residents in parallel with the new procedure established by the bill. The bill responds to sustained criticism from care providers, statutory authorities and academic researchers of how care recipients are currently classified with residential aid care, aged care providers being required to regularly assess residents using the outdated aged care funding instrument. And to that end, uh, Madam Deputy President, I must thank the work of my Tasmanian colleague and the aged care minister, Senator Richard Colbeck, um, for all that he is doing in this space. We've spoken many, many times uh, in this place, and, and I know I've um, made contributions before in this chamber about the state of aged care in this country. And, um, we know that, that aged care is one of these things that in some way, shape or form will touch on the lives of most Australians, whether they are um, in aged care themselves or if they have uh, a, a relative who might be in an aged care facility or a, a close friend. And we know just how important it is that we get that we get this right, um, and you know it's one of the reasons that we are running a royal commission into the aged care sector, so that we know what the issues are, and that we can um, appropriately 
respond. And, and I thank Senator Colbeck for all of the work that he is doing um, in this area. On that note of the Aged Care um, Royal Commission, I was having a glance through the uh, Community Affairs Legislation Committee report into this legislation before I rose to speak today. Um, this legislation was referred to that committee on the 12th of November this year, and their report was tabled on the 2nd of December, um, authored by another one of my great Tasmanian colleagues, um, chair of that committee, Senator Wendy Askew. And of course, that uh, report recommended that the bill be passed, and to that end, I, I certainly hope that the Senate uh, echoes the sentiments of that report in its deliberations here today. Um, but reading through that report, um, as authored by the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, I, I did want to um, hone in on a couple of, of quotes from that report, which, which really stood out to me. The committee considers, uh, and I quote, the bill's provisions, the, the bill that we're debating here today, to be an important mechanism to allow the aged care sector and the government to quickly and adequately respond to the findings of the Aged Care Royal Commission, uh, which, as Senator Seward I think echoed in, in her contribution, uh, will be reporting very early in the new year. So, to that end, on the last um, sitting day of 2020, I think it's very appropriate that we come to this place uh, to debate this legislation and ensure that it is passed um, so that everything that needs to be in place for us to respond to the Royal Commission uh, in early 2021 is indeed in place. Uh, as I said before, we know that aged care is something that touches the lives of so many Australians. Uh, we have the Royal Commission so that we know what the issues are, what we need to get right, and if this bill that we're debating here today will help us adapt to the Royal Commission as quickly uh, and uh, adequately as possible, to, to quote the, um, the legislation committee report, then I think that that is only a good thing, and on that basis I do hope that the bill passes the Senate today. Uh, the Community Affairs Legislation Committee report also said that the bill paves the way for a more modern, efficient and stable approach to funding in the residential aged care sector. And I think that that's a really important point for us all to reflect upon uh, here today. Because since the 2016 budget, Madam Deputy President, the government has committed to developing and testing a lasting alternative to the aged care funding instrument. Results from previous measures realised under this commitment a potential replacement of the aged care funding instrument now exists, and it's called the Australian National Aged Care Classification, or the ANACC. And this bill that we're debating here today builds on the successful ANACC trial conducted in early 2019 and early 2020 and will allow a new classification using the ANACC tool to be determined for the entire residential aged care population without affecting how the subsidy for providers is calculated. And this is an essential step in preparing to respond to the findings of the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety. Um, as I alluded, that was um, detailed in the Senate committee report. Funding for the new ANACC assessors was announced in the 2020 budget, and all assessors will have to meet strict professional qualifications and additional training criteria, uh, which will be detailed in subordinate legislation. The classification data obtained from these assessments will ensure that individuals, care workers, providers and the government all have the information they need to fully understand the new funding model. The ANACC assessment and classification procedures will create an important data set to aid understanding of frailty issues in the residential aged care population and will, for example, allow a comparison of how quickly or slowly the health status of people with like care needs decline. The government recognises that the benefit of this data for monitoring and research purposes does not require care recipients to be identified and is introducing amendments to ensure that personal information cannot be published in writing or otherwise to protect the 
privacy of residents, and I think that's um, a very important safeguard to have in place. This bill enables the next phase of residential aged care funding reform. It sets the stage for a quick and seamless transition to a more contemporary, efficient, effective and stable funding approach that will promote investment in residential aged care refurbishment and expansion and that will support providers to better deliver the individualised care that each resident needs. Madam Deputy President, I said at the start of my remarks that aged care is something that, that impacts on the lives of all Australians, and we as a government are firmly committed to ensuring that our aged care sector delivers for, um, for those Australians that it, that it impacts and for its cohort. Um, and that's why the 2021 budget includes the delivery of 23,000 additional home care packages uh, at a cost of $1.6 billion, in addition to the 6,000-odd packages announced uh, in July at a cost of more, hundred, more than $325 million. We've invested more than $746 million in aged care COVID-19 response measures as part of the $1.6 billion um, aged care-specific COVID support package. And we've invested $408 million, slightly over, for aged care reform initiatives to improve the quality of care, further respond to the urgent issues raised by the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety, and lay the foundations for future reform. So, like I say, this is such an important area to get right. That's why we're having a Royal Commission, so that we understand what the issues are and so that we can ensure that our aged care sector provides for all Australians. Um, and this bill that we're debating here today is just part of that. Uh, the budget measures that I just ran through are likewise part of that. And I do commend the work of Senator Colbeck uh, in this space to ensure that our aged care sector um, is, is appropriate and does provide quality care for those Australians who, who seek to or may have need to use it. Um, but in summary, Madam Deputy President, it is a pleasure to rise today speaking on the Aged Care Amendment, Aged Care Recipient Classification Bill 2020. As I said, the passage of this bill will ensure that this government can respond quickly and adequately to the findings of the Aged Care Royal Commission when they are. Um, tabled in the very near future. We know that this is important. We know that this is something we have to get right. And on that basis, Madam Deputy President, I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. It is my great pleasure to join with my good friend, Senator Chandler, in commending the uh, Aged Care Amendment, Aged Care Recipient Classification Bill 2020 to the Senate. As we've just heard from the fine contribution from Senator Chandler, looking after senior Australians is one of our government's most important responsibilities. We announced the Royal Commission because we understood that not everything is right about aged care. But we took the action, Madam Deputy President, required to give Australians faith that this government takes our responsibility to senior Australians incredibly seriously. And where there are cracks in the system, we are not going to tolerate it. We are not going to stand by and see the care of any Australian, particularly any Australian, in an aged care residential facility compromised in any way. And we do have a very strong regulatory framework that's incredibly important. Aged care residential providers have got very strong obligations under the law, and there is no doubt that some aged care providers have not complied with the law in all respects, and that is simply not good enough. But where the regulatory framework is not where it needs to be, and we will, of course, learn more about this when the Royal Commission hands down its final report 
in February of next year, our government stands ready to act and to do whatever is necessary to improve our aged care system. And the Prime Minister has already indicated that more funding will be forthcoming to address the recommendations made by the Royal Commission. So we already have seen a very, very strong commitment from our Prime Minister in this respect. I say that, of course, given the Morrison government's history and the coalition government's history since we were elected in 2013, in how we have invested in and looked after senior Australians. Because the fact of the matter is the Morrison government is delivering record investment across the aged care system over the Ford estimates from $13.3 billion in 2012-13 under Labor, growing to $21.3 billion in 2019-20, and it's estimated that funding for aged care will grow to more than $27 billion in 2023-24. So that's on average $1.1 billion of extra support for older Australians each year over the forward estimates. This government spent over $13.4 billion in 2019-20 on residential care, up from $9.2 billion in 2012-13, and that will grow by 2023-24 to some $17.1 billion. So we can see, based on our level of investment, the commitment of this government. Thank you, Senator Henderson. The time for this debate has expired and, and you will be in continuation. So I will um, now move to notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fiavanti Wells. Deputy President, pursuant to notice given yesterday on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of three legislative instruments as set out in the list circulated in the Chamber. Thank you, Senator Fiavanti Wells. Senator Seaworth. Thank you, Deputy President. I give notice that in a very short space of time I will be delivering a motion to the Tables Office on the job seeker payment. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Henderson. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if you move, you get the call. Uh, right. Um, is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Thank you very much, Senator Madam Dean Deputy, Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I present the twelfth report of 2020 of the Selection of Bills Committee and seek leave to have the report incorporated into the Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that granted. the report be adopted. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam um, Deputy President. I um, move an amendment to the report. Uh, there is one area where we um, would like an amendment. It's in relation to the National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment supporting Economic Recovery Bill 2020, um, and that it go to the Economics Legislation Committee by the 12th, uh, for report by the 12th of March. Um, the reason we would like this is that this bill reverses the first recommendations of the Banking Royal Commission um, that the government should not touch the responsible lending laws. If the government is serious about scrapping the responsible lending laws, we need a chance to find out what the harm to consumers will be. Uh, Eliza Wu, Associate Professor of Finance at the University of Sydney, has said these laws may sow the seeds for the next financial crisis, so I think it is reasonable that the Senate be given the time. Um, a, short, a relatively short inquiry once you take out the um, once you take out the Christmas break uh, to report back to this chamber uh, by the 12th of March. And I hope other senators can support that amendment. Are there any other speakers to this particular amendment, Senator Seward? Our support for that amendment. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Patrick. And, and if it assists the chamber, I'm, I will be supporting this amendment. Thank you. So the question is that the amendment as moved by Senator Gallagher, which was circulated in the chamber, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
etwa. We always use it. Stop the bells. So the question is that the amendment to the selection of bills committee report as moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. Stop the count. Senator McKenzie, are you in or out? We need to be sitting somewhere or standing still. Please continue. Order. There being 31 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. There are two other amendments. I'll call the minister. Yes, minister. Uh, I move the following amendment. Uh, at the end of the motion, add and a in respect of the Treasury Laws Amendment, News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2020, the provision of the bill be referred to the Economics Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 12th of February 2021, and b in respect of the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's jobs and recovery. Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2020. The provisions of the bill be referred to the Education Employment Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 12th of March 2021. I'm going to put that amendment. So the question is: the amendment as moved by the minister be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. And there's one further amendment in standing in the name of Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, um, um, Madam Deputy President. Um, I move uh, that uh, at the end of the motion add, but in respect of the customs amendment in brackets banning goods produced by Uyghur forced labour in brackets bill 2020, the bill be referred immediately to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 12th of May 2021. 
Uh, it's my intention to move that amendment. So the question is: the amendment, as moved by Senator Patrick, be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So I now move the amended selection of bills report. So the question is that the amended selection of bills report be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired or postponed to rearrange the business? I'll call the clerk. <coughs> Deputy President, postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of General Business Notice Number 852, postponed to the 2nd of February 2021, and General Business Notice Number 909, also postponed to the 2nd of February 2021. There are no committee notifications for extensions. So uh, I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day, aged care amendment, aged care recipient <coughs> classification bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Now, Senator Chandler was <coughs> in. I uh, beg your pardon. Senator Henderson was in continuation. Oh, uh, and while we're walking round, the minister seeking the call, minister. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that intervening business be postponed until after the consideration of the government business order of the day relating to the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill 2020. So the question is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. <clears throat> the president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities be now, and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act 1979 and for related purposes. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill 2020 and say at the outset, Labor supports the fundamental aims and objectives of this bill. We welcome the repeal of the questioning and detention warrant. It is a repeal that Labor has long advocated. It is a repeal that has been supported by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. It is a repeal that has been supported by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor. This is a reform that is long overdue. Labor supports and welcomes it. And we are, appreciate that the government, in a long overdue response to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, has brought this repeal forward. I note that the questioning and detention warrant, which was a power that was brought in in the wake of the September 11 attacks by this part of parliament and supported at the time by the Australian Labor Party, is a power that has never been used. It is an extraordinary and intrusive power designed to assist our uh, national security agencies to prevent an attack, a terrorist attack, and has never been used. And therefore, it is appropriate that we repeal this power, and Labor supports that objective. Labor also supports the objective of expanding the questioning warrant to cover acts of politically motivated violence, including terrorism, foreign interference, and espionage. 
Uh, Senator Keneally, I'm sorry, just resume your seat. Senators, we have got a debate in progress. There's lots of little meetings going on around the chamber. If you're not participating in the debate, I would ask that you leave and be respectful that Senator Keneally makes her contribution in silence. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, the question in warrant power has been expanded, as I said, uh, to cover acts of politically motivated violence, including terrorism, uh, foreign interference and espionage. Uh, Labor supports this expansion. It is appropriate that our national security agencies have the tools available to them to meet the current threat environment. As former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said, there is no set and forget when it comes to national security, and the tools that we, our national security agencies have available to them must evolve to meet the current threats. We acknowledge that foreign interference and espionage are at heights not previously seen in Australia, including at the height of the Cold War. And it is appropriate that ASIO has the questioning warrant power uh, to, be, uh, to be used in the circumstances of foreign interference and espionage. Labor also ex supports expanding the questioning warrant power to persons as young as 14, but only in cases of politically motivated violence, as the legislation stipulates, and where the person being questioned is, in fact, the subject of the investigation. It's important for those who are watching this debate to note and understand that the questioning warrant power is not a law enforcement power. It is an intelligence power. It has been given to our intelligence agencies in order to prevent a terrorist attack. And we must <coughs> recognize the reality that extremist groups, whether they are in the far-right extremists or they are from Islamic uh, jihadism are targeting younger and younger individuals, usually males, to radicalize and to provoke to acts of violence. We should recall that the person who shot the gun that murdered Curtis Chang in New South Wales, a New South Wales Police Force civilian employee, was only 15 years old. That was an act of politically motivated violence. It was a terrorist attack. And it is appropriate that our national security agencies are able to use this questioning warrant power in order to prevent a terrorist attack, including when one is being planned by a person as young as 14, because the evidence is extremist groups are seeking to radicalize and target younger and younger people to carry out these attacks. Now, I would also note for those watching this debate, and I acknowledge that there has been significant concern in the community about the safeguards that would apply to the questioning of minors. A number of safeguards do apply to the questioning of minors in this legislation, including the following. And many of these are in addition to the safeguards that apply to adults. There is a high threshold to obtain a questioning warrant. The requirements for children is that the Attorney General must consider the best interests of the child when issuing the warrant. Questioning may only occur in the presence of a lawyer and a parent, guardian, or other acceptable person to the child. There is a right to legal advice for all persons, adults and children, including representation during questioning sessions. For, for minors, there is a limit to two hour uh, continuous questioning periods. Uh, minors also have the right to disclose to particular persons their questioning uh, post after the questioning has occurred. And there is the ability to seek judicial remedy in relation to the warrant and the ability to contact the IGIS, the Inspector General of, of Intelligence and Security, or the Ombudsman to make complaints about the process. So there are several safeguards built into this legislation. There are safeguards as well in relation to prescribed authorities. Now, prescribed authorities play an important role and always have done so in relation to the questioning warrant power and had it been used, the questioning and detention warrant power. A prescribed authority will oversee the execution of a questioning warrant and provide directions in accordance with the legislation. A, pri a prescribed authority can be 
a former Superior Court judge, an AAT member, or another experienced legal practitioner. They cannot be an ASIO employee, a member of an intelligence, security, or law enforcement agency uh, other than the AFP, or AGS lawyer or IGIS official. Now, the bill, uh, in fact, originally proposed uh, to change the qualifications for a prescribed authority. The bill, as it was originally presented to the parliament, uh, would have, in fact, uh, allowed for a person with uh, 10 years' experience uh, in, a, in a legal capacity to be appointed as a prescribed authority. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security considered this matter and came to a conclusion and made a, uh, a recommendation in its report that a prescribed authority should have 10 years' experience but must additionally be a Queen's Counsel or Senior Counsel in order to, ins to ensure assure ourselves and the community that the people asking, acting as prescribed authorities had the relevant senior experience. So, we acknowledge that the government have accepted that recommendation and moved that recommendation as an amendment in the other place uh, to this legislation. The legislation also previously uh, included a sunset in 2030 and did not include uh, a recommendation or a, leg uh, a requirement for a legislative review. Again, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security considered that matter. And the Intelligence Committee came to a view that this extraordinary and intrusive power, whilst it is appropriate, must be accompanied by appropriate safeguards and legislative parliamentary oversight. Therefore, the uh, Intelligence Committee made a recommendation to the government that the sunset uh, be shortened to 2025 and that a review occur in 2023. And I acknowledge that the government has accepted that recommendation and incorporated it as an amendment uh, in the House of Representatives. Now, this bill also makes some other changes to ASIO surveillance device warrant framework, allowing the internal authorization of the use of tracking devices in certain circumstances. Uh, Labor members on the Intelligence and Security Committee participated in questioning of our uh, national security agencies in relation to the necessity for that change, and we are satisfied uh, that that is an appropriate uh, authorization change and support that aspect of the bill. As I said, Labor supports overall the fundamental aims and objectives of this legislation, welcomes the repeal of the questioning and detention warrant, uh, welcomes and supports the expansion of the questioning warrant to acts of foreign interference and espionage, and welcomes with appropriate safeguards in place uh, the ability for ASIO to question minors as young as 14, where they are the subject of the uh, investigation. and. Uh, in, only in relation to acts of politically motivated violence. I should note that the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security also asked the government, not in the form of a formal recommendation, but asked the government to consider whether an additional safeguard in relation to minors should be implemented, and that is a child advocate. The committee uh, considered that uh, this is an extraordinary and uh, intrusive power. It is the most extraordinary int intrusive power that ASIO has, uh, and considered that the, while the expansion to minors as young as 14 was appropriate in the uh, narrow and defined circumstances with the safeguards the bill contains, that there should be consideration as the warrant power um, is being given to ASIO as to whether or not uh, a child advocate should also be part of the process. And uh, we've invited, the Intelligence Committee has invited the government to come back to us uh, on answering that question. Uh, I would also flag that I would expect that, among other matters uh, that are highlighted in Labor members' additional comments to the Intelligence Committee report, should be considered as uh, top order issues for the review in 2023. In the time remaining, I do want to turn to a, an issue where Labor does have uh, a point of difference with the government, and that is that the bill removes 
a safeguard put in place for the issuing of questioning warrants, uh, and that safeguard was put in place by John Howard. His uh, Liberal Attorney General, Daryl um, uh, Williams, uh, put in place a, uh, a safeguard that the questioning warrant power had to be uh, issued not only by the Attorney General but signed off by an independent issuing authority, a judge acting in a personal capacity. And this is a form of a double lock mechanism to ensure that, uh, that an intrusive and extraordinary power is used appropriately, uh, lawfully, uh, and uh, that the public can have confidence uh, that the, there is an independent oversight and authorization of such an extraordinary power. Now, Labor has long supported that extraordinary powers, uh, even when they are, they are net where they are necessary, as they are in this case to keep the community safe, should be also accompanied by safeguards that ensure democratic rights and freedoms are protected. Uh, these were the, this was the approach taken by, Lib by Labor Senator John Faulkner when these bills were first introduced, these warrant powers were first introduced in the wake of September 11 and is the approach that Labor takes today. Now, I note that in um, the other place, in the House of Representatives, the Shadow Attorney General Mark Dreyfus moved an amendment to restore the Howard safeguard. Labor members support the retention of John Howard's safeguard to ensure that these extraordinary powers have independent issuing authorities signing off on their use. I note that the government in the other place voted against the retention of the Howard safeguard. And I would invite government members here today to reconsider that position. I anticipate uh, that, uh, given the vote in the House of Representatives, I may be unsuccessful in that request. But nonetheless, I would like to state for the record that when Labor does come to government, we will, and we make a commitment here today, to move to restore John Howard's safeguard to ensure that this extraordinary questioning warrant power is accompanied and appropriately authorized not just by the Attorney General but also by an independent issuing authority. In the time that I have remaining, I would like to acknowledge the work that is done by ASIO in keeping Australians safe. There is no doubt that ASIO has used these powers sparingly. These powers have only been used 16 times since they were provided in 2004. They have not been used since 2010, and that's notable because the security level, the, the threat level from terrorism was raised in 2014, yet ASIO has judiciously and sparingly used these powers. Labor members expect that ASIO will continue to judiciously and sparingly use these powers, particularly in the context of, of their having been um, expanded. And so I acknowledge that uh, ASIO's work and, we, and state again that Labor supports this legislation. I flag in the seconds remaining that I would like to seek leave to move amendments to restore John Howard's safeguard, uh, the independent issuing authority, to this legislation. Before I that, that will be during the committee stage, I assume, Senator Keneally. Uh, before I come to Senator Thorpe, I'll acknowledge former Senator Ludlam, assisting Senator Seawitt in the back of the chamber. Welcome back. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. I rise to speak on the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill 2020. It's funny, this place, out there in the community, in the real world, we teach our kids that if they see the wrong thing, they should speak up. That if someone does the wrong thing, they should say something. And that if they do say something, that they will be protected because telling the truth, exposing corruption and bad behaviour is better than staying silent. In the real world, where most of us live, we teach our kids honesty and integrity. However, when you come into this place, that is completely reversed. In here, the government threatens people who speak up. They threaten people who see something wrong. 
They threaten whistleblowers, journalists and activists because the Home Affairs Minister, Peter Dutton, is scared and feels threatened. The fragility. The never, ever could be Prime Minister, the Minister for Home Affairs, is running scared. So what does he do? He will send his big spy agency to harass, intimidate and threaten anyone he doesn't like or he doesn't agree with. Weak. What a joke. These ASIO laws could punish journalists breaking politically significant stories, stories like the conduct of the type of person the Attorney General is and has been, stories exposing the hypocrisy of the member for Aston, Alan Tudge, who talks big on family values but has none where it matters. Big order. Nation Senator, on a point of order, I'd ask um, that the senator uh, perhaps withdraw that personal reflection uh, on uh, Mr. Tudge from the lower house, please. Senator Thorpe, um, 193 standing orders talks about um, personal reflections. That last phrase, that was a distinct reflection on a member of the other place, is out of order. So I'd ask you to withdraw that, please. I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Much appreciated. Big nationally significant stories like the absolute and total barbaric conduct of the Australian elite SAS and their horrific war crimes they committed in our name. These laws will also have a chilling effect on activists and grassroots community. Activists like the thousands upon thousands of people who stand up in cities all around this country to say that black lives matter. The grassroots mob who rally and shut down cities every invasion day, reminding you all that we are still here and until you do the right thing by us, we will keep on demanding our rights. How fragile the Minister for Home Affairs is that he would rather stop brave whistleblowers from speaking out and protecting the public's right to know. This is while the minister talks big on the freedom of speech. For this government, freedom of speech means freedom to say only the things that this government agrees with, or else they will send ASIO to spy on you and intimidate you and question you. These laws could also see journalists jailed for five years if they refuse to reveal their sources. Think about that. This government is happy to threaten journalists for refusing to reveal sources. Does that not look a bit like dictatorship? The Minister for Home Affairs and his little secretary of the Department for Home Affairs are happy to drive us to a police state and hoping no one will notice. These two fragile men with big egos are now using these laws to threaten anyone who they're scared of. Order, Senator. Personal reflection upon uh, Mr Dutton. I will check. Senator Thorpe, if you did make a personal reflection, I'd ask you to withdraw it. I didn't hear the phrase used. I can check the Hansard, but if you did think you made a personal reflection upon um, a member of another place, it would help the Chamber to withdraw it. I, as I remind Senators, it is very easy to use um, language criticising an action, an event, a policy. Um, the standing orders require very careful language around people. So, Senator Thorpe, I didn't hear what you said. Um, if you'd like to withdraw, you're free to. If not, I'll check the Hansard. To withdraw. Thank you, Senator Thorpe, for the convenience of the chamber. Um, please continue. Thank you, President. If you are scared of journalists, then what are you hiding? If you are so scared of civil society, 
the very people that elected you to this place and anyone who is holding you to account, then what are you doing behind closed doors? We teach our children to be accountable, to con conduct themselves with dignity and to say something if they see something dodgy going on. Well, the Minister for Home Affairs never got that lesson. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about our democracy. And he most definitely does not care for being exposed. I don't want to get caught out on a point of order, so I won't say that line. Uh, so the Minister for Home Affairs wants to send Big Brother to spy on our children. These laws will lower the age of questioning by ASIO from 16 to 14. Think about that. ASIO can spy on children breaching Australia's international obligations under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. This is sick. Why am I surprised this is from a government that is happy to lock up brown and black people in offshore detention? A government headed by a Prime Minister that, when the country was going through one of the worst crises in its history, he went to Hawaii. He went to Hawaii. Why didn't he holiday here on our own shores? That's right, because our country was on fire, literally on fire. I know the other side hate hearing this because they hate being exposed for the outliers that they are. This government will dodge accountability. It's revolting. These laws will give ASIO powers that are so far-reaching that they could be used to clamp down on civil society organisations and political advocacy groups, including environment, human rights and refugee groups. These changes would make Australia a world leader in state-sanctioned tracking of citizens and coercive questioning powers. Because the Minister for Home Affairs is scared. Scared of children, scared of the truth, scared of brown and black people. He's running scared. But that's okay. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, the PJCIS, is on his side. It's shameful. The PJCIS has just rubber-stamped these laws. It is one of the parliament's most secret and powerful committees, and it's determining the fate of Minister Dutton's spy laws. The government, this government-controlled committee operates like a fortress. Independent and cross-bench MPs are shut out of any form of participation on scrutiny because they don't like to be scrutinised. Let's be honest. That's what these laws are about. They're about limiting the public's right to know. They're about intimidating anyone who sees government wrongdoing. There has been an ongoing erosion of rights in Australia for the past 20 years. Unfortunately, the two major parties are in complete lockstep with each other and they are leading us down the road to a surveillance state. I say to those opposite, you know that the George Orwell novel, 1984, was a novel, right? It wasn't a manual. The Minister for Home Affairs and Secretary of his department, Big Brother and Little Brother, are so threatened by truth. These laws are always pitched to us on the basis of the most serious crimes available, but we know, I know, as a black woman, that these laws are always used to intimidate black people people of colour, activists, grassroots organisations and journalists. If this government are so scared of the truth, then what are they hiding? 
We are proud to be the only opposition in this place. We will never support this intrusion on the human rights of people. I say to those watching, the Greens are the real opposition in this place. We're the ones with the guts to call out this shameful overreach. I also want to remind you that not only is ASIO watching, so is the Minister for Home Affairs. Shame. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, I, I rise to speak uh, briefly in this debate on the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill 2020. Um, the bill uh, implements the government's response to the report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security into ASIO's questioning and detention powers by amending uh, the ASIO Act uh, 1979 in relation to compulsory questioning powers and uh, tracking devices. And I won't go into the detail of the bill. It has been eloquently spelt out by uh, Senator, Senator Keneally. I indicate I will, at the, um, at the committee stage, uh, talk to my amendment at that point in time. I did, uh, I did uh, listen to Senator Keneally's uh, 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 a contribution, and um, I, I, um, I, I'm not sure whether her amendments have been circulated at this point, but, I, but they were certainly in the House, uh, and uh, the clerk's given me a nod saying that it, is, it is, uh, has been circulated, so, so it's good I'll talk to those. Um, uh, I do actually uh, support the idea that Labor uh, has, uh, within this amend amendment, that basically brings back a judge uh, into the, the process of, uh, of issuing warrants. And I think that's a really important thing that, uh, that, that, that ought to take place. Uh, those of you who might have been in the chamber yesterday would have heard me talking about a decision handed down by the AAT yesterday. And I just want to come, come back to my contribution yesterday and talk about how it relates to this particular bill. Um, back in 2018, the Auditor General, sorry, the, uh, the Attorney General, censored a Auditor General's report into the Hawkeye uh, combat vehicle, used a power under Section 37 of the Auditor General's Act to uh, ensure that uh, information that he considered to be sensitive from a national security perspective and sensitive from a commercial perspective uh, was, uh, was basically uh, re redacted in the Auditor General's final report. Now, the interesting thing about that is that uh, when that power is used by the Attorney General, the Auditor General is not required to answer questions from the Senate. It's one of the really unusual provisions in, in the statutes that uh, uh, basically curb the parliament's own powers. Obviously, the parliament's done that itself. So uh, we never would get to see uh, whether or not that power was exercised responsibly. Uh, I uh, was concerned about that when I saw that, and I looked for a way to perhaps, uh, in some sense, review uh, the decision of the attorney. I mean, it did go to an inquiry. The JCPAA looked at it. Uh, but, uh, in actual fact, when the uh, Attorney General censored the Auditor General, uh, the Act requires that a report be provided to the Prime Minister. Uh, that report was provided, and uh, I sought that report under FOI. Now, uh, an, a range of claims were advanced to try and prevent me having access to that particular document. But eventually, after, uh, after some of these claims, quite complex claims, were abandoned by the uh, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, represented by the AGS, uh, we, we finally got down to the nub of some exemptions that were claimed by the Prime Minister on national security and commercial sensitivity. And uh, yesterday, a decision was handed down, basically stating that the information in this 
uh, in this Auditor General's report was not sensitive. It was not sensitive from a national security perspective and it was not sensitive from a commercial perspective. Now, the, the, the significance of that to this bill or to this uh, proposal by Senator Keneally is that uh, in that instance it is clear. We now have a ruling from the AAT that, showed, so that shows that the Attorney Gen General's judgment was severely uh, um, com uh, not, not compromised but was gr actually grossly incompetent, legally competent and from a parliamentary perspective uh, it was incompetent. I'm referring to the, the exercise of his powers as a minister, uh, the, uh, uh, and that has relevance here. Here we're having a, 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 a bill presented to the parliament which uh, that grants the attorney a, a power to issue warrants without the supervision of a judicial officer or, or consultation or connection with a judicial officer in circumstances where we now know without doubt um, um, made by a, uh, a prominent deputy president of the AAT that the attorney is not, uh, uh, has, 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 does not have the, the capacity to exercise good judgment in this regard, in these sorts of matters. Uh, I could mention Witness Kay, I could mention Bernard Caleri, I could mention Richard Boyle, I could mention David McBride or whistleblowers that have been prosecuted under the current attorney's watch, even though Section 71 of the Judiciary Act uh, allows uh, him in his, in his responsibility to this parliament to uh, uh, end prosecutions that are not in the national interest, not in the interests of justice. So uh, uh, if indeed Senator Keneally moves those amendments, uh, I will certainly be giving support uh, to them. It is, a, it is a good safety measure and I, quite frankly, can't understand uh, why such uh, an amendment would not be supported by the government because it is, it's, it's quite sensible, quite reasonable and it you know, serves the right uh, balance between uh, uh, the exercise of, 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 of powers and the checks necessary when such powers are exercised. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I rise to sum up uh, the debate in the Senate on the bill before us, the ASIO Amendment Bill 2020. Uh, keeping Australian communities safe from those who seek to do us harm is and uh, will continue to be the government's number one priority. An important way the government achieves this uh, is by ensuring that our national security agencies have the powers they need to work in an increasingly volatile security environment. Uh, the bill before us, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill 2020, uh, will modernise ASIO's powers and improve ASIO's capacity to respond to a range of steadily worsening threats particularly in relation to politically motivated violence, espionage and foreign interference. The bill before the Senate repeals ASIO's existing questioning and detention warrant framework contained in Division 3 of Part 3 of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act 1979. Uh, and introduces a reformed compulsory questioning framework. Uh, these powers will enable ASIO, uh, upon obtaining a warrant, to question a person under compulsion to obtain intelligence in relation to politically motivated violence—and this uh, violence includes terrorism, espionage and foreign interference. Uh, the bill, Mr Acting Deputy President, will also align the approval process for ASIO to use non-intrusive tracking devices with that of law enforcement agencies under the Surveillance Devices Act 2004 and modernise the definition of tracking device uh, to ensure ASIO is able to use the latest and safest technology to perform its functions. 
uh, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, uh, otherwise known as the PJCIS, uh, has comprehensively reviewed the powers in this bill and supported the retention of a compulsory questioning power for ASIO. The PJCIS made eight recommendations in relation to the proposed compulsory questioning powers. Uh, the government has amended the bill to implement all of these recommendations, and I know, Acting Deputy President, you are aware of those recommendations. Um, and I understand that I will be tabling a revised explanatory memorandum incorporating those amendments, and I do have that here for the officials. Uh, these amendments further strengthen the significant safeguards that will accompany the compulsory questioning framework in this bill, including rights to legal representation and extensive real-time oversight throughout the course of questioning by the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security. Um, in terms of the amendments that I have referred to uh, in my speech, uh, the amendments to the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill 2020 uh, they were prepared, as I've stated, in response to recommendations of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security and advice of the Senate Standing Committee for the scrutiny of bills. Uh, and certainly I would thank both of those committees uh, for their work uh, in comprehensively reviewing this bill. In terms of the amendments that I have referred to, uh, the government amendments provide that a legal practitioner who is appointed as a prescribed authority must have engaged in legal practice for at least 10 years and must be a Queen's counsel or senior counsel. This is an important amendment that will ensure that the prescribed authority is well qualified and experienced to carry out their role overseeing questioning. The bill as required or as drafted requires the Attorney General to consider the minor's best interests, and this includes their mental health and cultural needs, amongst other matters. Uh, the committee recommended that the bill clarify that the Attorney General must consider the best interests of the child as a primary consideration, and an amendment has been included to implement this recommendation. I also advise that the government has also accepted the committee's recommendations that the PJCIS commence a further review of ASIO's questioning powers by 7 September 2023, and that the powers sunset on 7 September 2025. Uh, also, I advise the government has made amendments uh, in line with the committee's recommendations to clarify that the making of a public interest disclosure to an authorised internal recipient under the Public Interest Disclosure Act will not contravene secrecy offences in the bill. Uh, the amendments also clarify that ASIO must not use a tracking device without authorisation, where doing so is prohibited by a law of the Commonwealth, a state or a territory. Uh, with respect, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, to recommendation three of the committee, that the Bill and the Intelligence Services Act 2001 be amended to allow the committee to request a written or oral briefing on any matter in relation to any questioning warrant. The government notes this recommendation. The committee will have an opportunity to request briefings uh, on questioning warrants as part of a further review commencing before 7 September 2023. In addition to the amendments which respond to the committee's recommendations, uh, the government proposed amendments to further strengthen the bill's safeguards. These additional safeguards will ensure that the IGIS or the IGIS officials cannot be denied entry to a place of questioning and may possess communications devices, ensure that a permitted disclosure under the bill's secrecy offences uh, includes disclosure by a minor to a parent or guardian 
and clarify the operation of certain provisions related to the oversight and complaints functions performed by an IGES official. Uh, and the government is of the opinion that collectively what these amendments will do or have done uh, is to strengthen the bill and improve the operation uh, of the bill. So, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, in, in terms of the threat environment uh, that obviously our, our intelligence and security agencies are faced with, uh, Australian security and intelligence agencies they face a complex and evolving threat environment. Uh, the Director General of ASIO has indeed described the current threat from espionage and foreign interference as greater now than at the height of the Cold War. These sophisticated activities threaten our universities, our government officials, media institutions and parliament, key institutions of Australia's democracy, in an attempt to undermine our authority. ASIO's inability to use its existing compulsory questioning powers against suspected spies is a serious gap in Australia's national security legislative framework. And again, in terms of what the bill before the Senate uh, is seeking to do, it introduces important reforms to the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act 1979, which has been referred to as the ASIO Act, to ensure ASIO's powers are appropriately tailored to the current security environment, bearing in mind what the Director General of ASIO has described the current threat from espionage and foreign interference, and I will remind senators, as greater now than at the height of the Cold War. Um, in conclusion, then, Mr Deputy Acting Deputy President, this bill will ensure that ASIO has the powers it needs to deal with current and emerging threats to our nation's security. The Morrison government is committed to ensuring our security agencies have the powers they need to operate effectively in an increasingly challenging and complex national security environment. And I note from speeches given by other senators in this chamber uh, that this sentiment is shared by those senators. And on that basis, I will commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. I don't believe there are any second reading amendments, and so the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister uh, Clark. Sorry? No? Division is required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is, the bill will be read a second time. The ayes are passed to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. And I point at Senator McGrath, tell her for the ayes. Senator Seward, tell her for the noes. Order. There being 39 ayes and 9 noes, the question is agreed to. Uh, there are amendments uh, for the committee stage. Uh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act 1979 and for related purposes. So we will now move into committee. Those senators who do not wish to participate in the committee stage, could I invite you to either leave the chamber quietly or uh, remain in your seats? Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. I uh, uh, move, uh, I seek leave to move 
amendments one and two on sheet 1044 together. Uh, let's leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Payton. Thank you, uh, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, in this uh, bill, we are dealing with uh, yet another instalment of counter-terrorism legislation, part of the steady drumbeat of national security measures presented to this parliament over the last couple of decades. And in due course, we will be dealing with more national security legislation that will flow from the government's response to the review undertaken by former ASIO Director General Mr Dennis, Dennis Richardson. This process of constant review and uh, uh, consequential expansion of uh, intelligence and security powers appears to have no end. Over two decades, our intelligence community has grown greatly in size, employing uh, many thousands of staff and spending billions of dollars annually on highly secret operations. The parliament has repeatedly extended the responsibilities and powers of those agencies. They have a vastly expanded mandate to protect the Australian people and to gather information and make decisions that may profoundly affect individual citizens. In the case of this legislation, which deals with detention powers, the advice of our intelligence agencies may indeed result in persons being deprived of their liberty and fundamental rights. These are very significant powers that must always be exercised with caution, restraint and only on the basis of highly accurate and verified information. Now, I must stand and say our intelligence agencies are highly professional. I say again, our intelligence agencies are highly professional, but they are not infallible. They do make mistakes. The case of Dr Mohammed Hanif is just but one case in which our intelligence agencies got things horribly wrong. Intelligence is often an opaque and ambiguous business. Consequently, as I have observed previously, I have long been of the view that the parliament's preparedness to increase the powers and authorities of our intelligence agencies and the powers and authorities of the ministers who exercise control over those agencies must be matched with an equal preparedness to improve scrutiny of the intelligence community by the parliament. In this regard, it is a major deficiency unique to Australia uh, among the so-called five, uh, five power countries that our uh, parliamentary joint committee on intelligence and security is explicitly excluded from being able to review the operational activities of our intelligence communities. Now, just so everyone's clear about this, our constitution grants this parliament the ability to pretty much uh, have a scrutiny role over every action, every operation, every bit of expenditure by, uh, by the federal government. And those powers actually, as we know, extend uh, beyond that. And it is, there is a restriction on the PJCIS operating, oper, oper, um, asking questions on, an, on operational matters, but that's because the parliament decided that. The parliament decided to do that, and that may have been a, an appropriate uh, a decision uh, back when the Intelligence Services Act was uh, was, uh, was uh, given royal assent, and uh, the PJ, and when the PJCIS was uh, established. However, as it currently stands, we have a major deficiency in dem democratic accountability, and I have, on several occasions, introduced amendments to the Intelligence Services Act to extend the mandate of the PJCIS to cover operational matters. There should be nothing that is controversial about such a measure. My amendment is closely modelled on the provisions governing the role of, the, of Canada's Parliament's Intelligence Oversight Committee. So, so far, both the Coalition government and Labor opposition have declined to support these measures, though Labor has expressed in principle support. They haven't been able to bring themselves 
to, to, to vote for them, and I'm hoping that they may do that today. <clears throat> now, the government will stand up and say that Mr Richardson's review has recommended against an expansion of the PJCIS's oversight to cover intelligence agency operations. But that's to be entirely expected. After all, Mr Richardson, a very long-serving national security bureaucrat, had no interest in enhancing, uh, enhancing parliamentary scrutiny. That's one of the reasons the government chose him and not some eminent legal figure to carry out the review. The fix was in from the very beginning. The Richardson Review could have provided an opportunity to bring Australian parliamentary scrutiny of intelligence into line with our allies and up to an appropriate standard of democratic accountability. But that was an opportunity the government was determined to miss. So today I'm once again moving an amendment to legislation to propose that the parliament expand the mandate of the PJCIS to include review of intelligence agency operations and not be limited to scrutiny of just administrative and financial matters. The arguments for this, measures, this, measures, this measure is very clear. Intelligence operations can have highly significant diplomatic, military and human rights aspects. Within the bounds of appropriate security and secrecy, the parliament should be able to scrutinise intelligence operations, the success of or failure of which may be of vital importance to our nation. Proper parliamentary scrutiny should not stop at the edge of the intelligence community. On the contrary, the special and highly secretive nature of those agencies demand proper democratic accountability. And that accountability cannot be achieved without non-executive members of this parliament being fully admitted into that secret world. The measure I propose is not radical. Again, it is very closely modelled on the mandate of Canada's National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. However, I do not expect the government to support this change. Minister. Uh, thank you. And I understand there's only um, but a few seconds uh, left, unfortunately, until we do hit the hard marker uh, of 1 p.m. today. But, Senator Patrick, you are correct uh, in your summation of the government's uh, decision on this particular amendment. Uh, the government will not be supporting uh, this amendment. Uh, we are, our long-standing position is that operational oversight of Australia's intelligence, security and law enforcement agencies is appropriately conducted by independent statutory bodies. Order. Senator, the time allotted for the debate on the bill has expired. And in accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier today, I will now put the questions on the remaining stages of the bill and then put the questions on the remaining stages of the other bills listed in that resolution. Uh, so the question is that the amendments on sheet 1044 moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. No noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that the amendments on sheet 1044 moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. The ayes are passed to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Patrick as teller for the ayes, Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order. There being 10 ayes and 40 noes, the amendments are not agreed to and the bill stands as printed. I will now stand with the amendments circulated by the opposition. As these amendments were circulated after 11 a.m. this morning, leave will be required for them to be considered. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Pursuant to order, I shall report the bill. The committee has considered the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill of 2020 and agreed to it without amendments. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and the bill now be passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. In fact, for one minute. One minute.
The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those in favour will move to the right of the chair, those against will move to the left. And I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and teller, Senator Seaworth as teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 36, noes 9. The motion is therefore um, in the affirmative. Thank you. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act 1979 and for related purposes. I will now deal with the Aged Care Amendment Aged Care Recipient Classification Bill 2020. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an Act to amend the Aged Care Act 1997 and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an Act to amend the Aged Care Act 1997 and for related purposes. I will now deal with the Financial Sector Reform Hain Royal Commission Response Bill 2020 and the Corporations Fees Amendment Hain Royal Commission Response Bill 2020. The question is that the bills be now read a second time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Financial Sector Reform Hain Royal Commission Response Bill 2020, Corporation Fees Amendment Hain Royal Commission Response Bill 2020. Thank you. I will now deal with the amendments circulated by the opposition. The question is that the amendments on sheets 1179 and 1180 circulated by the opposition be agreed to. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, Okay. Thank you for that clarification. So the question now is that the amendment on sheet 1179 circulated by the opposition be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the remaining stages of these bills be agreed to and these bills be now passed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Financial Sector Reform, Hain Royal Commission Response Bill 2020, Corporation Fees Amendment, Hain Royal Commission Response Bill 2020. I will now deal with the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 6, Bill 2020. I will deal first with the second reading amendment circulated by the opposition. So the question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1182 circulated by the opposition be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. 
The question now is that the bill be now read a second time and that the second reading oh, sorry, this, that second the, second, the bill be now read a second time, the second reading as amended, which it wasn't amended, so sorry, Can that clarifies, so we'll, that the bill be now read a second time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Bill, the clerk, sorry. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation, competition and charities to make various minor and technical amendments of the statute law in the Treasury portfolio to repeal certain obsolete acts and for related purposes. So the question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation, competition and charities to make various minor and technical amendments of the statute law in the Treasury portfolio to repeal certain obsolete acts and for related purposes. I will now deal with the Export Market Development Grants Legislation Amendment Bill 2020. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation in relation to export market development grants and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation in relation to export market development grants and for related purposes. I will now deal with the National Emergency Declaration Bill 2020 and the National Emergency Declaration Consequential Amendments Bill 2020. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the bills for concurrence. Minister. Thank you. I move that these bills be now read a first time and I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bills. So the question is that the bills be now read a first time. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk to read the bills. A bill for an act to provide for the declaration of national emergencies and for related purposes. A bill for an act to deal with consequential matters arising from the enactment of the National Emergency Declaration Act 2020 and for related purposes. Senator Gallagher, where you go next? I have a note here. They're saying that there's a second reading amendment. Yes. Okay. So the the question is that the second reading amendment circulated by Senator Watt be agreed. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. No. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that the second reading amendment circulated by Senator Watt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McCarthy, tell of the ayes. Senator Brockman, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bills be agreed to and these bills be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. National Emergency Direct Declaration Bill 2020. National Emergency Declaration Consequential Amendments Bill 2020. I will now deal with the Corporations Amendment Corporate Insolvency Reforms Bill 2020. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to insolvency and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to insolvency and for related. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's an amendment. Oh, sorry. There's sorry. my running sheet didn't have an amendment on it, but there is an amendment to this. Senator. Mc... Oh, sorry. The amendment has been withdrawn. Thank you. No worries at all. Thank you, clerk. 
a bill for an act to amend the law in relation to insolvency and for related purposes. Government business, order of the day number one, social services and other legislation amendment, extension of coronavirus support bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Okay, we're right. I'm sorry, I've got some heads. But we'll just let, let um, the senators leave the uh, chamber quietly, please. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. From the outset, I want to indicate that Labor will be moving a number of very detailed and important amendments to this bill in the committee stages. And we will have a truncated debate, so I call on the chamber to, to listen to these issues. Stopping government from cutting payments to around two million people at Christmas time, including people on unemployment support, students, apprentices and single parents. Requiring the minister urgently to consider a permanent increase to the base rate of the job seeker payment. The only way unemployment support can be increased is if the government decides to do it. It can't be done from this chamber because it involves expenditure. Reversing the government's unfair reinstatement of the liquid assets waiting period and requiring the minister to urgently consider extending the beneficial changes that have been made to partner income tests, how much a person can earn before losing their payment and eligibility rules for sole traders, among other things. I also move my second reading amendment uh, as circulated in my name, and I move that the Senate notes the government's plan to cut coronavirus support for businesses and individuals and calls on the government to permanently increase the base rate of job seeker payment. This is not an extension of coronavirus support in this bill. It is, in fact, a cut. Yes, it extends the timeline, but the cut is in the hands. The, the, the government is seeking to put a cut in the hands of the Senate and the Chamber uh, when the government has the opportunity to increase that payment of their own volition. The effect of this bill is, in fact, to return unemployment support to the old base rate of only $40 a day from 31 March by ending the minister's power to make regulations extending that supplement. We vehemently object to this part of the bill and will be moving to amend it. The government could choose not to use that power and cut payments at any time, as they have done twice already. But in this bill, the government wants to remove this power, and that gives us a clear indication of the government's plan to take unemployment all the way back to the old rate uh, of New Start in March. Now, today, we can see uh, more than a million unemployed here in Australia. 1.8 million Australians are projected to be unemployment, on unemployment support by the end of the year. Two million Australians will be impacted by the government's scheduled cut to the coronavirus next March. And this, as we know, includes people who've lost their jobs, as well as single parents and students. We also know that the JobKeeper payments end, and for businesses that can't sustain the ongoing employment of those staff, uh, then we will see uh, those people join uh, the unemployment queue on that miserly rate of $40 a day. The base rate for unemployment is simply too low. The government knows that. Every job seeker in this country knows that. And unfortunately, unless we can act today in the chamber, and unless also the government chooses to do the right thing and lift that base, 
then hundreds of thousands of more Australians will also know that when JobKeeper payments stop as well. Unemployment support is what we need in this nation to provide a barrier to people descending into poverty. It sustains local communities, local economies, and those payments also create jobs. Returning the rate to just $40 a day risks placing millions of Australians in deep hardship, and it jeopardises local jobs. The government, as we know, temporarily boosted JobSeeker at the outset of the pandemic when the number of Australians requiring support doubled overnight. So I find it just utterly galling that while uh, the number of Australians re requiring that support might drop as the economy uh, picks up activity again, we also know that that number is expected to increase uh, by the end of the year. Uh, and it will continue to increase with uh, JobKeeper payments withdrawing. It is galling that the government can, in this legislation, want to overtly cut that support. Now, the difficult thing for Labor is that there are many beneficial elements to this bill which must also be passed uh, by this parliament. This means uh, things like also including the coronavirus supplement for youth allowance, uh, so that is student and apprentice recipients after December, uh, as well as the increased income-free areas, taper rates and partner income tests that have been introduced as part of the pandemic. It means we can't simply oppose this legislation to forewarn you that we don't want to be complicit with your uh, cuts uh, to job seeker payments. The simple fact is, even if the parliament didn't pass uh, those cuts, you'd have the power to make those cuts anyway. And we want to give you the power to extend those payments and keep them at a higher level. It does schedule in March a cut to job seeker for a return to the old base rate of New Start. We very much welcomed the introduction of the coronavirus supplement. We consistently called for an increase to unemployment support long before the pandemic. It is simply too low, too inadequate. It does not protect Australians from hardship. It does not enable them to live with dignity. The coronavirus supplement has been paid to most people through regulation-making powers. The minister has under the Social Security Act of 1991. Under those powers, the government can extend the coronavirus supplement and set the rate in three monthly intervals so long as the impact of COVID-19 persists. The government can also choose not to use this power and cut the level of support. But this government has cut the level of support twice once in September, and they have announced another cut at Christmas. The government has taken the coronavirus supplement from $550 per fortnight to $250 a fortnight, and will make it just $150 per fortnight from Christmas. But this bill also repeals the minister's power to indefinitely extend the supplement on the April the 1st of next year. Now, Labor's amendment in this chamber is designed to address this, and if there are people in the crossbench offices listening, I'm asking you, uh, please, to come into the chamber and vote for this amendment. Earlier this year, Labor requested of the government to include for a power to the minister uh, within the economic response package. Uh, the Omnibus Act this chamber passed, we requested a power that would enable the Social Security Minister to make other changes to the Social Security system to help people protected, uh, to help people impacted by the pandemic. We're very pleased we did that because there have been new and important ways that the minister has been able to uh, address things like income test thresholds and a range of other things. 
Uh, and if it weren't for Labor's instigation of that, people would have been left in hardship. This bill, importantly, proposes to extend this power, and it's a power we want to see extended and we support. We think the power needs to persist for longer. We want this flexibility to continue because of the ongoing economic challenges as, uh, that may arise in the course of the pandemic. Because of this power, which Labor asked for, government's been able to introduce more generous partner income tests for job seeker payments, uh, which we negotiated. And it tapers now at 27 cents in the dollar and cuts out at a partner income of $80,000 a year. This power has also enabled the government to make changes to the job seeker and youth allowance personal income tests. It provided an income free area of $300 per fortnight up from 106 prior to the pandemic. It's enabled the government to expand other eligibility criteria to the job seeker and youth allowance uh, uh, payments. It also now includes sole traders, the self-employed, permanent employees who've been stood down, people self-isolating because they or someone they are caring for has been affected by the pandemic. You can see how important these powers are and how they might be necessary in terms of being ongoing. It enabled the government to waive the ordinary waiting period of one week, the seasonal preclusion period and the newly arrived residence waiting period. It's enabled the government to extend the time people can maintain eligibility for payment and keep concession cards. They've made other beneficial changes relating to pension portability, mobility allowance and self-declaration for couple assessments, all things that have been critically important to the lives of Australians. In its current form, though, this bill removes the minister's ability to make regulations that waive the liquid assets uh, waiting period and the assets period. Labor does not support this, and this chamber should not support this. The government should not have reinstated the liquid assets waiting period in September. They should drop their cruel plan to make people wait 26 weeks to get unemployment support if they have modest savings, notably perhaps even if they've taken their superannuation out previously because of the pandemic. People are forced to run down their last dollar, meaning they're more likely to face hardship. Hardship in things like struggling to pay the mortgage, taking the car off the road, or importantly, finding new work. The government's plan to return JobSeeker to its old base rate of $40 a day will only make things harder for the 1.8 million Australians expected to be on unemployment support by the end of this year. Unemployment levels are expected to be elevated above pre-pandemic levels for at least the next four years. And the simple fact is the government should be helping people back to work, not penalising them because they've lost their job. The number of job seekers far outweighs the number of jobs actually in the labour market, a problem that is much greater in our regions, and this government has failed to deliver them a jobs plan. No plan for those 1.8 million job seekers. You will continue, the government will continue tripping people up with their targeted compliance framework administered by for-profit companies that in no way serve people getting back into the workforce at a time like this in high unemployment. And you continue, the government continues to cynically insinuate that Australians who've lost their job have chosen to do so. Your ideological obsession with the cashless debit card which has failed to demonstrate it actually works. This bill is a missed opportunity for the government to deliver a permanent increase for unemployed Australians. The government's plan for unemployment and other payments to go back to their pre-pandemic rate on 31 March are laid bare by this legislation. 
That's why we're moving amendments. We are calling on the government to announce a permanent increase to unemployment support rather than choosing to plunge people into hardship and a risk of poverty this Christmas. Senator Seaworth. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment extension of the Coronavirus Supplement Bill 2020. Well, here we go again. Another day, another group of people being hit and disadvantaged by this government. Because no matter how the government tries to explain this away as actually what it's about is we're giving people more money. It's not a cut. It is a cut. So let's start from the basis of the fact that we all knew the job seeker payment was too low at $40 a day. The government, very rightly, and we supported it, introduced the coronavirus supplement. Now they knew that was essential because they knew people couldn't live on the job seeker payment of $40 a day. It's been very clear for years and years and years. So then they cut it. They cut it by $300 at the end of September dropping people into poverty because that makes the combined payment of the job seeker payment plus the coronavirus supplement brings it brings that payment below the poverty line now despite all the rhetoric they are cutting people's payments again when the recession isn't over despite the claims of the treasurer and we are still dealing with the issues around the pandemic they're being cut again by another hundred dollars, dropping families, dropping people further below the poverty line. And I can hear those on the other bench, on the opposite side of the chamber, coming out and saying, "Oh yes, but they get other payments. The majority of them get forty bucks, uh, four dollars a day extra for the energy supplement, which takes the payment of the job seeker payment plus that to forty-four dollars a day." This is another hit to the most disadvantaged in our community who are trying to survive on payments that don't enable them now to meet their rent, meet their essential bills, meet their, any medical bills they may have. So this is another go by this government at those that can't find work. Bearing in mind that last night they passed legislation that continued the cashless debit card for another two years. And last night a number of us articulated the impact that that card has on people's daily life. This is yet another impact that those people are going to have to deal with. The major change introduced by this bill is a reduction and extension of the coronavirus supplement to $150 a fortnight from the 1st of January, i.e. just after Christmas, to the 31st of March 2021. Now, the Greens think that this is appalling. That the government thinks that people are going to be able to survive um, with these cuts. I'm foreshadowing a second reader amendment that notes that the measures in this bill will cut the coronavirus supplement from $250 a fortnight to $150 a fortnight and throw an additional 330,000 people into poverty, which means that the government will now have forced a total of 1.16 million Australians below the poverty line since September of this year and calls on the government to immediately announce a permanent and ongoing increase to the job seeker payment and youth allowance so that unemployed and underemployed Australians can live above the poverty line. The, this is essential, that the government increases the rate of job seeker, end the uncertainty and the fact that people can't make plans when they don't know what the payment is going to be. This bill also extends uh, several changes that were made to our social security system through to the 31st of March next year, 
including changes to the personal income test for recipients of the job seeker payment and youth allowance, changes to the partner income test for the job seeker payment, waiving the um, ordinary waiting period, seasonal work preclusion period and, norm and uh, newly arrived residence waiting period. When the coronavirus supplement was initially introduced at the rate of $550 a fortnight, hundreds of thousands of Australians were lifted out of poverty. This bill will cut income support payments by $50 a few days after Christmas, uh, $50 a week after Christmas. In doing so, it will reverse the gains made tackling poverty and plunge record numbers of people into hardship. So, we started addressing the issues around poverty, and now this government is rushing to take those supports away, dropping people back into hardship. In fact, this latest cut to the coronavirus supplement will throw an additional, as I said, 330,000 people into poverty, meaning that they will force, they have forced, when this happens, an additional 1.16 million people below the poverty line. Researchers from the ANU are saying we are seeing elevated levels of poverty that are now well above the levels of poverty we had pre-COVID. And quite frankly, it makes me sick that this government is putting in measures that it knows very, very well will increase poverty in Australia. The timing of these cuts to the coronavirus supplement is simply incomprehensible. The Minister for Social Services should know that emergency relief and financial counselling services traditionally experience a peak in service demand around January. What do you think these people are going to need to do when they haven't got enough money? They're going to be reaching out for emergency support just when there's already a peak in demand. Why then has the government chosen the 1st of January to make these cuts? Because they are cuts. That's what people see them on the ground. People on the ground see them as cuts. While the government wants to frame this bill as an extension of support, make no mistake, these are cuts to what it means to people's pockets. It's a cut to people receiving a job seeker payment, youth allowance and parenting payment. The effects of this pandemic are far from over, despite the government trying to talk up the fact that we, the recession, we're moving away from the recession. People are still feeling it on the ground. Cutting the coronavirus supplement will only serve to further entrench poverty and stall economic recovery. People want to work, but even before the pandemic, there simply wasn't enough jobs to go round. Anglicare Australia's job availability snapshot shows that there were 106 job seekers for every en entry level vacancy. This week, Anglicare Australia released another report asking those who know a survey of Australians on Centrelink payments. This report paints a bleak picture of life before the coronavirus supplement was introduced in March, before the job seeker payment was in effect increased with the coronavirus supplement. 59 per cent of respondents had less than $100 in, a weekly, in, in weekly income left after paying housing costs. $100 a week, $100 left to pay all their other bills. That was, that was after just housing costs coming out. 72 per cent of all surveyed respondents regularly skipped meals. 14 per cent of young survey respondents had to couch surf. After the $550 coronavirus supplement was introduced, the percentage of Australians living on $7 a day was halved. I'm extremely concerned that how unemployed, how unemployed and underemployment Australians will survive when the income support payments are cut to $50 a day, which is what this cut basically does, come the 1st of January. The government is condemning people to a life of skipping meals every day, couch surfing, not being able to pay their rent. There are 1.1 million children whose parents are receiving the coronavirus supplement. This bill will condemn hundreds of thousands of children to living in poverty, which we all know, we all know, has lifelong implications. 
Children living in poverty are more likely to face food insecurity, lack good relationships and miss out on learning at home. We also know that children from poor households are 3.3 times more likely to suffer adult poverty than those who grew up in never poor households. This government talks about wanting to reduce long term their terms welfare dependency, yet it fails to recognise how cutting the coronavirus supplement is in direct opposition to this goal. One of the best ways we can lift children out of poverty is by ensuring that income support payments, uh, the payments their parents receive, are above the poverty line. I am deeply concerned um, about the impacts the cuts to the coronavirus supplement will have on older Australians. We know that many older Australians have lost work and suffered the greatest reduction in hours as a result of the pandemic. In reality, if you are over 55 and have lost your job, it's highly unlikely that you will be able to enter the workforce again. Anglicare Australia found that income support recipients aged over 45 were significantly more likely to be pessimistic about their future work prospects. By ignore, ignoring calls for a permanent increase to jo the job seeker payment, the government is condemning older Australians to live in poverty until they reach pension age. I also worry about the impact this bill will have on people being pushed into debt and needing to seek out predatory payday lenders, because that's where people have to go when they're living in poverty and have urgent bills. When income support payments fall below the poverty line, people are at significantly increased risk of using high interest short term lenders and unaffordable debt out of sheer desperation. As rent and mortgage moratoriums are lifted, we are going to see large numbers of people in experiencing financial hardship and debt issues. While the government talks about payroll jobs returning, this holds little hope for the 700,000 people who are on the job seeker payment before COVID hit. This bill is going to entrench long-term un unemployment by reducing the job seeker the jo those on job seeker payment further below the poverty line. We know that searching for work takes time and costs money. By keeping the payment below the poverty line, the government is putting barriers in people's way. People have less capacity um, to pay for what they need to do for job searches, for the costs that are associated with it, for clothing, for transport, for the many other things they need to do to find work. I'm also concerned about the impact this cut will have on women experiencing domestic and family violence. We cannot ignore the intersection between poverty and family violence. We have all heard the powerful accounts about how the additional $550 a fortnight has supported women to leave family violence situations and re-establish their lives. I am extremely concerned what the ramifications of cutting these payments will have for those women. This bill also will impact, these cuts will also impact on the mental health and well-being of unemployed Australians. I really struggle to listen to the government doing shiny press conferences on mental health when, to, when they are turning around and cutting income support in the next one. Living below the poverty, poverty line for an extended period of time impacts people's mental health. It exacerbates existing health problems and creates new ones. People are understandably fearful about what happens next and how they will keep a roof over their heads. This bill entrenches, uh, it contributes to, the poverty, to poverty by permanently ending the pause to the liquid assets waiting period and the assets test from 1 January 2021. It is absolutely premature to reintroduce these tests when millions of Australians are experiencing unemployment and underemployment. Older Australians who are going, to, are going to be particularly worse off being forced to wear down their savings before they can access support. I've also had people telling me how they've accessed their super and now that means that they cannot um, apply for JobSeeker because they don't meet the liquid assets test. That's appalling that people are being forced to use this super um, because JobSeeker um, because of the liquid assets test. That super we know is supposed to be there for their retirement. This bill we cannot not support because if we don't support it, people won't be getting 
the reduced payment. But we absolutely resent and call out the government for cutting these payments way too early because it is going to drop so many people into poverty. The government needs to announce a permanent ongoing increase to JobSeeker to ensure people aren't living in poverty and they aren't living with the uncertainty about their futures because they don't know how much money they're going to have in order to Thank live. you, Senator Seward. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Extension of the Coronavirus Support Bill 2020. Uh, through this bill, we're extending temporary increased financial support for Australians for an additional three months from 1 January 2021, which is when the supplementary payments were originally uh, slated to finish, and, and we're extending them to the 31st of March 2021. The Morrison government is committed to supporting individuals and families and the economy during the COVID-19 pandemic by providing additional financial assistance to people who have lost their jobs or have reduced their income. Quite simply, this bill will provide more money, more money for people, ensuring that no Australian is left behind as our economy is recovering and as that recovery is still in its infancy. The government is still closely monitoring economic conditions, and it would be irresponsible not to, and it's committed, committed to maintaining and remaining flexible with the support measures that we have. To date, our temporary measures have successfully supported Australian businesses and individuals through the global economic shock and the uncertainty. But we understand that challenging conditions continue. The government has committed economic support at levels never previously seen, totalling $507 billion, or around 26 per cent of GDP. This is in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Importantly, this support is largely temporary, which means that the government is not locked in to the super expensive ongoing payments. This is a responsible way in which we can provide the economic support that Australians are needing. This is why we are legislating this amendment here today. The government is providing a safety net to those that need it most while, importantly, maintaining those incentives that are important to get people into work. This bill responds to improving economic conditions in Australia, which is great news for Australia. As health measures in place to respond to the coronavirus pandemic have further relaxed, we're recognising that the global economic growth across the world is tepid at best and it's coming off a very low base. But it must be noted at this point, Madam Acting Deputy President, that Australia's economic growth over the last quarter, over the last quarter has been world leading. We came out of a recession and had 3.3 per cent economic growth, with Al Jazeera describing our economic recovery as an unprecedented kangaroo hop. Now, our economy recovery has been world leading not only because of its scale, but also because of its flexibility and the government's commitment to broad consultation. Rigid and prescriptive measures simply would not have worked. It is worth, at this point, to commend uh, the, the opposition on their mostly bipartisan support for stimulus and support measures. This legislative framework allows government to extend temporary measures in the income support system to provide additional support to Australians impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. This, the instrument making power, will be used to enact the following measures, uh, the following settings to the 31st of March 2021. We'll see the most visible of the changes in the extension of the coronavirus supplement for an additional three months at the rate of $150 per fortnight, meaning that no change to JobSeeker or other payment rates until at least the end of March. We're going to be extending the personal income test for JobSeekers and youth allowance recipients. Now, this is very important because it's providing an additional 
$300 that's permitted in income and a 60, 60 cent taper rate, all well, uh, as well as adjusting the taper for partners of those on job seeker payments to 27 cents per dollar. Uh, Madam, oh, sorry, Mr. President, you changed. We are standing side by side uh, with Australians, side by side with Australians who particularly have been hard hit from the economic impact of this pandemic. And this bill continues to support and provides the minister with the authority to support Australians as required during this holiday period and all the way through to March. And so I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. It being 2 p.m., questions without notice. Senator Wong. Oh, sorry, Senator Birmingham, seeking the call. My apologies. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding ministerial absences. Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time today, Thursday, 10 December 2020, due to ministerial business. In Senator Reynolds' absence, I will represent the Minister for Education and the Minister for Decentralisation and Regional Education in respect of regional education. Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, the Minister for Defence Personnel, the Assistant Defence Minister and the Minister for Defence Industry. Senator Cash will represent the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts. Senator Wong. Order. My question is that. Oh, sorry. Did you call me, Mr. I did, President? Senator Wong. <laughs> Senator Wong. The call is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. My, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why did Mr. Morrison and his ministers have to be asked six times in the House in question time yesterday, uh, over this week, before finally telling the truth? and admitting that their own legislation will enable cuts to the take-home pay of workers. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Wong uh, for her question. I can't, uh, can't say that, uh, that I have been in the House of Representatives question time this week, and nor have I uh, reviewed the sequence of questions that, uh, that were asked there. So, uh, so, so Senator, Senator Wong, uh, your question relates obviously to uh, the types of reforms to industrial relations that our government has outlined, uh, reforms that build upon the pillars of our economic recovery plan resp in response to the COVID-19 global pandemic and the shockwaves that are sent across the global economy and our own. And although our economy has withstood those shockwaves far better than most of the rest of the world in seeing businesses survive that elsewhere would not have survived, in seeing jobs survive that elsewhere would not have survived, we still face challenges in terms of that economic recovery. And to make sure that we do get the continued growth in jobs that we have enjoyed that has brought us to this stage of the comeback from COVID-19, we are making sure that through the budget we deliver in relation to growth and investment, to make sure that Australians, through our tax reforms, have got more money to spend, to make sure that businesses have got more incentive to invest and to make Order sure that there is confidence, confidence to employ Senate, as well. Senator Ayres. And our approach right through this pandemic has been to be one of engagement and consultation be it with the states and territories, be it, with, be it with business or the trade union movement. And we welcome and thank the cooperation that has been shown through the different stages of the pandemic, Mr President. We equally welcome the fact that in relation to reform of the IR system or looking forward, there was a very lengthy consultation process bringing together the different groups for over 180 hours of discussions held as part of those industrial relations discussions, all of which designed to try to get collaboration Order, and Senator consultation around the, the pathway has forward. Inspired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Well, uh, my supplementary is to give the minister a second chance to be honest with working families <laughs> and admit that the government's new laws enable cuts to take-home pay at the end of one of the hardest years in the lives of so many Australians. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the reforms we're putting in place, first and foremost, are about getting more Australians into jobs. Australians have the best chance of having the best pay packet when they are in a job when there are more Australians in jobs and when we see growth in the jobs market. In terms of Australians being better off, Mr President, employees in casual work wanting to transition to part-time or full-time work will be better off 
under the reforms order. that we are Senator proposing. Wong on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. I asked both in the primary and in the first supplementary. I asked about cuts to take-home pay. I asked the minister to be directly relevant to that question. Um, you, you, both of your questions, Senator Wong, did have some politically loaded phrases in them. The minister, in my view, can't be instructed to answer a part of the question. He is talking about the specific policy and package of bills, and I do consider that to be directly relevant uh, because he's talking about the government's policy and not anything else. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. In relation to Australians in jobs being better off, as I was saying, those in casual work wanting to transition to greater levels of permanency will be better off under our reforms. Those part time employees wanting more hours of work in key industries will be better off. Employees being worried about being underpaid will be better off under the reforms that we have outlined. Employees working in significant order. Greenfields projects. Senator, well, I want a point of order. Cuts to take home pay. Um, That's the I'll question. Senator Direct Wong. relevance. Um, the minister Why is being directly truth, relevant. Son? Senator Birmingham. Mr. 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 President, Order. we are making Senator, sure Senator that Australians Wong. will be better off because there will be more incentive Senator for Wong. more jobs. With more Senator jobs, Pratt, you've got Senator more Wong. opportunities for Australians to succeed and to get ahead. Order. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Despite repeatedly denying its legislation permits the take-home pay of working families to be cut before finally conceding it will, earlier this afternoon Mr Porter said of his legislation, and I quote, there's plenty to keep everyone interested and alert. What else in this government's reforms under Mr Morrison should workers be alert to? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I would be interested to have time to go and look at the transcript of Mr. Porter's remarks. I'm sure, I'm sure Mr. Porter was probably being asked about something like the Senate inquiry that may well occur, of which I have no doubt that those opposite will run a scare campaign, as they already are, every step of the way in relation to the consideration Senator of this legislation. They, I know that they can't help themselves in terms of wanting to run a scare campaign. Senator they can't Watt. help themselves. They will opt Senator for Watt. negativity. They will opt for scare. They will opt, of course, for mistruths and misleading at every step of the way. Now, we are quite Order. happy, having gone through an exhaustive consultation process in this legislation, to now submit it to the scrutiny of the parliament, to have the extensive Senate inquiry and to give the opportunity for those who want to find points of interest in the bills, to be able to debate them through that Senate inquiry and for the facts to shine through. Because the facts will show these reforms will be good for Australian businesses, good for employment and create more jobs for more Australians. Order. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government has stood alongside Australians through the challenges our nation has faced this year? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Senator Mr. President. Mr. President Australia Ayers, and the world 10. has faced a year like none other. And I thank Senator Patterson for his question, because indeed we are indebted and grateful to all Australians for all that they have done this year as the nation has stood together in response to the biggest economic shock since the Great Depression in the face of a once in a century global pandemic. Australians have demonstrated their resilience and they should be congratulated and thanked for the efforts that they have made, the sort of resolve and spirit our country has been built upon. Indeed, all levels of Australia have been challenged, including governments. And we have worked to stand alongside Australians in terms of the actions we've taken to save lives and livelihoods across our country. We quickly closed our international borders when the threats were evident that the transmission of COVID would most likely spread through those international transactions of individuals. We put health measures in place to suppress the spread of the virus. Our first aim was, and still is, to keep Australians safe. We then, of course, Mr President, in recognising the impacts of those measures to keep Australians safe, worked hard to cushion the inevitable economic blow that would follow. We put in place, most notably, the JobKeeper program, the single largest support measure ever introduced by an Australian government. We created JobKeeper, we have extended it, 
and transitioned it in ways to keep Australians safe and secure in their livelihoods. The Reserve Bank, the Reserve Bank has indicated and assessed that JobKeeper helped to save 700,000 Australian jobs. Our measures have, throughout the course of this year, provided the best opportunity for Australians to have their lives protected, their livelihoods protected and to put us in the strongest possible position for the future. Order. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, can you outline how our economic comeback from the COVID-19 pandemic is building in momentum? Order. 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 Senator Wong, I know it's the last question time. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, we do have strong data coming through to show that although there is a tough road that is still ahead, the economic comeback in Australia is well and truly underway. We know that the recovery has some way to go and that we face many global headwinds. But indeed, the consumer confidence has once again surged to its highest level in a decade, Mr President. Consumer confidence at its highest level in a decade. When Westpac's monthly index jumped 4.1 per cent, their chief economist Bill Evans said, after only eight months, the evidence seems clear that sentiment has fully recovered from the COVID recession. Now, that's only sentiment, Mr President. We acknowledge the work is in continuing the strong jobs growth uh, that we have seen to date and to make sure that we get Australians back into more jobs. That's what our budget is built around. It's what our policies are built around to maintain that whilst, of course, also seeing Australia's AAA credit rating reaffirmed and the support to make sure that we Order. have that growth Senator across Birmingham. the economy. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the Morrison government's focus on creating jobs paying off for Australian workers and the Australian economy? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the growth in jobs and employment is encouraging. There is, as I've stressed, a way to go. But over the last five months, almost 650,000 jobs have been created, including 334,000 jobs of Australian women and 226,000 jobs of young Australians. The effective unemployment rate has come down from a peak of 14.9 per cent to 7.4 per cent, whilst Mr. President, the participation rate in the workforce is at 65.8 per cent and approaching its pre-crisis level. Australia's strength as we entered this pandemic was indeed the fact that we had record levels of employment alongside record levels of workforce participation. We had managed to create resilience in the Australian economy and, pleasingly, we have seen that resilience see us through these tough times. By global comparisons, Australians can hold their heads high at the way in which we have managed together to keep Australians safe and secure this year. Senator Gallagher. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In an article in this morning's Australian Financial Review entitled Porter Retreats in Union Brawl, it is reported that the Morrison government may amend or even dump provisions of its Industrial Relations Bill. Is the government persisting with its attempt to cut the take home pay of Australian working families? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, that is absolutely not the intent, the purpose or will be the result of the government's reforms. The government is implementing these reforms, as I have said already time and time again in this place, to create the best environment for jobs and employment growth to continue strongly in this country. Mr President, we have seen some 80 per cent of jobs that were lost or had hours reduced due to the pandemic have been regained to date. But that still shows there's work to go in other ways. We also know from the fact that the cooperation that occurred during the pandemic that there are opportunities for efficiencies and improvements to occur in our industrial relations environment and workplace relations space. That's what these changes seek to do. They seek to ensure that we get practical improvements to the way in which the workplace relations system works, and in terms of those practical improvements, we expect to see real gains for businesses and employees. Without business success, there is no employment success, Mr. President. That is a key point that is fundamental to everything about job creation in this country. Without business success, 
there is no job success. So we have to make sure our businesses are successful. That's what our investments, be they in infrastructure, in skills, in tax reforms and incentives, are all about creating the environment for jobs growth. These reforms are about creating the environment for jobs growth as well, reforms to create more jobs so that any worker ultimately wanting a job will be better off as a result of them. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Senator Stoker said in her first speech, and I quote, industrial relations reform is something our nation desperately needs and which the conservative side of politics should promote. Does Senator Stoker support the retreat floated in this morning's papers? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thank, thank, thanks, Mr. President. Well, um, of course, Senator Stoker gave a fine first speech, as I, uh, as I recall, and I, uh, and I again congratulate her on that and many fine contributions since. And of course, Mr. President, Mr. President, uh, uh, in terms of those arguing for these types of reforms, why don't those opposite listen to Order. small business? To small business, Order, the Watt. Council of Small Business Organisations, who have said Senator very McAllister. clearly that the types of reforms we're Senator proposing Watt. are about managing your business and everything else Watt. in the agreement no, so you can survive. If you're a no, worker, him. you'd rather have a job. And small business are, of course, committed to trying to create those jobs, and we are committed. We are committed to delivering those jobs. Now, it says it all that those opposite in their scare campaign have already resorted to anonymous newspaper stories and, uh, and not even bothering to look, not even bothering to look, of course, at the legislation, the order. details Senator Birmingham, and the fact time they are the has measured expired. Order. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr Jason Falinski, Mr Tim Wilson and Senator Bragg have advocated for the greater industrial relations flexibility, jointly authoring a op-ed and lobbying within the coalition. Do coalition backbenchers support the retreat by the Morrison government flagged in this morning's papers? Senator Birmingham. So, 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 so Mr President, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes, I know, to follow the strategy of those opposite. Uh, indeed, the Australian people have found it hard in recent elections to follow the strategy of those opposite. But, mis but, mis but Mr President, I seem to have had the first series of questions from those opposite I was asked today, suggesting that the reforms were too harsh. And now Senator Gallagher's based all of his questions around whether we've backed down and the reforms aren't harsh enough or something. Now, these reforms, these reforms are sensible, thoughtful reforms based on extensive, order. lengthy consultation. Senator, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Direct relevance. The minister said questions whether or not there's been a back down. We, we invite him to tell his coalition Senator colleagues Wong, if there's been no a retreat or not. That is Has no point of order, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Now, 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 Mr President, I don't know whether there's a split over there, whether Senator Gallagher is actually arguing that there should be further reforms that ought to be in this package or not, but I can assure him and I can assure every other senator and every Australian these reforms are the result of hours upon hours of work and consultation between the government, between the union movement, between businesses in seeking to find sensible Order. approaches to create a more secure employment expired. environment. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. On 8 December, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Meltzer, appealed to British authorities to immediately release Julian Assange from prison or to place him under guarded house arrest during U US extradition proceedings. Minister, today is Order. International Human Rights Day. Will the minister join this call from the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture in calling for Mr Assange's human rights to be protected? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Rice uh, for her question. I haven't specifically heard about uh, Mr Meltzer's uh, call today, uh, but I have previously said that uh, the government rejects any suggestion by the uh, UN Special Rapporteur uh, that the government is complicit uh, in uh, alleged psychological torture or has shown a lack of consular support for Mr Assange. Uh, as far as uh, I understand and am 
and am advised the Special Rapporteur has not been in contact with the Australian government to raise these concerns directly. I have specifically raised the situation of Mr Assange and his conditions previously uh, with senior British officials, uh, and I am ensure, assured that his uh, circumstances uh, are appropriate and are humane. Senator Rice, a supplementary question. Thanks, Minister. Um, Minister, I acknowledge your diplomatic and political work to secure the release of Kylie Moore Gilbert and note that these efforts went well beyond consular assistance. Will the minister recognise that Mr Assange's case situation is not simply a consular case and offer the same diplomatic and political support to secure his release. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I don't uh, believe it is possible to directly equate uh, cases such as these uh, in the consular context or, in fact, in the legal context, Mr. President. Currently, Mr. Assange's extradition case is adjourned until the 4th of January next year, when uh, Her Honour will hand down her decision. I'm not going to provide a running commentary on those legal proceedings, but the Australian government continues to monitor Mr. Assange's case closely, as we do for Australians in detention overseas. Uh, as I've previously advised the senator in the context of uh, estimates, Mr. President, consular officers have attended his extradition. Order, and Senator other Rice, on a point of order. Thank you. A point of order with regards to relevance. My question was very simple. Will the minister recognise that Mr. Assange's situation no, senator, is not simply a consular case? Senator Rice, case? Um, again, I say to senators, you can't simply get up and say, repeat part of a question without making a point as to how the answer is not relevant to all of the questions. Senator Payne was being directly relevant to the question at that point, talking about the assistance being provided, Senator Rice. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr, Mr. President. Uh, I was going to add to my answer that consular staff uh, have had uh, discussions with uh, Her Majesty's prison Belmarsh authorities. They are assured that Mr Assange has access to the care that he uh, needs. Uh, due to privacy considerations that we extend uh, to all consular clients, I am not able to disclose any further information relating to Mr Assange. Senator Rice, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you. Um, Minister, 65 of approximately 160 inmates in Belmarsh Prison have tested positive for COVID putting Mr Assange at serious risk. Will you make representations, you personally make representations for his transfer to house arrest for the duration of the extradition proceedings to protect his health and his human rights? Today is International Human Rights Day. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr Assange has withdrawn consent for the Australian government to consult about his personal circumstances, his health and his welfare in prison. Mr Assange withdrew that uh, consent on 13 June last year. We have raised on a number of occasions with the United Kingdom government and with prison officials our expectations on how he would be treated. Uh, the High Commissioner in the United Kingdom has received direct assurances that Mr Assange is held in appropriate conditions with access to a full prison regime of medical support and access to legal advice, noting prison COVID-19 social Rice, distancing. On a point of order. Yes, thanks, Mr President. Again, my question was whether the minister would Senator make Rice, personal Senator Rice, representations. Senator Rice, resume your, seat. resume your seat. You can't stand up and simply repeat a question. What is the point of order, Senator Rice? Was relevance. My question was, would the minister no, make that, that, personal that, that, sit down, representation? Senator Rice. Not even <laughs> Senator Payne was being directly relevant to the answer. Directly relevant. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. Let me conclude by saying that the High Commission has written to Mr Assange 18 times offering consular support since, that was with, since his agreement Order. was withdrawn on 13 June Order, last year. Senator the most recent time was 8 December. Senator we Wilson. have not received a response from Mr Assange or his legal team Senator to Payne, any time one the of those 18 Sen Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. It concerns the recent signing of a memorandum of understanding between the government of Papua New Guinea, the Fly River Provincial Government, the China Fujian Zhonghong Fisheries Company for the construction of a $200 million multifunction 
Fishery Industrial Park on the island of uh, Daru in close proximity to the Torres Strait. Did the PNG government consult with the Australian government prior to entering into this agreement, which was announced by the Chinese Ministry of Commerce and strongly backed by the Chinese ambassador in Port Moresby? What views has the Australian government expressed to PNG about, about this project? What are the national security uh, implications of Australia of a permanent Chinese fishing present next to the Torres Strait? Is it not the case that such a presence, presence will complicate our uh, security and provide China with a new foothold for interference in PNG? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Patrick for his question and some uh, advance, uh, brief advance notice of his, uh, the nature of his question. Uh, I am aware, Mr. President, of a memorandum of understanding uh, being signed on the 13th of November this year between Papua New Guinea's Western Province Provincial Government, uh, the Chinese Fishing Company, Fujian Zhonghong Fishery Limited, and the Papua New Guinea National Fisheries Authority. Mr. President, while bilateral matters are, of course, uh, bilateral arrangements are, of course, a matter for the respective countries, we are in contact with the Papua New Guinea government on the reported memorandum of understanding, in particular to ensure that the full range of Australian interests, including in fisheries protection, are fully safeguarded. We are highly trusted partners, Australia and Papua New Guinea, as demonstrated in the signing of our comprehensive strategic and economic partnership uh, just on the 5th of August. Even in the context of COVID-19, Mr President, we were able to implement that CSEP. So we have the closest of relationships at both the political and the operational levels. I would advise the Chamber that uh, it is our view there is some way to go before any material activity commences in relation to this MOU. Normal monitoring and enforcement actions by Australian authorities continue to operate to particularly protect our fisheries. We expect all fishers in the Torres Strait region to follow respective Australian and Papua New Guinea laws uh, and international obligations. Our engagement in the Pacific, Mr President, is driven by our commitment to the shared Blue Pacific vision of a secure, stable, inclusive and prosperous region. It is Australia's view that all external partners must respect our region's collective security interests. Uh, we make that clear in our engagement and we expect others to do the same. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. What are the implications for the operation of the Torres, Torres Strait Treaty, especially the treaty's provisions relating to fishing activities li likely to arise from a large Chinese maritime facility at Daru, including the potential operation of Chinese-controlled fishing vessels under the PNG flag in the Torres Strait, given that the Chinese fishing fleets are well, have a well-known tendency for over-exploitation of marine resources? How will Australia protect the marine ecosystem of the Torres Strait from their depredations? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. I think that is a good question, and there will be more work to do on this matter, clearly, as uh, we uh, seek to understand more in relation to the uh, details of the memorandum of, uh, of understanding between uh, those organisations and uh, the Papua New Guinea government. Uh, but I would um, advise the Chamber that the Australian Border Force has an ongoing presence in the Torres Strait, has a very close working relationship with law enforcement agencies and with our Papua New Guinea counterparts. Commercial scale fisheries, Mr. President, would not be considered a traditional activity under the Torres Strait Treaty and would not be permitted. Uh, only residents of the protected zone are able to undertake such activities, uh, which is intended to protect the air, the sea, the land of the Torres Strait, uh, including the native plant and animal life, including the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna, the CITES, such as dugong and turtles. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given Australia's status as PNG's top aid donor, with $596 million in assistance in 2020-2021, and our close bilateral ties, including our support for PNG's response to the COVID-19 crisis, will the Australian government press PNG to be mindful of our national security concerns in relation to China? Will the government propose to PNG any specific alternatives to replace the proposed fishing vessel projects at Daru? 
Senator Payne. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. There's a number of issues in, in Senator Patrick's question, but the first thing I would, re would reiterate is the closeness of the Australia-Papua New Guinea partnership, manifested uh, literally in uh, August uh, of this year by the signing of a comprehensive strategic and economic partnership. That shows, that says, that we have the closest of relationships at the political and operational level. Uh, as I said, there's a number of aspects to, uh, to Senator Patrick's question, but one thing I would like to draw the attention of the chamber to is is the work that we are particularly doing in Western Province, uh, for example, to address their health and uh, development challenges, including through our investment in the Mabatawan Health Centre in, and in food and in water security. We will continue to support Papua New Guinea's uh, recovery, both in health and economic terms, from COVID-19. We have a number of programs in relation to water, in relation to food security uh, and in relation to sanitation, which are very important to the recovery and the continue, strong continuation of the region. And we will work Order. closely with our Senator partners Payne. on this. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Could the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government has kept Australians in jobs and supported Australian businesses through the unprecedented labour market challenges of 2020? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Van for his question. And Mr. President, as 2020 uh, draws to a close, I would just like to thank all of the small and family businesses out there. Uh, the almost 3.5 million of them that employ almost 6 million Australians each and every day for everything that they have done uh, in what has been an incredibly challenging year for them, a year like no other, uh, but more than that, a year that they could never have predicted. Uh, this year, as we all know, Australia and Australians they have been tested like never before. Lives and livelihoods have been lost, and many Australians, including those small and family businesses, through no fault of their own, through no fault of their own, they are doing it tough. COVID-19 has, without a doubt, had a devastating impact on the Australian economy. But when we look, when we look at where we were before COVID-19 hit, we've actually ended COVID-19, and in particular when you look at the labour market, from a position of economic strength. And again, that is because of the hard work and dedication of our family businesses, our small businesses out there. In February 2020, Australia had a record number of people in employment. 13 million Australians were in employment. This included a record number of women in employment. It included a record number of Australians in full-time work, and it included more than 1.9 million youth in employment. When we came to office in 2013, we said that we would be a job-creating government. We would put in place the economic framework that would allow businesses to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. And since we were elected to office, we have now overseen the creation of 1.5 million jobs and, Mr President, full-time employment has accounted for around 57 per cent of total jobs growth over that period. But we acknowledge governments don't create jobs. We put in place a policy framework. And to all of those businesses out there, small and family in particular, we Order. say Senator thank Senator Cash. You. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how has the Morrison government delivered record economic support to help Australians through this unprecedented crisis and to stay connected to jobs? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as you know, to protect the health of Australians, tough decisions had to be made by the government. Uh, and part of those decisions were to close down parts of our economy. And what did that mean? It meant that businesses, through no fault of their own, had to close their doors. And as a result, uh, many jobs across Australia were lost. But what we did as a government was that we moved quickly and we moved decisively to put in place record economic support to support the economy and households to get through COVID-19. Uh, and as the leader of the government has already stated today, this included JobKeeper, JobSeeker, the cash flow boost, the SME guarantee scheme uh, and early withdrawal of superannuation. We put in place a suite of policies uh, that businesses and Australians uh, were able to look at to see what suited them. As a result of these measures, Mr President, we have now seen 648,500 jobs return in the last five months. And again, we thank those businesses out there who are doing the right thing by Australians Order, and Cash. giving them a job. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you. As the world looks forward to a 2021, 
Is the minister aware of any signs of recovery from the setbacks of the coronavirus, and what is the government doing to support this comeback? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, in terms of the policies that we put in place, what they have done is ensure that businesses have been able to reopen their doors and, in many cases, keep them open, but also get Australians back into jobs. So when we look at the national effective unemployment rate, it has fallen to 7.4% from 14.9 per cent. Almost 75 per cent of those who had lost their jobs as a result of COVID-19 are, are back at work. And certainly there are encouragingly signs of recovery. The OECD they have upgraded Australia's economic growth outlook by 0.3 per cent, confirming our economic recovery is underway. The OECD has also emphasised the Morrison government's economic response to the COVID-19 pandemic and specifically pointing to JobKeeper, personal income tax and the job maker hiring credit have all assisted in getting us to where we are today. But again, Mr President, it is those small and family businesses out there, uh, the backbone Order. of the Senator Australian Cash, community. Time for the answer has expired. Thank Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. Or, sorry, representing the Foreign Minister. Sorry, this question has been incorrect. I apologise. This question has been uh, has a typo in it, and I apologise to the minister. My question is to the minister, to the Foreign Minister, Senator Payne. I apologise to the minister. Thank you. How many Australians are stranded overseas? and registered with the Department of Foreign Offence and Trade as wanting to return home. Senator, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Keenly, for her question. Uh, around 39,000 people overseas are registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and wish to return to Australia. Mr President, over 430,000 Australians have returned from overseas since the government recommended that Australians consider the, reconsider the need to travel overseas. Since March, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has supported over 32,700 Australians to return on over 500 flights. That includes over 11,200 people on 77 government-facilitated flights since March. A further 118 passengers landed in Hobart on Sunday from Delhi on a DFAT facilitated flight with Qantas. Since the 23rd of October, DFAT has facilitated 13 flights with 1,847 passengers. Those numbers are, of course, constrained Mr. President, by the capacity of quarantine availability in Australia uh, through the caps applied by the states and territories and agreed by the National Cabinet. Further facilitated flights with Qantas are planned for Frankfurt, Chennai, Paris, London and Delhi. Since the 18th of September, when the Prime Minister spoke about uh, these matters, Mr. President, after National Cabinet, over 45,400 Australians have returned to Australia. That includes more than 17,500 Australians registered at that time with DFAT, and of these, Mr. President, over 3,800 were vulnerable. We continue to help those, Mr. President, who are vulnerable through our hardship uh, provisions, and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has distributed uh, significant funds uh, to a number of those Australians. Mr. President, the Consular Division of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and our consul consular officers around the world are literally working with no exaggeration, no hyperbole, 24 hours, seven days a week to assist as many Australians as possible to return. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How many of those currently stranded, of the 39,000 who are currently stranded, were registered with the DFAT on the 18th of September when Mr. Morrison promised to have them home by Christmas? Senator Payne. Um, Mr. President, I don't have the numbers broken down in that construct that Senator Keneally has asked about. Uh, as I said, since the 18th of September, over 45,400 Australians have returned to Australia. That includes more than 17,500 Australians registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, the process of supporting passengers, uh, supporting Australians, Mr. President, and organising flights means that in the last four weeks alone, we've made more than 30,000 offers of places on flights to Australians registered overseas. That's resulted in around 3,000 people 
taking up nearly all the seats available to us on relevant flights. There are Australians who are not able to accept flights that are being offered to them. There are Australians who uh, indicate they have multiple ties to the country they are in who are not able to depart immediately. Some airlines are being allocated additional Order. capacity specifically Senator Payne, for vulnerable time Australians. For the answer has expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. The minister has previously advised the Senate that 26,000 Australians were registered with DFAT on the 18th of September. If 17,000 have come home, that would suggest some 9,000 are still stranded on the day, Mr. Uh, the Prime Minister made that promise. So, given today is the 10th of December, the last day for stranded Australians to land in Australia, quarantine for two weeks, and spend Christmas at home, what does the Minister have to say to those 9,000 stranded Australians who will be stranded overseas for Christmas as a result of Mr. Morrison's broken promise? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I absolutely reject Senator Keneally's characterisation uh, in, uh, in her question uh, then. Since the 18th of September, Mr. President, over 45,400 Australians have returned to Australia, including more than 17,500 Australians registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And, Mr. President, today, tomorrow, and every day between now and the end of this year, and frankly into next year, we will continue to, in, to support Australians to take flights, particularly vulnerable Australians who we have supported on, on uh, facilitated flights. I indicated there are further flights planned for Frankfurt, Chennai, Paris, London and Delhi. Mr President, there is no denying that this is a very, very difficult situation, not just for Australians here, but internationally. And the government Order. absolutely recognises that, Mr President. The Senator, government absolutely recognises it is difficult for families, it is Order. difficult for Senator individuals. Payne, time for but the answer has working. expired. Order. Senator Wong, Senator Keneally, Senator Payne, time has expired. Before I come to you, Senator McKenzie, it has been drawn. Order. It's been drawn to my attention that we're joined today in my gallery by the family of the late former Senator Susan Ryan. And I know travel restrictions prevented many family members coming to a number of our condolence motions. So to Justine, Ben and Kate, welcome to the Senate. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. The increasing trade tensions with China are escalating the concern of Australian farmers and export-focused businesses and highlighting the need for Australia to secure our sovereignty and diversify our trading markets. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government have been growing our export opportunities for Australian businesses to drive the comeback from COVID-19? Order. Order. We're nearly there. The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thank, th thank you, Mr President. And, uh, and just on indulgence, can I again acknowledge uh, with the, the late Susan Ryan's family in the gallery the, uh, the enormous contribution that she made in a groundbreaking way to this nation. Mr President, can I thank Senator McKenzie for her question. There is no stronger advocate for so many of Australia's exporting industries than Senator McKenzie. Uh, and indeed, I know full well how strongly she and all members on our side have championed the interests of our export industries in recent years. And in recent years, our government has succeeded in bringing into force more trade agreements that provide more opportunities for new markets than any other government in Australian history. The Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership included new free trade agreements with markets of Canada and Mexico, and in doing so eliminated more than 98 per cent of tariffs across them. The Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement sees this year over 99 per cent of Australian goods exported by value entering duty-free or under significantly improved preferential access, a long sought-after agreement with Indonesia that we have secured and delivered. The Hong Kong Agreement guarantees all Australian goods enter duty-free. The Peru Agreement eliminates more than 99 per cent of tariffs by 2024. PACER Plus, I am pleased to say, Mr President, will enter into force this Sunday and will support our Pacific neighbours, particularly in their economic recovery from COVID-19. And these, of course, come on top of the trade agreements negotiated earlier in the life of our government with the three large North, North Asian countries of China, Korea and Japan. On Tuesday this week, we brought into force our world-leading digital economy agreement with Singapore, which improves regional digital trading conditions and makes it easier for exporters to do business. 
Meanwhile, Mr. President, we have implemented some 26 of the actions under the 15-year India economic strategy uh, of our government, delivering opportunities in that market and in so many others for Australian Order, businesses Senator to Birmingham. grow. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please outline what action Australia has either considered or is pursuing through the World Trade Organisation to stand up for Australian primary producers following the imposition by China of prohibitive tariff increases on Australian wine and barley? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Indeed, I have expressed, as has our government, our deep dissatisfaction and concern with the actions of China in a number of areas disrupting trade uh, by Australian exporters into that market. We have, as a government, uh, used and stood by the rules-based international trading system uh, of, based around the World Trade Organisation. We have done so, Mr. President, by initiating a dispute uh, with our friends in India on concerns about sugar subsidies. We indeed initiated a dispute with our friends in Canada in relation to wine subsidies. In that matter, we settled the arrangements with Canada on those wine issues following dialogue and discussion. And I emphasise, Mr President, that just because you get to the point of initiating a WTO dispute doesn't take dialogue off the table. The opportunity will always remain to do so, and whilst we consult and consider initiating such action against China in relation to Bali, we also would wish the Chinese government to come to the table and be willing, as Australia is, to Order. have that Senator dialogue Birmingham. and resolve these Time disagreements. For the expired. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline what the Liberal and Nationals government is doing to create further export opportunities for Australian farmers and businesses? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, whilst having achieved many new market opportunities for Australian farmers and businesses, we have been relentless in seeking to create even more. During our time, we have grown the amount of Australian trade covered by preferential terms from some 26 per cent up to 70 per cent. Recently, we signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, providing more common rules of origin across the nations of our region, which will make it easier for both goods exporters as well as new opportunities for services exports across the region. We are actively continuing to negotiate with the United Kingdom and the European Union to secure trade agreements with those entities and economies, as well as with the Pacific Alliance countries of Colombia, Mexico, Peru and Chile. We are also re-engaging with India as part of our comprehensive strategic partnership arrangements with India on a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement, also building on a new economic cooperation program with Vietnam and our strategies to Order. pursue opportunities Senator with Birmingham. the market of Indonesia. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. What is the lowest hourly rate a young frontline supermarket worker could be paid under the Morrison government's industrial relations changes? And can the minister guarantee no young worker will be worse off as a result of the Morrison government's industrial relations changes? Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I don't have access with me to every award available to uh, workers in Australia, Mr. President. So, Order. Uh, I I will, have to, I will have to take on notice the award rates for uh, young people working in supermarkets, uh, Mr. President. Uh, but, Mr. President, the reforms Order. that we are seeking to bring in as a part of our industrial relations reform are about making everybody better off, Mr. President. About uh, business being better off about employees being better off and, of course, creating jobs so that the economy is better off, Mr President. So that is the focus of the legislation that we are bringing Correct. forward, Mr President, and, and that is why we work uh, every day uh, to, re to ensure that the, eco the, re the economy can recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have some, I think, quite sensible suggestions to put forward as a part of this package, Mr President. And as the, the Leader has said today in the Senate, uh, over 170 hours of consultation between the government and the unions with respect to developing a package of reforms, sensible industrial relations reforms, that can be presented to this country in the interests of all Australians, whether that be younger Australians, older Australians, whether that be uh, business and the economy more broadly, Mr President. 
We need to have the flexibility in the economy, in the, in the system, to be able to create new jobs, for industry to create new jobs, uh, and to employ young Australians and old Australians alike, Mr. President. That is the focus of the reforms that we are bringing forward, Mr. President. Uh, we want everybody to be better off. We want young Australians at work to be better off. We want older Australians at work to be better off. We want business to be better off. And we clearly, Mr. President, would like to see the, co the economy better off. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary uh, thank question. Thank you, Mr. President. I note the minister won't guarantee that young workers will not be worse off. Can the minister guarantee a 61-year-old frontline aged care worker will not be worse off under the Morrison government's proposed industrial relations changes? And can the minister guarantee no older worker will be worse off as a result of the Morrison government's industrial relations changes? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And can I say the claims that have been made by the opposition with respect to aged care workers in the last couple of days, uh, the suggestion that they will uh, have a wage cut by Christmas is an absolute disgrace, yeah. given the hard work that aged care workers in particular have undertaken over the last 12 months. The suggestion that aged care workers are going to get a cut in their salaries by Christmas, Mr. President, is an absolute disgrace, Mr. President. Order, Senator. Order, Senator Wong is on her feet on my left. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, the word disgrace coming out of this minister's mouth is order. interesting. But my, my point, point of order, order is point direct order. relevance. My point of order is direct relevance. He is asked a question about whether or not older workers will be worse off as a result of this government's changes. I ask him to return to that point. Um, I think while the people who ask the question may like, not like the terms in which it is answered, he is addressing the point raised in it, and there's an opportunity, I think, today after question time to debate it. So I'll call the minister to continue. He was being directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Order. Mr. President, the, the suggestion, the suggestion, Mr. Order, President, Senator that Wong. aged care workers are going to get a, uh, a wage cut for, for Christmas is wrong. Is wrong, Mr. President. It will not happen, and it's a disgrace, Mr. President, that the order, Labor Party has suggested. Senator Colbeck, um, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order. It is the Morrison's government industrial relations changes about which Senator we are Wong. asking. I'm asking okay. him to return to that point, Mr. President. Oh, that was part of the question. I, I think, with respect, Senator Wong, I've allowed you to emphasise it. Um, he, is, he is talking about what I would consider to be the policy currently before the other place that is the subject of the question. There's 16 seconds remaining. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, and, and coming from this party, who at the last election specifically ruled out an increase in wages order, for aged care workers, order, Mr. President. Senator, uh, what I will say is. A phrase in response to a pointed question can still not. Um, I'll, I'll hear your submission, Senator, Senator Wong. Yep. Mr. President, how can what this party may or may not have done prior to the last election possibly be directly relevant under the standing orders to a question which goes to the effect of this government's proposed industrial relations changes? If you say it's order. not going to happen, guarantee Senator it. Senator Wong, Senator Birmingham. President, on the point of order, and I've, I've almost lost count of the number of points of order that Senator Wong has chosen to take in interrupting Senator Colbeck. But on the on the point of order, Senator Colbeck, in responding to this question, has spoken very clearly about aged care workers, the wages of aged care workers, the wage arrangements for aged care workers, and the points, the repetitive points of order from those opposite, now seeking to take one sentence out of a two-minute answer that has overwhelmingly been directly relevant. It's simply an abuse of the procedures and the standing orders. On the point of order, I order. On the point of order, I have ruled previously a glancing phrase in an answer is not going to make someone not directly relevant. An answer that consisted of attacking the opposition or outlining their policy would not be directly relevant. That said, I do grant some latitude to the Leader of the Opposition in making points of order, and I think I do need to allow the Minister, when points of order are made and partial quest parts of the questions are restated, um, the Minister can use a glancing phrase in response to that. He did, at the end of that, in my view, turn back to the answer because he was then talking about the wages of these particular workers. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and, and the intention 
of the reforms that are being proposed, Mr. President, as I've said before, are to make Order, people better. Senator off. Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Order, Senator Gallagher is on her feet. Senator O'Neill. Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Given the minister has demonstrated a failure to answer simple questions across your portfolio areas, will this be his last time, question time as a minister in this place? Senator Colbeck. Order. Order on my left. Thank you, thank you Mr. Order. President. Can I, can I say? Uh, uh, I look forward to continuing to do my work within this portfolio. I know that all of us, all of us on the front bench, Mr. President, all of us on the front bench serve at the pleasure of the Prime Minister, and I respect that enormously, Mr. President. I look Order. forward to continuing to do my work. But one thing I do know, Mr. President, and one thing that gives me great satisfaction: whatever happens in the reshuffle, whatever happens in the reshuffle when it comes, that lot will still be on the other side. Order. Order, Senator Davey. Thank you, well, Mr. Senator President. Davey's on her feet. And Order. I'm... On my right, on this occasion, Senator Davey. That was a, that was a good response, though. Um, my, que <laughs> my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Minister, could you please outline how the Liberals and the Nationals in government are supporting our agricultural sector through the recent natural disasters, bushfire, drought and now COVID and the COVID recession? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator Davey for, for her question and also her long-standing interest in all things agriculture. Well, the Australian agricultural industry has a proud history of overcoming adversity, um, and I think you know if you look at strength in the face of adversity, you don't have to look much further than uh, the subject of Senator Mackenzie's uh, recently launched book, Blackjack McEwen, uh, which was launched today. Um, and you know, like previous governments, previous Conservative governments, the Morrison government will continue to back our agricultural sector. Um, we'll back them through droughts, we'll back them through floods, we'll back them through bushfires, and this year we have backed them through the coronavirus pandemic by committing to them drought support, ten billion dollars. Senator Wish Wilson on a point of order. Of order about the prop on Senator McKenzie. Oh, actually, desk. I didn't see that. If, if, if senators want to read Senator, a good book, I'd recommend Senator, Senator McKenzie's book, um, A Secret Australia. Order. A Secret Sit Australia. Down, by Senator everyone. We've nearly made it. Just everyone bite their tongues for four more minutes. Senator McKenzie, I am going to ask you to. Um, reading material of that matter would not be in order in the chamber anyway, I understand. So um, I, I think it probably needs to be placed in your drawer or a folder. Senator Rustin. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. President. Um, and, and as I was saying, um, the, the Conservative governments um, over the years have been, had a very proud relationship with our agricultural sector, um, and this government is no exception. And we will stand side by side with our farming sector um, through tough times uh, to make sure that we continue to roll out programs uh, that will support the huge contribution that the Australian yeah. agricultural yeah. sector makes to our economy. Yeah. Um, just as an example, you know, through the coronavirus pandemic, the government announced a $328 million busting congestion for agricultural exporters package to grow our food and fibre exports. Um, from day one of the pandemic, the, ga the government recognised the pivotal role that agriculture would play and particularly the pivotal role that agriculture will play in the economic recovery. Um, we've made sure not just to look after the agricultural sector itself, but to make sure that we're, our supply chains remain open and safe, making sure that our access to the rest of the world remains in place. By, for instance, addressing the air freight shortages and the disrupted supply chains overseas through the international freight assistance mechanism put in place by Senator Birmingham. We stand side by side Order, with our Senator farmers. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. And um, as you've described, the past 12 months have been incredibly challenging. Can you please tell the chamber how our agricultural industry has performed in the last 12 months, despite the challenges they've faced? Senator Rustin. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and, and once again, um, thank you, Senator Davey, for uh, the opportunity to be able to, to say what a great industry Australian agriculture is, and to acknowledge the fact that, despite the headwinds that this industry has been experiencing over recent times, um, it remains an industry with a great ability to thrive under adversity. Um, in fact, on Monday, the Australian Bureau of Agricultural Resource Economics revised its outlook for agricultural output in 2021. Um, the gross value of agricultural production is forecast to rise by 7 per cent to $65 billion uh, this year. And given we've had droughts, given we've had fires, given we've had the coronavirus pandemic, this is an outstanding result, and it is an absolute testament to the resilience of our Australian agricultural sector. And this government, the Morrison government, will stand side by side our farmers to make sure we work with them to achieve $100 billion worth Order, of agriculture. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Finally, Minister, as we head into the busy Christmas holiday season, and I wish all of my farmers in harvest at the moment a happy harvest, how can we Australians continue to support our farmers and our regional communities? Senator Rustin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much much, Mr President. Um, well, as we all know in this place, there will be no argument from anybody in this place. Australia produces the best food and fibre in the world, and that's why our food and fibre commands the premium prices that it does. It's not only clean and green, it's sustainably grown and it's produced ethically. So this festive season, I'd urge everybody in this place and everybody watching, because I'm sure the whole of Australia is watching Question Time today, to buy local. And if you can, have a look. Make sure that that little green and gold icon that says Made in Australia is at the forefront of your mind when you're purchasing your Christmas presents or your food to share with loved ones over Christmas. Could be apricots from my hometown in the Riverland. Um, you know, it could be mangoes from the Northern Territory that you want to make to put on the top of the pav. Or in the case of, uh, of, uh, of our colleague from the Northern Territory, maybe make a mango daiquiri out of it. Prawns from Cost Harbour, Morton Bay bugs. There are so many amazing Australian products that you could be putting on the table this Christmas. Order. Urge you to Time buy Australian. For the... uh, oh, Senator, no. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. Hey. My question. My question is to Order. the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Order Senator Colbeck. On my left. Senator Polly. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians. This year, 2,000 aged care residents contracted COVID-19, and tragedy struck 685 people who died under this minister's watch in residential care. Why has the minister not resigned? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, actually, Senator Polly is not correct with the number of people who have died uh, as a result of COVID attack to, to uh, aged care. It's uh, 693. Um, there are eight who have been receiving home care packages that um, have, uh, have also tragically passed away, Mr. President. And, and to each one of those 693 families and, uh, and their communities, uh, I extend my sincerest condolences and the condolences of the government. It's a tragedy that we've had to suffer, the pandemic that we have this year, Mr. President. Uh, and I think as we come to Christmas, it is uh, a pertinent thing for us to do just to reflect on the year that we've had, uh, to reflect on the tragedy that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought upon us, upon us all, uh, and again to extend our condolences, our sincere condolences to all of those families who uh, have suffered a death because of the uh, effects of the pandemic, Mr. President. Uh, as I said when I was asked uh, about my position earlier, I will continue uh, to work at the pleasure of the Prime Minister. Uh, I acknowledge with respect to uh, my portfolio responsibilities, so I take my role in this place and in my portfolio extremely seriously. Uh, we are in the middle of a uh, very significant reform process. I look forward to the final report of the Royal Commission, which is due on the 26th of February, uh, and I continue to work uh, with my department and my colleagues on the reforms that we will bring to this place off the back of the Royal Commission report, Mr. President. Uh, so I continue to apply myself to the role 
uh, which is the responsibility that the Prime Minister has given me, uh, and I will continue to do that, uh, Mr. President, uh, for, hopefully uh, through uh, the process that will go through uh, with the reshuffle, Mr. President. Senator uh, Polly, a supplementary question. In the Morrison government's broken aged care system, we heard shocking stories of ants crawling from wounds and older Australians not dying of COVID-19, but of neglect. Is the minister confident he will remain in the portfolio at the end of this month? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, my role in the, I, I take my position in this extremely seriously, and quite frankly, none of this that we're dealing with is about me. Uh, the, 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 thing that's in my, the thing that is in my focus, Mr. President, the thing that is in my focus is that 1.2 million Australians who are receiving care whether that be CHSP, home care, uh, veterans care or uh, residential aged care, uh, as a part of the service delivery provided by aged care providers around the country. It, they are my focus. This is not about me. This is not about me. Uh, and, and I will continue to have and place my focus on all of those Australians who are receiving care. That is my responsibility. Uh, and I will continue to do that assiduously while ever I hold this role. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. Under this minister's watch, there was no dedicated plan for COVID-19 in aged care. Tens of thousands were attacked and assaulted in his broken aged care system. Ants crawled from wounds. 693 older Australians in residential aged care died. And as a result, the Senate censured this minister. Will this be your last appearance in question time as Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians? Because it should be. Order. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, thank you Mr. President. Mr. Mr. President, uh, this government has never pretended. This government has never pretended that everything was all well with the Order. aged care system, Mr. President. Because it, it was this government, Mr. President, it was this Senator government that called the Royal Commission into aged care, Mr. President. It was this government. Senator Green. And Mr. Mr. President, the report, the, the, the interim report of the Aged Care Royal Commission reflected on over 20 years across a number of governments of both political persuasions about the impact and, and the progression of the aged care sector, Mr. President. So it was this government that took the responsibility to call the Royal Commission. And, 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 and it is this government that will respond to it, Mr. President. But this opposition, Mr. President, has at every opportunity failed to act, including in the in the budget and reply, where not a single cent or home care package was allocated. And, Mr. President, as I said before, whatever happens at the at the reshuffle, this lot will still Order, be on the other side. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. And, uh, and as uh, so many books were waved around during question time, I'm very excited to, uh, to be able to table um, for the Senate uh, the ACCC's report into the Perishable Agricultural Goods Inquiry, which I'm sure Thank will you. be a thrilling read for um, all. Senators, could I, I also would like to order, I'd just like to table a determination made by the Speaker and myself made under the Parliamentary Service Act 1999 relating to the appointment of the Secretary of the Department of Parliamentary Services. Are there any motions to take note of answers? We've got the list today. Um, Senator Watt, I don't believe your microphone is on. I don't need it. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. How many times this year have we heard the phrase, we're all in this together? Over the last few months, we've heard that countless times from the Prime Minister and every one of the members of his team, that no matter what walk of life we were in through COVID-19 and through the recovery, we were told that we were all in this together. And what that's meant when it has been applied honestly by this government, is that we have looked out for each other, that all of us are thankful to the essential workers who've kept us safe, who've kept us healthy, who's kept us fed. 
the retail workers, the truckies who have been delivering goods for supermarkets, the health workers, the cleaners, the aged care workers, the childcare workers, the people who have actually kept this country moving and functioning over the last few months. We have all supported them as they have supported us, and that is why Australia has done comparatively well compared to the rest of the world. So it is really quite tragic that, as we end this year, we see how this Prime Minister repays those essential workers with a Christmas pay cut. What a way to thank those essential workers who have kept us safe, who have kept us fed, who have kept us healthy, to end the year by saying to them that, as we turn the page into the new year and as we supposedly recover from this worst recession we have seen since the Great Depression, that what they have to look forward to in the next year is a pay cut and no change whatsoever to the other problems they face in the workplace, such as the rampant casualisation we have seen under this government. And we knew this was true because yesterday we saw this government revert to its true colours. And it was very interesting watching Question Time today because I often notice how glum, dejected, not interested uh, the backbench of this government look uh, through question time. But today they were more animated than ever when we started talking about cutting workers' pay, because that is the thing to which Liberal and national politicians are magnetically drawn. That is the thing that so many people on the government side of this chamber got elected to office to do was to smash unions, cut workers' pay, remove conditions under the guise of some bizarre neoliberal economic mumbo jumbo that says that you increase demand in the economy by giving people less money to spend. That is the economic philosophy of this government. We see it over and over again by them deciding to withdraw JobKeeper payments and reduce JobKeeper payments, by reducing JobSeeker payments, by doing all sorts of other things to take money out of the economy at a time when we need to be stimulating it. And they've got even more in store for the average worker next year when they say that they will be able to be paid less and have other conditions taken away from them. They'll be able to have penalty rates taken off them. They'll be able to be forced to work more hours without overtime. That is obviously terrible for those workers that they have money taken out of their pockets, but it's also terrible for the economy because we know that what we need right now to get this economy functioning better uh, and creating more jobs is more money in more people's pockets. But what this will do is take money out of the pockets of average working families and put it into businesses instead. That's not going to help any of those families, and it's certainly not going to help the economy grow next year. Now, we saw the answers from Senator Birmingham yesterday, where he was given repeated opportunities to rule out uh, the proposition that workers will be worse off as a result of these changes. And repeatedly, he refused to take that opportunity. I was actually doing a bit of research today to see what government members have said about the better off overall test in the past. And I noticed that in 2012, when Senator Abetz was the employment minister, uh, before the, before the um, uh, Abbott government was first elected, uh, he talked about the IR changes that they were proposing to bring in. And he said uh, that under an Abbott government, no worker would be worse off. Now, we all know that wasn't true, but we can't even get that kind of a, an admission or a claim out of ministers now, and that's because they know in their hearts that workers will be worse off as a result of these changes. And what's more, for all the reports that we saw this morning that the government was walking away from these reforms, what we know from Question Time today is it's full Thank steam you, ahead. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, um, Acting. Uh, not acting. Sorry. Thank you, Deputy President. Look, this is so typical of Labor, um, and it's really unfair of Labor at this time of year, as we are getting to Christmas, and as people are doing extra hours um, and working hard, and as confidence is finally starting to build again. 
Finally, we are regaining confidence. Labor has to throw the scare tactics out, has to threaten to everyone and say the government's going to cut your pay. The big bad boogeyman of government's going to come out and cut your pay. And there can be nothing further from the truth. Because let me tell you, Acting President, uh, Deputy President, let me tell you, the government does not set pay rates. The government does not set pay rates. And enterprise bargaining is not done by the government. Enterprise bargaining is done by the unions with their employers, and then it is taken to the Independent Fair Work Commission. So this is not the government cutting pay. This is the unions and their employers and their employees sitting down around the table negotiating. And where they determine that a business would be better off addressing recovering from COVID, then they can negotiate an outcome which then is taken to the Independent Fair Work Commission. And then the Independent Fair Work Commission has to run their lens over it. And remember, the Independent Fair Work Commission cannot accept changes that go against the public interest. Now, of course, we don't want to see any more workers lose their jobs. In fact, we want more jobs. We want to create jobs because we are a government that backs jobs. But to back jobs, we have to back the employers that make those jobs. So that's what we're doing here. We have recognised that COVID has had a shocking impact on the economy, and we are putting in place changes that allow employees and employers to negotiate a way out that is adjudicated by an independent body in the Fair Work Commission, just as has been the case always under Labor's Fair Work Act ever since 2009. Any agreements that are approved can only be in place for a maximum of two years. Now That gives businesses time to recover from COVID, make the adjustments that they need to make. So I, I say again, it is absolutely deplorable that Labor claims that people are going to get their pays cut. They are not going to get pay cuts unless they negotiate for a pay cut through their enter enterprise bargaining arrangements. Look, and the other thing that Labor aren't talking about is the security that this creates, what we are doing to address the issues for casual workers. We are providing mechanisms that allow casual workers a pathway to transition into full-time roles. Where is the negative aspects in that? This is a good thing for casuals. Labor's always claiming that casuals are the hard done by people. Well, we are trying to improve things for casual workers. And we're also making sure that we leg legislate what a clear definition of casual is to give casual workers certainty. To give them certainty, which will provide legal certainty over their role so they can't be switched off and on like a light switch. So if they prefer things like annual leave and long service leave rather than getting the higher hourly rate that is given to casual workers, they'll be able to make that transition to a permanent full-time role. So that's a good thing. I, I struggle to see why Labor are so fundamentally against policies that actually deliver on what Labor claims to be standing for. We are the party for jobs. We are the party for business. And we will continue to back employees and employers and get Australians working again, because that is the best way our nation can pull together to recover from the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davies. Um, Senator Polly. <laughs> One thing is for sure, Australian workers have certainty in knowing that this government is a lazy, sloppy government who don't consult, but they always know that when push comes to shove, in their DNA is their attack on workers' rights, their conditions. All they want to see is the big end of town and their business mates to be able to casualise 
more and more of our workforce. That's what they're about, taking away their protection, allowing people to work part-time without any uh, uh, penalty rates uh, that they can rely on. And this is the government's Christmas present to Australian workers. You know, uh, my colleague Senator Watts uh, started his contribution with the phrase, we're all in this together. And that was the mantra that was repeated in the media, in this chamber, in the other place repeatedly during the pandemic. Well, this is no way, no way to repay Australian workers, particularly those who worked on the front line to keep us safe, those who worked in our supermarkets day in, day out to ensure we had our essential services, the supermarket workers, the truck drivers, the delivery drivers, those uh, teachers, those childcare workers, aged care staff, and so many of those are casualised jobs, certainly in retail, supermarket, hospitality. These are the people that this government want to take away their pay cut. That's what these people want to do. It is in their DNA. It's what they resort to time and time again. Now, we have always said we're happy to talk and to have a dialogue between industrial relations reform that's going to give more security to Australian workers. That's what we will do. But there's one thing you can count on from this side of the chamber, and that is we will fight every single day for better pay, better conditions for Australian workers. What you are trying to do now is bring in work choices, mark two, which is what you do whenever you're in trouble. That's what you do because you have no real plan for this economy and for jobs. So what do you go to? The lowest common denominator, attack workers. Attack their pays, attack their penalty rates, keep them casualised, underemployed, because that's what you do best. You ha are, would have to be the most unfair, callous government that this country has seen <coughs> for a very, very long time. And as I said, if you were really concerned, really concerned about people's jobs, why are you cutting JobKeeper? If you're concerned about your government's impact on Australian workers and for those people who are looking for work, for the job seekers out there, you wouldn't be cutting their money either, putting them back into poverty. So don't come into this place trying to rewrite history as you do time and time again. Do something for Australian workers to secure their employment. Australian workers have had a tough year, as has the rest of the community in terms of the pandemic. But even before COVID-19, the economy was not travelling very well. We had massive uh, underemployment in this country. We had high underemployment. And in my home state of Tasmania, the unemployment rate is the highest in the country. And your reforms will do nothing whatsoever for their families and those workers. It's not good for our economy to cut workers' wages. It's bad for our economy. It's bad for Australian workers. It's bad for their families. And we will fight every single day for your industrial reforms, which is going to make life harder for those workers, cause greater casualisation of the workforce, continue the underemployment in this country and put added pressure on, on our families, workers' families in this country. And we will fight your ideology, your, your DNA, your attack on workers each and every day. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President, and what a time to be alive. Never before have we faced the difference between the forces of darkness and the forces of light. And on this side of the chamber, we are the forces of light taking on the force of darkness here. And what will guide our light is evidence. What will guide us to the light is evidence. 
Now, last week I put up a motion that said that all hypotheses and theories must be backed up by recorded evidence. By recorded evidence. And I pushed back on indoctrination, intimidation and shoddy mathematical modelling. And what we have seen today here is absolute indoctrination of lies. Nothing but unfounded lies. So let me shine some light on the truth, because this side of the chamber will always stand up Order. for facts and will never accept the post-fact world that this side of the chamber is trying to lead us to. Order. So let's talk about the facts. If you hop on the Fair Order. Work, if you hop on the Fair Work uh, uh, site, you will see that under the coalition government, uh, take-home <laughs> uh, pay for people working between six o'clock and nine o'clock on weeknights is rising from a 130% penalty rate to a 150% penalty rate. That is a fact. You will see that on Saturdays, penalty rates are increasing from 140% to 150%. That is a fact. And let me go on about some more facts that Labor, Labor and their former leader, uh, the member for Mary Bong, Bill Shorten. Let's talk about what he did. As the, what if, sorry, apologies. Um, uh, as National Secretary of the AWU, Bill Shorten cut penalty rates for some of our lowest paid workers. Under the infamous clean event deal in 2006, he stripped workers of all penalty rates with no compensation. No compensation. And because of the deals done by Bill Shorten's mates, a 24-year-old uni student who started weekend work at McDonald's, a foreign multinational, mind you, would now be about $15,000 worse off. And there's more, Madam Deputy Secretary. When Mr Shorten was National Secretary of the AWU, AWU he struck a deal with Target that paid workers $47.91 a week less, <laughs> or almost $2,500 a year, than the Retail Industry Award. That's right, Madam Deputy President. Ding, ding, ding. Under Labor, people get paid less. People get paid less. But there's more. Uh, we've got Bill Shorten's grubby deal with Chiquita. Uh, in a grubby deal in 2004, 157 mushroom pickers lost their jobs. 120 workers suffered wage reductions, but the AWU and Mr Shorten, the secretary at the time, received $25,000 in secret payments and $4,000 a month in union fees. This grubby deal makes work choices look generous to the downtrodden. For those who will demand a smoking gun to substantiate these claims, be advised that there is an entire armoury con contained in the transcripts and sworn evidence from the Commission on Sep uh, uh, oh, no, no. And then we go to another one. We go uh, uh, a Fairfax media investigation. I mean, Fairfax and no friends of ours has uncovered large payments from joint uh, venture builder T. John Holden to the AWU when Mr. Shorten ran the union. One of Australia's biggest builders paid Bill Shorten's union nearly $300,000 as he after he struck a workplace deal that cut conditions and saved the company as much as $100 million on a major Melbourne road project. And there's more. It's not just uh, Mr Shorten. Morris Blackburn, Morris Blackburn uh, one of the, uh, Australia's leading industrial law firms, couldn't themselves actually pay staff properly. They undercut staff payments by a million dollars. Now, if that doesn't suggest, that doesn't suggest that the industrial relations laws in this country need reform when an industrial relations law firm that I might add Senator Watt and Senator Green work for, nothing to see here, actually underpaid the workers. But it gets worse, Madam Deputy President, because the, uh, voice, uh, the uh, propaganda machine for the Labor Party, the ABC, also uh, underpaid nearly 2,000 staff. Great, great auntie also underpaid 2,000 staff. And let me just wrap this up by saying that this election is not over in the states. 17 states have just sued the other states, and we will see who is leader of the free world come back next year. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Ayres. Well, the problem um, with following Senator Rennick um, is that it sort of um, does derail one trains, one's train of thought, doesn't it? The um, 2020 has been a hard year for many Australians. Uh, and you would think that for the cleaners and nurses and truckies, public transport workers, retail workers,
public servants, people in aged care, that the government would have come to this parliament with an agenda that was about making jobs good jobs, about decent wages and wage growth, about growth in the economy and doing something to give Australian families some confidence in their future. But instead, the Morrison government has done what every Liberal government has done uh, since John Howard and has gone the low road. Their biggest ambition for the economy is to go back to the pre-COVID economy. This time last year—don't forget what the pre-COVID economy was like—this time last year, 1.8 million people underemployed or unemployed. This year, 2.4 million people underemployed or unemployed. Last year, 5.3 per cent unemployment. No great achievement. This year, 7 per cent, heading towards 8 per cent. The investment, share of GDP, the investment share of GDP is at its lowest level since 1959. The profit share of income at its highest level in recorded history. The wage share of income the lowest since 1964. Spending anemic then, catastrophic now. And last year, don't forget that the last thing that the government did in this parliament last year was try and ram the ensuring integrity bill through, and they failed spectacularly. This year, they've got a new industrial relations bill. Different format, different structure, same purpose. They should have a plan for the economy, for jobs, for productivity and growth, but they've got no ambition for the economy, no ambition for the country. It's a backtrack from snapback, but now it's this loaded our comeback that fundamentally only will deliver an advertising-led recovery. It's all about big dollars shamefully and corruptly funnelled to Liberal Party mates in order to deliver future research and future advertising down the track. Now, you'd wonder what else is in store. And it makes me consider the position of people in regional Australia, where there are 28 unemployed people for every job. And what has been the contribution of the National Party, the junior partner in this coalition, the dregs of the squatter class, what remains of the Bunyip aristocracy, what are they contributing to this vision for the country? So disconnected, so disconnected, the only thing they are focused on here is the leadership of the National Party. So disconnected, Mr Littleproud, his contribution this year is to claim that strawberry pickers get paid $3,800 a week on a good day. Well, it would be a very good day. Nothing for regional jobs. Now, I saw Senator Canavan on Sky the other night saying that the cashless debit card should be extended to every Australian on welfare. So disconnected, so remote. So I took the opportunity to have a look at Senator Canavan's Twitter profile, and lo and behold, he's changed his photo. Now, I couldn't adequately describe it for the Senate. Senator so I thought Ayers. I'd bring it in here. Senator Ayres, it's not there appropriate. It is. Senator there Ayers. it is. Thank you. Now that I am reliably informed, I mean more makeup than Ziggy Stardust in this photo. <laughs> he looks like one of the chimney sweeps from Oliver Twist. I am reliably informed that that effect on one's face can only be achieved with the application of Estee Lauder double wear infinite waterproof uh, eyeliner. Senator Ayres, please resume it's your seat. And, and it requires— Senator Ayres, please resume your seat. Senator Dunham. Deputy President, I just a uh, point of order on relevance. I think I understand the take note is on IR. Yes. We seem to be talking about cosmetics. Yes. I'm not quite sure how these things are related. I wonder, Madam Deputy President, if you could draw Senator Ayres back to the matter we're discussing. Well, I, I will inform you, Senator Dunham, uh, Senator Ayres has been mostly relevant. He's got 24 seconds uh, left, and as you say, it is a broad-ranging uh, debate. So uh, we'll see where he goes in the next 24 seconds. But he has mostly uh, he has mostly focused on IR. This bloke, this bloke dresses up as a blue-collar worker, 
Uh, th this former Productivity Commission economist, maybe he's the real thing. Maybe he was born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. <laughs> maybe it's Maybelline. Oh, and, and if any of you, if any of you want to achieve the same effect, don't skimp because you're worth it. Thank you, Senator Ayres. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, yeah. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Rice. Deputy President, um, I move to take note of the answer that Minister Payne gave to me to my question about Julian Assange. And sadly, the answers she gave me were well, they were tragic, really. The fact that Minister, Minister Payne and this government refuses to recognise the desperate situation of Julian Assange and refuses to recognise that that is much more than a consular case. It requires diplomatic and political engagement. I was also just struck and shocked by her callous disregard to the threats to Mr Assange's health due to, due to the risks from COVID. And this on International Human Rights Day. I mean, it is tragic on International Human Rights Day to see the minister refusing to recognise or to defend Julian Assange's human rights, an Australian citizen, and to provide him with the support that he yeah. deserves. So, look, and as I was reflecting on this topic in, topic in preparing my question today and then in responding to the minister, I actually really want to particularly acknowledge an important book that has been published on Julian Assange, A Secret Australia revealed by the WikiLeaks exposés, where 18 different Australians reflect on what Australia has learnt about itself from the work of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. And it's very relevant with the minister's response to my question today. It includes contributions from many people, including from Julian Assange's lawyer, Jennifer Robinson, and she notes in her contribution that the only reason Assange remains in prison is because of the US extradition request and their indictment, which the Freedom of the Press Foundation has described as a terrifying threat to press freedom. His indictment has been unanimously denounced by journalist unions and free speech and human rights organisations, and still Australia takes no action. The Australian government claims it is offering consular assistance. But this unprecedented case requires more. It requires diplomatic and political action, which was exactly the question and the point that I was putting to Minister Payne today. I also I think it is very relevant the contribution in this book from my former colleague, um, former Senator Scott Lud Ludlam. And in his chapter entitled Free Julian Estage, Scott writes, the WikiLeaks publications have taught us two things about how power works in the increasingly uncomfortable West. There is the raw material itself, a meticulously indexed and utterly damning archive of great power, malevolence and manipulation. And then there is the reaction, how our own government has dealt with an inconvenient publisher. It looks different to how they do it in Israel, North Korea and Russia, but the outcome is the same. They have sought to destroy the messenger, not just as punishment, but as a warning to all other messengers. And every authoritarian since the beginning of time has known that repression has a habit of provoking anger and defiance instead. The choice is entirely on us. Fear is a natural reaction when we realise our governments will destroy us without hesitation if it serves their interests. And feeling that, understanding it in the same way that incarcerated refugees understand it, that First Nations peoples understand it, is what can bring us to that moment of defiance and anger. Know then that none of us are alone in this, that the anger is shared and widespread and growing. I mean, this is a rallying cry that rings true to me. And on reflecting on Human Rights Day today and Minister Payne's appalling response to the question of the human rights of Julian Assange, we recognise that there is so much more to be done for human rights here in Australia and internationally. I mean, domestically, on top of our inaction on truth and justice and treaties with our First Nations peoples, is, of course, our incarceration of refugees and asylum seekers, both on and offshore. So we must fight to continue to ensure that in, in Australia all Australians have fundamental human rights and are entitled to the equal protection of the law. And we must passionately and consistently and ceaselessly highlight attacks on human rights wherever they occur 
and affirm our solidarity with people who are working to uphold human rights in the face of authoritarian, authoritarianism and dictatorships. And I really actually want to conclude by mentioning the case of Idris Qatak, who is a prominent human rights defender in Pakistan. It's been more than a year since he was abducted. And it took six months before the Pakistani Ministry of Defence to even acknowledge that they had him in custody. And I want, to, I want to call on the government of Pakistan to ensure that his rights are protected, his safety is guaranteed, and that he be returned to his family as soon as possible. International Human Rights Day is a time to be looking at the human rights of everyone, from people like Julian Assange to people being oppressed right across the world. And it's something that we need to continue. Thank you, Senator Rice. Your time has continue. expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Rice to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I'll just um, draw to the attention of senators in the chamber. We've got three committee reports listed on the notice paper and another three that have just been listed. So it's my intention to go through the three. Uh, let me finish, thanks, Senator Rice. Um, to go through the three, and then whatever we've got left over, we'll put uh, just before we get to 4 p.m. so that they're actually on the notice paper. Senator Rice. Uh, you need leave, so is okay, leave, I take leave to table a non-conforming Is petition. leave granted? It's one I've been talking about in which. <laughs> yes, I believe leave is granted. Thank right. you, Senator. Ryan. Thank you. Um, so we're now at the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. The committee reports the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. Um, Senator McGrath. Oh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Standing <laughs> Committee on Electoral Matters, I present the report of the committee on all aspects of the conduct of the 2019 federal election and matters related thereto, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. We, we are blessed, Madam, Madam Deputy President, that we live in one of the oldest and most successful democracies in the world. Our good fortune has not come through chance. Our democracy works because over a century a lot of people paid and unpaid, have worked to make it through, to make it so, through blood, sweat and tears. Our democracy works because countless Australians have made the ultimate sacrifice to protect the freedoms inherent in democracy. And as society has changed, so should our electoral system be fine-tuned. Now is the time for immediate action by Parliament on certain changes and for a longer conversation about other reforms. To maximise voter choice, compulsory preferential voting should be replaced by optional preferential voting. To increase fairness and to reduce the luck of the ballot draw while minimising the so-called donkey vote, the Robson rotation of candidates on the ballot paper should be introduced in tandem for the House of Representatives. Elections should not only be fair, open and transparent, they should be seen to be so. An important element is the sanctity of the electoral roll and the importance of each citizen equally exercising one vote. Voter identification should be introduced for all voters with savings measures similar to provisional votes. Likewise, all electoral enrolments, whether new or changes, should require proof of identification. The pre-poll voting period should be reduced from three weeks to, two, to a maximum of two weeks. Voters who choose to vote early should be required to explain why they are unable to attend on the day rather than it being a matter of convenience. The Electoral Act should be completely rewritten to make it fit for purpose. A new offence of political violence, both physical and verbal, should be introduced. The rules governing the use of party names should be tightened to restrict the use of existing party names by new political entrants. Parliament should also commence a conversation about whether the House of Representatives should be increased in size, as the last change was in 1984. Part of the dialogue should consider whether the nexus between the Senate and the House of Representatives should be reformed. In addition, Consideration should be given to changing the term of the House of Representatives from three years to four years. Likewise, a discussion on the utility of by-elections is overdue. By-elections could be abolished with the party or group elected at the general election choosing the replacement. 
In a similar vein, an MP who voluntarily resigns from the party under which they were elected at the general election will be deemed to have vacated their seat. We sleep safely in our beds, protected from the claws of the banality of evil because we decide who governs. These reforms are about empowering further the voter. Governments in democracies should always be wary of the voter. Long may it be its so. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Madam <laughs> Deputy President. The Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters in this report has found that GetUp has been not a witness of the truth now for a second time. Paragraph 6.94 of the report tells us the committee notes this is the second occasion that GetUp has misled it. This shameful and willful misleading of a parliamentary committee is serious and strikes at the very heart of how we do our business of democracy and parliamentary inquiries in this country. Moreover, it reflects the complete lack of ethics of this now completely discredited organisation, which acts without a moral compass. At paragraph 6.93, the committee finds that GetUp submission dealing with purported specific findings made by the AEC is misleading and notes that, despite repeated opportunity and invitation, GetUp has failed to correct the record. And so the inescapable conclusion is made at paragraph 6.91 of the report. The committee believes that GetUp submission to this inquiry is misleading, remains misleading, and that GetUp has failed to correct it despite being provided ample opportunity. The findings made against GetUp need to be made as the independent AEC has been egregiously misrepresented by this fringe-dwelling, morally challenged organisation. The modus operandi of GetUp has always been to mislead and misrepresent. For them, the end justifies the means. Having been conceived in deceit, it unabashedly practices deceit. Be it their deceptive vote calculator, be it the misrepresentation of coalition policies, be it misrepresenting the Australian Electoral Commission, or be it encouraging bird dogging and pretending to know nothing about it, or be it giving false evidence under oath, this ugly organisation has a history of distortion and manipulation. Many honest Australians have been unwittingly sucked into GetUp, which has now been exposed as being conceived in dishonesty and pr practising it on an industrial scale. Madam Deputy President, in Boothby and Mayo, female Liberal candidates were stalked and harassed by creeps linked to GetUp. The Boothby stalker worked hand in glove with the GetUp SA Action Network. Despite its declared low control strategy and its promotion of bird dogging, GetUp still refuses to accept responsibility for the inevitable results. Meanwhile, GetUp phone canvassers pretended to empathise with electors about their children's future while peddling poison and misinformation about coalition candidates. So, another election, another dishonest campaign by GetUp, but all predicated on the lie that it is somehow independent. And, Madam Deputy President, let's read from the actual submission made by GetUp to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. And on page three of their submission, this is what they say, black on white, the AEC ruled in GetUp's favour as recently as February this year, specifically finding GetUp campaigns are 100 per cent issues based. No such finding 
specific or otherwise, has been made by the Australian Electoral Commission. Indeed, the Australian Electoral Commissioner, not once but twice, has repudiated that false assertion, and yet GetUp continued with its submission and did not seek to change its evidence until the very, very end. They also claim that the AEC ruled in GetUp's favour, specifically finding GetUp plays an important role on election day. And when Mr Oosting, the CEO of GetUp, was challenged in relation to these assertions, where is the evidence? Where is it? How can you quote the Australian Electoral Commission or Commissioner in saying this? He was unable to provide any shred of evidence, not a single letter in support of that false assertion. But not to be outdone by two untruths, a third one was asserted, that the AEC ruled in GetUp's favour as recently as February this year, specifically finding GetUp is non-partisan. It is not the role of the Australian Electoral Commission to make such a finding. It has not made such a finding in relation to any organisation for a very simple reason. It cannot. It is not empowered to do so, so it would not do so, and the Electoral Commissioner gave unequivocal evidence that that was a falsehood as well. And despite this being brought to GetUp's attention, being in public forums, GetUp pursued and continued with this untruth. And why do they do it? Because by asserting that the Australian Electoral Commission has made these findings, false as that assertion is, they get money in from the unwitting Australian public. And good, decent Australians make not only a financial commitment, but then also a personal commitment to support what they honestly believe to be a good and decent organisation. This report, once and for all, explodes the myth about GetUp. It is now fully exposed as peddling dishonesty, not only in relation to coalition policy, but egregiously misrepresenting the independent Australian Electoral Commission and its commissioner, Mr Rogers. This is very, very serious that any organisation would even think of doing it, let alone actually doing it, and then thinking they can get away with it, is indicative of the thought processes in which the get-up movement engages. These are extremely serious matters, Deputy President. These are matters that show that there is an organisation that has corrupted our political system and our democratic system in Australia. We have seen what GetUp and its supporters did in the electorate of Warringah in relation to the posting of posters uh, about the former member, Mr Abbott. The New South Wales Police need to tell us, given the CCTV footage, as to whether they have pursued the perpetrator, because there is very clear imagery that I would suggest to anybody shows that the perpetrator was one Mr Scott Marsh. Indeed, there are very telltale handprints on his tracksuit trousers. He's been photographed with those handprints on his trousers on a number of occasions, which of course tells us two things. One, he doesn't change his trousers very often, but chances are, more importantly, that he is the graffiti artist. And I would encourage the New South Wales Police to pursue this matter, just as much as they pursued Mr Marsh when he had a Black Lives Matter graffiti uh, uh, presentation with a burning police car. That is what excited the New South Wales Police, as it should have done, just as much as this egregious behaviour in relation to Mr Abbott uh, should have been pursued. And I look forward to the New South Wales Police doing that which they should be doing. Now, Madam Deputy President, how can there be any credible CEO of an organisation that has been exposed 
as misleading a parliamentary committee, not once but twice? How can a board continue to exist presiding over such an operation, knowing it has misled a parliamentary committee not once but twice and has egregiously misrepresented the Australian Electoral Commission and its commissioner? So, Madam Deputy President, today I call for the resignation of the board of GetUp and its CEO for egregiously misrepresenting the Australian Electoral Commission and misleading a parliamentary committee which is a misleading under oath, which in fact is perjury. They should go. Thank you, Senator. And the quicker, Betts, your time the better. has expired. Are you seeking to uh, take it? I will uh, seek to uh, continue my yes, remarks. Yes, thank you. Um, Senator O'Neill, we are going to go to the Privilege Committee report. Thank you, thank you Deputy President. Um, I present the 180th report of the Committee of Privileges entitled Person Referred to in the Senate, Mr Ben Davies. I move the report, that the report be adopted. This report forms part of a series of reports recommending that a right of reply be afforded to persons who claim to have been adversely affected by being referred to in the Senate either by name or in such a way as to be readily identified. On 13 November 2020, the President received a submission from Mr Ben Davies related to a question asked by Senator McAllister in the Senate on 12 November 2020. The President referred the submission to the Committee under Privilege Resolution 5. The Committee considered the submission at its meeting today and recommends the proposed response be incorporated in Hansard. I, uh, 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 the committee reminds the Senate that in matters of this nature it does not judge the truth or otherwise of statements made by honourable senators or the persons referred to. Rather, it ensures that these persons' submissions and ultimately the response it recommends accord with the criteria set out in Privilege Resolution 5. I commend the motion to the Senate. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Senator Urquhart. Are you saying... Oh, well, um, the... Yes. Well, I can't take all this until that. To adopt the report. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator O'Neill to adopt the report. Be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Yes, I'm putting the report, Senator Abetz. Just a moment. Um, those against? The ayes have it. Senator Abetz. All right. We now speak after it's actually put. That's fine, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, uh, this just a moment, Senator Abet. You now need to uh, Abet. Sorry, you now need to uh, move to take note. I move to take note of the report, Madam Deputy President. This is a very uh, serious matter where somebody was uh, maligned in this place. I'm willing to believe that it may well have been accidentally by uh, the Labor senator, but this is a process that does allow uh, people to have their reputation restored. And uh, Being the deputy chair of the Privileges Committee, I just wanted to uh, agree uh, with the report and uh, thank the committee for its uh, bipartisan, yeah. tripartisan, in fact, uh, uh, work that it does for the betterment of this place and its processes. Thank you, Senator Abetz. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability and Insurance Scheme, I present two reports as listed on item 14 of today's order of business, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. So uh, we will now do public accounts and audit. Senator Davey. On behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Order, I present the 485th report of the committee, Cyber Resilience, Inquiry into the Auditor-General's Reports 1 and 13 of 2019 to 2020. So we've just got a government response. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I present the government's response to the report of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee on its inquiry into the current requirement for labelling of seafood and seafood products and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Uh, thank you. And I believe Senator Davey has another one. Sorry. Uh, on behalf of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee, I present the interim report of the Committee on Australia's General Aviation Industry. Thank you. I think we have done the report, so I'll just double check with the clerk. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. So we've done those reports. Thank you. I call the clerk. 
Government Business Orders of the Day, Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment, Extension of Coronavirus Support Bill 2020, Second Reading Debate and the Amendment Moved by Senator Pratt. Minister. President, I draw to your attention the state of the chamber. Or... Uh, yes, I believe the quorum is required. Bring the bell. Yeah, I can't. So we now have quorum. So I believe Senator Askew is seeking the call. Is she? Yeah, Senator Askew. Both to speak on the social service and other legislation amendment, extension of coronavirus support bill 2020. As chair of the Senate Standing Legislation Committee on Community Affairs, I am pleased to make a contribution to this bill. This bill was introduced in the House of Representatives on the 12th of November this year. It was referred to the Senate Community Affairs Legislation Committee that day, with the committee delivering its report on the 27th of November. The impact of the global coronavirus pandemic that affected us so greatly this year continues to be felt by Australians. Australia's highly targeted income support system is designed to support those who are unable to support themselves through work, savings or other means. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, the Australian Government has assisted individuals, families, communities and businesses through the introduction of a wide range of temporary support measures. The Australian Government is committed to supporting those impacted by COVID-19 through providing financial assistance to people who have lost their job or who have reduced income. To this end, we are extending the temporary coronavirus supplement for an additional three months until the end of March 2021. This temporary continuation of coronavirus support, the support measures includes the extension of the coronavirus supplement for an additional three months at a rate of $150 per fortnight, extending changes to the personal income test for recipients of job seeker payment and youth allowance to allow earnings of up to $300 per fortnight, extending changes to the partner income test for job seeker payment, extending expanded eligibility criteria for job seeker payment and youth allowance to allow sole traders, self-employed and permanent employees who have been stood down by their employers or people who have been directed to self-isolate to continue to be eligible for payment. Extending waiting period waiver, seasonal work preclusion period and newly arrived residents waiting period. Extending the period income support recipients can maintain eligibility for payment and retain their concession card while receiving no payments due to employment income until the 16th of April 2021. Yep. Yep. 
and extending other minor policy changes such as pension portability arrangements under the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Omnibus Act 2020. This bill also allows the Minister to temporarily modify Social Security law to respond to circumstances relating to the COVID-19 pandemic, such as when changes were applied in March and April to address the high volume of claims made to Services Australia at the height of the economic impact. Without this proposed extension, the Minister's powers to make such changes will be automatically repealed on 31 December 2020. We know the temporary support measures that were introduced earlier this year have been successful in supporting Australians through a time of great economic shock and uncertainty. 80 per cent of the 1.3 million people who lost their job or had hours reduced to zero at the start of this pandemic are now back at work. And over the five months to October, almost 650,000 jobs returned to the labour market. This includes almost 344,000 jobs for women and around 226, 600 jobs for young Australians. The effective unemployment rate has come down from a peak of 14.9% to 7.4%, and the participation rate is at 65.8%, which is approaching the pre-coronavirus level. And October labour force figures show that market conditions have continued to improve, with employment increasing by almost 179,000 over the month. Full-time employment increased by 97,000, or 1.1 1 .1 per cent, which is the largest monthly increase on record. And part-time employment rose by 81,000, or 2 per cent. The number of hours worked also increased by 20.6 million hours in October. These labour force results show us that when coronavirus is contained and businesses have reopened across the country, jobs will return. National Skills Commission data show more businesses are looking to hire new staff now. In April this year, as we were grappling with restrictions imposed to combat coronavirus, less than 5 per cent of businesses expected to increase staff, but now that figure has risen to 24 per cent and 47 per cent of employers are recruiting now, which is up to 25 per cent on June's figures. After large falls between February and May this year, it is great to see gains in employment within accommodation and food services by almost 130,000 jobs, retail trade, which is up by 59,600, and arts and recreation services by 53,000. The NAB Business Survey found business confidence improved significantly in October 2020, rising by nine points to its highest level since May 2019. And the monthly Westpac Melbourne Institute Consumer Sentiment Index rose by 2.5 per cent in November, following an 11.9 per cent increase in October after the release of the federal budget. One of the reasons Australian business owners are confident is because their revenue is starting to increase. The ABS Business Indicator survey showed 24 per cent of businesses reported an increase in monthly revenue in November compared to 16 per cent in October, and 25 per cent of businesses expect their revenue to continue to increase, which is the highest percentage since this pandemic began. The Reserve Bank of Australia has confirmed that Australia's economic recovery is well underway and has upgraded its forecast for Australia's economic growth and for our labour market. As Treasurer Josh Frydenberg pointed out when he spoke about the September quarter of the national accounts on 2 December, Australia's AAA rating has been reaffirmed, with Australia one of only nine countries in the world to have a AAA rating from the three leading credit agencies. In the September quarter, real GDP increased by 3.3 per cent, beating market expectations and making it the largest quarterly increase since 1976. The RBA said the JobKeeper program has saved at least 700,000 jobs and that government support programs helped to boost household savings in the June quarter. The figures speak for themselves. There were 2 million fewer workers and around 450,000 fewer businesses on JobKeeper in October compared to September. And we have seen a drop in the number of people receiving JobSeeker payment in mid-November, there were 1.46 million on job seeker and youth allowance, which is down from 1.57 million at the end of September. This recovery has been supported by the Australian government's record $257 billion investment 
in economic support through JobKeeper, JobSeeker, the cash flow boat boost, the coronavirus supplement, the two $750 payments to millions of pensioners and income support recipients, with more support in the form of two additional $250 payments on the way in the coming months. But we know we have a tough road ahead. We also know that the pandemic continues to provide challenging situations for many in our country, so we wish to extend the temporarily increased safety net for a further three months. The Australian Government is very focused on supporting all Australians as we fight this virus and its impacts so we can open our economy again. The extension of support provided for in this bill will cost $3.2 billion, which builds on the overall response package of $507 billion invested since the crisis began. The 2020-21 federal budget was all about creating jobs led by the $74 billion job maker plan to get people back into work. The Home Builder program has also been extended by a further three months, providing a $15,000 grant to build a new home or substantial rebuild, but also boosting jobs within our construction industry. Jobs will continue to be our focus because a healthy economy supports all Australians. This government is focused on responding to this situation as it unfolds. While the coronavirus pandemic has resulted in a situation that nobody could have expected, we have demonstrated we will continue to monitor the situation and provide appropriate support. But we won't preempt future circumstances. We have always been clear that these enhanced levels of social security support were temporary and targeted. The plan is clear until the end of March 2020 in that we are providing an additional level of support while encouraging and helping people to get back into the workforce. We must strike the right balance between temporary enhanced support and providing incentives to work. The provisions outlined within this bill will further support Australians as we continue to deal with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it builds in additional flexibility to adapt to new circumstances as the country transitions to a post-COVID economy. This bill is part of a broader suite of measures aimed at ensuring Australians are supported to engage with the workforce which in turn supports our economy to recover. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the social services and other legislation amendment, extension of coronavirus support bill 2020. The bill extends the coronavirus supplement from the 1st of January 2021 to the 31st of March 2021 at the reduced rate of $150 per fortnight. This bill will force almost 2 million people to try and live on $51 a day at Christmas time and then back to the unlivable rate of $40 a day in April 2021. There is an abundance of evidence and information out there which shows that this is not an adequate amount to live on and actually entrenches welfare dependency. $40 a day is not enough to cover the basic expenses of food, housing, transportation, health care, let alone if you get sick, need to buy medication, go to the dentist, get prescription glasses or attend specialist appointments. There is barely any room in the tight budget for getting a haircut or buying new clothes, items which help those individuals to be presentable when they try to get an interview. No money to have for unexpected bills. No money to engage in any hobbies or buy loved ones presents. How can people rebuild their lives if they can't have these basic things? It's unfortunate that those opposite haven't had any lived experience or actually talked to people that are unemployed and looking for work, because maybe then, maybe they'd have a little bit of compassion and understanding of how difficult it is to rebuild your life when you've lost your job. As uncovered by the Senate inquiry, this low rate of payment results in entrenched poverty which further exacerbates social exclusion, poor physical and mental health and increase in homelessness. 
The Liberal government's disdain for people receiving social welfare means that they don't look at, look at the evidence of how increasing this supplement would not only help people's welfare, but importantly, it would help the broader economy. The impacts of this pandemic were likely to last for some time. Following the release of the quarterly GDP data last week, which showed that Australia's economy had grown by 3.3 per cent, the Treasurer himself heeded the warning that it will be a long, bumpy road to recovery. The government has predicted that employment will not return to pre-COVID levels by at least 2024, but they committed themselves to cutting support at the end of March and given no indication that they will permanently increase the rate of job seeker. This bill is a missed opportunity for the Morrison government to deliver a permanent increase to the base rate of unemployment support. And that's why Labor is moving an amendment calling on the government to permanently increase the base rate of job seeker payment. The majority of submitters to the inquiry of this bill welcome the introduction of the coronavirus supplement in April 2020 and noted the positive effects it had on individuals, families and the community as it meant that people stopped living in poverty, particularly single parents with children. The Salvation Army and Mission Australia both commented that their organisations witnessed a significant decrease in regular users of their emergency relief services. That's a good thing. This is because people could afford to buy essential items, such as fresh food, pay their housing costs, health care. They could pay their electricity bills and other basic needs, things that everyone should be able to do. A reduction of the coronavirus supplement will contribute to the rising inequality we are experiencing in this country, which has been exacerbated by this crisis. It is well recognised, including by previous Senate inquiries, that the rate of New Start, now job seeker, is inadequate and has been realised as an inadequate uh, payment for a long period of time. I think the appropriate thing is to not only maintain the supplement, but to go for a permanent increase so that people who have lost their jobs can live in dignity until they become re-employed. This year has clearly highlighted and alerted all Australians, I believe, that the rate of $40 a day is simply not enough, and as members of the Liberal government themselves have stated, the idea of going back to $40 a day was a, and I quote, fairly cruel and unusual punishment. Now, it's OK to make those comments, and I appreciate those comments in the public arena or in this chamber, but you have to follow it up. You have to put pressure on your front bench. You have to put pressure on your prime minister to ensure that the rate for those job seekers is increased. But following the unprecedented measures put in place to protect our health from COVID-19, we've seen a once-in-a-generation recession and the deepest and darkest we have experienced in over a century. Despite being delayed, the federal government's response with the COVID virus economic supplement support made a very positive impact on people's lives. We have seen people able to pay for their housing, electricity and gas bills, turn on heating during the winter, pay for their water, telephone, internet bills, even pay for medications, and most importantly, eat enough healthy food, pay for their children's activities, buy clothing and shoes for themselves and their kids, participate in some activities, and even address outstanding debt. We have seen women able to re-establish their lives, having left violent family situations with reduced anxiety, as well as recover and regain confidence in establishing themselves into a pathway of employment. Now we will see this support ripped away from people who are already vulnerable. 
People shouldn't have to fall into poverty because they've lost their job. And by reducing job seeker back to $40 a day, it will do just that. Not only would permanently increasing the rate of job seeker improve the social welfare of hundreds of thousands of Australians, an increase would be good for our local jobs, local economies, and particularly in rural and regional areas, and most importantly, it would help my home state of Tasmania. Social Security recipients spend an estimated 58 per cent of their payments on retail goods or services at supermarkets, convenience stores, pharmacies, essential merchandise stores and other small businesses. It is projected that the scheduled end of the job seeker payment will take the equivalent of $8.5 billion per year from the retail sector. That's eight and a half billion dollars every year. The equivalent of 130,000 Australian retail jobs are also on the line if we return the rate of job seeker payment to its old base rate. Australians on Social Security will have less to spend on local and small businesses, and these local and small businesses will have less to spend on wages and be able to create jobs. Even before COVID, there were strong arguments for making a permanent increase into the job seeker payment. What COVID has done is give us a strong evidence base for thinking and realising and for the government to come to terms that they need to make a permanent increase without having significant adverse effects on the incentive to find work. We can have a substantial increase in job seeker without adversely affecting incentives to take up pay work, because I don't believe the sort of rhetoric that came from people like Senator Hanson, who likes to come in here and try to grab headlines whenever she can to badmouth and run down people who are unemployed. If they're One Nation people or they're migrants, then they're targets for what she has to say. People who are unemployed all want to go out and find a job that is satisfying and that will live their, lift their standard of living. But there has been no data to suggest that the higher level of job seeker during 2020 has any considerable effect on incentives to not take up paid work. There has been no evidence of any significance and that needs to be corrected on the, work, on the record. The notion that it does is just based on Liberal governments and Senator Hanson's distorted view of people who receive welfare payments and continue their ideological crusade. With more than seven job seekers for each job vacancy, there is simply not enough jobs for everyone in my home state. If even more difficult, it is even more difficult to find a job in our regions as a result of the government's failure to deliver a jobs program for it. In my home state of Tasmania, the travel restrictions imposed by COVID-19 has resulted in a dramatic reduction in tourism, an industry which directly and indirectly, Madam Deputy President, as you well know, and Senator Urquhart, employed 40,000 people and brought in approximately $4.5 billion to the state annually. Due to the ongoing restrictions and the downturn in economic activity, there are currently around 27 job seekers for every job application, and the unemployment rate is set to increase throughout next year. So it's seven across Australia job seekers for every job. In my home state, that's 27 job seekers for every job. It is essential that we continue to provide adequate support for these people so that thousands of Tasmanians and Australians who are unable to find work can obtain a basic standard of living. Again, something which not only Labor has been calling for for some time, but economists, those on the crossbench and industry specialists have all said that there needs to be a permanent increase in the rate of job seeker. Right now, it is more important than ever, with 1.8 million people set to be unemployment 
support for the end of this year. So that's 1.8 million people are set to be on unemployment support by the end of the year, and numbers still predicted to be above the pre-recession levels until 2024. The Morrison government has demonstrated that they have the will to spend money on welfare, initially through the COVID, but they have failed to acknowledge how important it is to ensure that people who are unemployed have an ability to have a basic living payment to give them dignity, to allow them to rebuild their lives. And these people have been given a reprieve now until the end of March. But what happens to them in April 2021? They go back to living on an amount of money that it is impossible to live on. I remember only too well back in the 80s when my family were trying to survive. You can't live on, the, on welfare payments. All you can do is try and survive because it's the unexpected expenses. Or it's your children who want to go on a school excursion and you don't have the money. It can be that you get to the end of your fortnight and you can't find enough coins to buy a carton of milk. That's the reality. And if your washing machine breaks down or your fridge breaks down or even something as simple as your iron breaks down, you do not have the reserves to be able to buy that new appliance. That's the reality of people who are on welfare. And it's certainly not because they don't want to work. It is certainly not because they waste their money. But the, every bit of their money is circulated in their local economy. That's the difference between people on this side and on most of the crossbenches. We understand because we listen to these people. We have these people coming to our offices and contacting us on a daily basis. People who are desperate. You have them crying in your office. This is the time for the Morrison government to step up and they need to do it now. Senator Watt. Sorry, thank, Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam yeah. oh. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to just make a short contribution in this debate today, really to put on record my concerns about the government's intention to scrap the increased rate of job seeker come March next year. Uh, and Really, the government's position, which is that job seeker should revert to the pre-pandemic level of $40 a day, is another example that for all of their claims that Australians are in this together, that is not what this government is about. And in fact, what they, what they are preparing to do is to leave millions of Australians behind while we remain in the worst recession that this country has seen in decades. Labor is putting forward amendments to this bill that I sincerely hope the government will support, because what those amendments are intended to do uh, is to ensure that we continue to see the higher rate of job seeker that we have seen through COVID-19 remain in place once we get to March next year. As I say, if the government doesn't support those amendments, then come March next year, while we continue to have well over a million people in this country unemployed and a similarly huge number of people underemployed, unable to find the work and the number of hours of work that they need, despite all of that, unless the government accepts these amendments from Labor, we will return to the poverty level job seeker payment that we saw prior to COVID-19, that rate being $40 a day. Now, it is well documented, whether it be in Senate inquiry reports, um, other research, or just by talking to someone who was on Newstart prior to the pandemic, that the $40 a day level 
that the government had in place and had stubbornly refused to increase condemned New Start recipients to poverty. Um, I remember I've, I've heard stories, um, whether it be in the media or in direct conversations uh, with unemployed Australians, that the difference it made when the government agreed to the coronavirus supplement a higher rate of, new, of uh, job seeker than what it had had pre-COVID meant, for instance, that single parents were able to actually put salad, you know, a piece of tomato, piece of lettuce, on their kids' sandwiches when they went to school that day. Because pre-COVID, when we had the $40 a day level, kids in single parent families weren't able to have a bit of salad on a sandwich because their families didn't have enough money to pay for it. No Australian and no Australian child should be forced to live in that sort of situation because of the mean-spiritedness spiritedness of their government. But that is what we saw from this government before the pandemic when they stubbornly refused to increase JobSeeker, and that's what we will see again uh, if this government does not accept the amendments that Labor is putting forward to put in place a permanent increase uh, to JobSeeker after March. If the government doesn't do it, it will condemn those Australians to poverty. And we're not just talking about Austra uh, unemployed Australians, we're talking about all up about two million Australians who will be affected by this, who will re re lose the increased payments that have been in place through COVID-19. It's unemployed Australians, it's young people receiving youth allowance, uh, it's sole parents, it's students receiving Aus study or AB study, it's widows receiving widow allowance, it's farmers receiving the farm household allowance. A very wide cross-section of Australians will go backwards, will be left behind by this government unless if they accept Labor's amendments. That will obviously be terrible for those individuals, but it will also be terrible for the Australian economy. In the middle of a recession, we should not be pulling out economic support to Australians, which they need for themselves and to be able to buy the very things that will create jobs in the wider economy. Uh, if we are really in this together, as the Prime Minister and his government continue to tell us they think we are, then they will back Labor's amendments and keep the higher rate of job seeker on a permanent basis. Thank you. Minister. The Acting Deputy President, I draw your attention to the State of the Chamber. Uh, quorum is required. Ring the bells. So we, we what the quorum? Oh. Yeah. Quorum present. Minister. If the uh, minister, thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I want to thank um, senators for their contribution to this debate, uh, and I commend this bill to the Senate. We have a the question is that the second reading amendment be agreed to. Those say aye. aye. Those against? No. Declare it carried. Uh, no. No. You, a division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. There must be more. Ch Thank you. I propose that the second. I propose that the second. Uh, um, 
the second amendment, um, second reading amendment moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those of that opinion moved to the right of the chair, those opposed to the left of the chair, and I call Senator Ciccone and Senator Smith as tellers. The result of the division is 32 ayes, 32 noes. It is resolved in the negative. Uh, Senator Seward, I understand you have an amend second reading amendment to move. I do, Acting Deputy Chair. Yeah, I move Green's amendment, um, second reader amendment, as circulated in the chamber. Thank you. I'll put that. All of those in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, say nay. The ayes have it. Noes have it. A division. You require ring. Ringing of the bells for one minute. I better be up here this time. I was told it was committee, so I think when I came in last time. That's right. You. That's the second reader. That's fine. Thanks. Stop the bells. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Ciccone tell of the ayes, Senator Smith tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative. There is no other second reading amendments. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security, veterans' entitlements and farm household support and for related purposes. Uh, if I could ask a temporary chair to come up um, so we could enter the committee stage. Thanks, Colin. Yep. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Send, oh, sorry, Senator Pratt. Sorry. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to move Amendment 1149, uh, which requires the minister and implores the minister not to cut the coronavirus supplement this Christmas, to announce a permanent increase to the base rate of unemployment payments and to help pensioners and carers. Minister? Um, look, thank you very much, um, Senator Pratt, um, in relation to Amendment um, 1149. Um, to, um, to apply uh, a, a further elevated extension to the coronavirus supplement. Um, as uh, the government has been, had been very clear, um, the extension of the supplement passed the 1st of January to the 31st of March uh, 2021 um, is going to continue. Uh, and what the legislation before us today seeks to do um, is to put into effect the legislation that will enable that supplement to continue to be paid. Otherwise, on the 31st of December, uh, the payment would expire. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, put in place an extension, uh, amongst other things, to this supplement of $150 for the period the 1st of January to the 31st of March. Um, and that is in addition to uh, the other provisions that sit within this particular, uh, this particular measure uh, to support Australians, um, because we understand that whilst we have seen some, some signs of recovery uh, and we've seen the jobs market um, starting to improve, we still recognise um, that the Australian economy, like well, much better than the world economy, but the Australian economy is uh, is still in recovery mode, and that is why the government made the decision that it would continue uh, with this elevated level of payment for people who find themselves um, still uh, unable to to get employment. But uh, at the same time, we're also seeking through other measures to incentivise people to re-engage with the workforce. Uh, as an example, in uh, in September, on the 25th of September, when uh, the, uh, the coronavirus, the original coronavirus supplement, uh, was due to expire. Um, we uh, put in place an elevated level of um, the income-free area, and doing so, we were hoping to encourage Australians um, who were um, coming out of a pretty traumatic time uh, in Australia. I mean, pretty you know, back in uh, March, we effectively shut our economy down overnight. So, uh, what what we are proposing to do, uh, and why the government will not be um, supporting the amendment uh, that has been put forward by the Labor Party. What we are seeking to do is to strike a balance between making sure that we recognise that there, uh, there is additional support that is needed out there at the moment to, to help people through that first um, part of 2021, and, and we will continue to monitor the economic conditions, particularly the labour market conditions, but, but more generally the economic conditions, um, as we move forward, standing side by side with all Australians. Um, to make sure that we walk together the pathway of this recovery. Uh, and that's why, um, if you have a look at the budget that was brought down back in, uh, in, uh, in November, you'll see that what we did was we put into a whole heap of measures in place so that we could support Australians outside um, of these particular measures that we're talking about today, because we believe the most important thing that we can do is to provide incentives for people to be able to get work. Uh, and the best way we can do that is to make sure we've got a strong economy uh, that is able to create the jobs so that people who have found themselves 
uh, in, uh, in, unemployed as a result of the coronavirus pandemic and, and those who were already unemployed prior to the pandemic so that we were able to find them a pathway to employment into the future. So uh, the government will not be supporting Labor's amendment. Senator Seawood. You. Um, the, the Greens will be supporting this amendment. We have a, a, an amendment actually that increases it to the original 550 that obviously I'll move later, but in the meantime um, we will support the 250 amendment. But I would like to ask the minister. During estimates, Minister, you made uh, and others have made claims that the coronavirus supplement at the higher rate was a disincentive to people finding work. At the Senate inquiry into uh, the bill, um, Professor Jeff Borland gave evidence to the committee that there was no evidence that the coronavirus supplement had acted as a disincentive for people to move into employment. Um, these are two conflicting pieces of uh, comments or evidence that has been received, both at estimates and through the Senate inquiry into the bill. So can I ask? A, can you provide the evidence that you said that you would provide us that's beyond anecdotal evidence? And secondly, do you acknowledge that the supplement in fact didn't, doesn't act as a disincentive for people who are looking for work? Minister. Um, thank you very much and thank you, um, Senator Seawitt. Um, well, Senator Seawitt, um, you, you refer to some, um, some commentary that was made by a, a, an academic, um, Professor Borland, um, and, uh, and um, you know, in, in terms of um, Professor Borland's comments, I'd make a, a couple of remarks before I uh, respond to the, the final part of your question. Um, and that is, uh, you know, we have seen over recent months um, unquestionably unprecedented inflows and outflows um, of the labour market as the economy has been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and clearly, any findings around recent experiences in the labour market cannot be analogous um, to the, the trans and tra transferable to, to normal economic conditions. So, um, the other thing I would note about the the, uh, the the data and the investigation that was undertaken by Professor Ball and to which he was referring to um, in. Uh, the evidence he gave was uh, with the, the investigation almost entirely centred around um, ABS, uh, ABS labour force data. It, it didn't go to administrative data on payment recipients, as an example. Um, and as you would well know, um, Senator Seward, people on payment are not necessarily counted as unemployed uh, if they are exempt from mutual obligations or not looking for work, or uh, they could be counted as not in the labour force. Um, so. You know, currently, we understand that uh, more than 20 per cent of job seeker payment recipients are reporting earnings, uh, meaning that they have some employment and accordingly wouldn't be counted as being um, unemployed. So uh, I, I put that on the record so that we can get some context uh, around the, uh, the, the information that Professor Borland was seeking to, um, to present as the basis of which he was making his, uh, his claims that he did. In relation to your sort of overarching question in relation to um, disincentives to work, um, Senator, uh, we, uh, we had a, a number of different um, places where we, uh, we were receiving significant information in relation to, um, to the, the uh, impact um, of higher levels of, of payment on people's um, I suppose the incentives that that was providing for people to to, to seek work and and don't don't get me wrong, Senator um, Senator Seward. I, I understand people were were particularly in the height of the pandemic were particularly. I mean, it was a very traumatic time, and I'm sure a lot of people were particularly scared. So I acknowledge that. Um, however, as we were coming out of the the pandemic, we were starting to see increasing numbers of businesses, either businesses themselves coming forward and putting this evidence on the table, or through. Uh, employer organisations like um, the uh, the Australian Business um, ca uh, Council or uh, through the um, uh, the IA group, um, um, Aki, as I said, were all coming forward with collated data that they had to, from surveys that they'd taken of their employer organisations, who were saying that um, that they had had concerns that people. Uh, and their, their, their employer, employers were saying that they were having difficulty finding 
um, people to fill jobs that when they actually advertised for jobs. And so uh, it was interesting also in the, the data that was collected through um, the, uh, the National Skills Council, uh, of which um, Senator Cash has responsibility, they do an, uh, a survey, a monthly survey in that survey um, of 2,000 businesses. 40% uh, of them actually reported that they were looking for employees, and the single most um, significant reason why they said they were unable to be able to get employees um, was they're saying they just there were no applications for um, for the for the jobs. Um, so uh, we had that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also had the JobKeeper review, and as part of the JobKeeper review, uh, that independent review found that in effect the elevated levels of, um, of payment were acting sort of as a, almost as a, as a floor, a base floor in, in the, the labour market. So there were a number of um, factors that contributed to uh, that, uh, that information. But I, I, I would say, um, Senator, um, say what the other probably um, you know, quite significant um, statistic that goes to this point was um, we did see uh, a, a quite a significant uptake um, in people applying for jobs as the jobs market was opening because I mean clearly we had to have the jobs and I mean I think it was 13.9 percent increase in the number of job ads uh, in November uh, we are starting to see people coming back into uh, the market Senator McAllister Thank you very much madam acting deputy president it's disappointing to hear the minister indicate she's not willing to support labor's amendment uh, and listening to her answers now to questions posed by Senator Seawirt, it is very clear that the government is operating on a deeply flawed understanding of how the Australian economy works, of how the labour market works, and indeed what the impact of these changes will be on communities all around the country, in particular regional communities. Because let's be clear what the effect of this bill is. This is a bill that confirms the return to the $40 a day rate for JobSeeker at, at the end of March. And it cuts the rate of payment uh, from January, the 1st of January next year. Now there are some good things, of course, about the bill. It continues the coronavirus supplement for youth allowance student and apprentice recipients after December. It's important. It continues the more generous income-free areas and taper rates and partner income tests. Those things are important. But at the heart of it, because of an ideological belief about people who suffer from unemployment being somehow at fault for their own circumstances, somehow indolent, somehow not interested in work. This is a bill that essentially seeks to cut support provided to people who are unemployed. Now, colleagues on this side of the chamber have been putting a very simple proposition to the relevant minister, Senator Rustin, and others on that side, and it's this. This bill does represent a cut to the coronavirus supplement at a time when the economy cannot afford it. This is a case of very simple mathematics. The supplement started out at $550 a fortnight, effectively doubling JobSeeker. Then from the 25th of September it reduced to $250 a fortnight, and from the 1st of January next year it will be reduced further to $150 per fortnight. Now, the mathematics on that are pretty straightforward. $250 is lower than $550. $150 is lower than $250. And if the government wants to cut the coronavirus supplement, they should be upfront about that, because that would make for a more honest debate, at the very least, about the amendments that are before us now and some of the other amendments that we'll be considering in the committee stage. The cut-in support is happening and will be happening. And, here are the, and the context for that is desperate. Here are some of the facts. There's 1.8 million Australians that are expected to be on unemployment support by the end of the year. Unemployment is expected to continue to rise. The OECD suggests it will hit 7.9 per cent next year, and that will be 
beyond the experience of many Australians, particularly younger Australians who haven't experienced very high levels of unemployment. And now OECD is pretty clear about the remedy for this kind of thing and pretty clear about the risks in the policy decision making. They have warned us about premature cuts to vital support, fiscal support delivered through mechanisms such as the coronavirus supplement, saying that cuts at this time could risk jobs and the economy. Now, you can ignore that advice if you come into this chamber and you say that what you're doing is not a cut, but it's a silly semantic argument. We are experiencing the worst recession in a hundred years. It is not a time for silly semantic arguments. It is a time for grappling with the serious economic circumstances that are facing Australian families, Australian workers, Australian communities and, frankly, Australian employers. Because the cuts contained in this bill, the cuts anticipated in this bill for next year, will have implications for all of those participants in the economy. This government likes to talk about employers a lot. This government isn't very interested in people who work for a wage. They're very interested in employers. On this side of the chamber, we're interested in all of the participants in the economy and we're interested in structuring an economy that will work for everybody. And part of that means that businesses and employers need to be operating in an environment where there is the demand for their products and services. And all of the advice before us suggests that withdrawing fiscal support at this time prevents a, presents a very serious risk to economic performance. And that risk, the exposure to that risk, is not just people presently receiving benefits through JobSeeker. It's spread right across the economy. And I tell you what, it'll hit hard in regional communities like the community that I came from in northern New South Wales. It'll hit a lot harder there than it will in some of the more affluent suburbs that some of those opposite are more familiar with and prefer to frequent. But I tell you what, it'll be noticed in regional communities because this is a recession with very uneven effects. And I am very worried about the communities that I know and love in my home state and the approach to economic policy being taken by this government. It's not just the OECD warning us. The Reserve Bank is also expecting a further rise in unemployment. They expect that unemployment will be above pre-pandemic levels as late as 2022. And that's, a, and that's the best case. There are still far more job seekers now than there are job vacancies. Many, many more. The vacancy report put out by the National Skills Commission showed that there were 155,000 vacancies in October. And that compares with data from the Department of Social Services showing there were over 1.3 million people on job seeker in October. What does that really mean? for people in the labour market. It means when they're going out looking for a job, they are facing a lot of competition. Those jobs are just not there. And many more people, many, many, many more people are dependent on benefits provided by government. And as I've indicated already, the consequences of that dependency flows into the businesses and communities in which those people live. Instead of reverting back to $40 a day for job seeker, the government should be permanently increasing the rate. That's not contemplated in this bill. In fact, this bill anticipates the circumstances where the coronavirus very soon, the coronavirus supplement, comes to an end. So there's 1.3 million Australians currently on JobSeeker, and they've been through a lot this year. They've experienced uncertainty, personally, financially, psychologically, and they're facing down a very uncertain Christmas and a very uncertain New Year. And they'll be wondering what level of support will be available to them after the 31st of March this year. That's the date when JobSeeker drops back to $40 a day. 
And for those people, some of whom won't have experienced unemployment before, all of whom will be facing a very uncertain labour market, very low rates of vacancies, they'll be rightly worried. They will be worried about how they'll pay the bills. They'll be worried about how they put the food on the table. They'll be worried about how they pay the rent. And it will make for an uncertain Christmas. I do wonder about the motivation from those opposite in leaving that uncertainty in place at a time when people surely, surely after all that has happened this year, people deserve the capacity to have a secure Christmas with family, secure in their own with some certainty about what next year might bring for them economically. It's true for business too, and I've talked about that already. It isn't just the recipients of benefits that we should be concerned about. These recipients are spending in small businesses locally. They play a vital role in helping to create and sustain jobs, and that is incredibly important as we emerge into a COVID normal situation. This amendment is not a radical amendment. It's an amendment that is tailored to the economic circumstances we find ourselves in. And it asks the government to provide certainty for people who are experiencing great uncertainty at the moment. Thank you. Minister. Oh. Sorry, Senator. Senator Seward. Can I ask, Minister, when will you announce a permanent increase to the job seeker payment and youth allowance? Minister? Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, Senator Seward, um, as I've been um, constantly um, saying in this chamber and outside of this chamber, um, the government is, is absolutely committed to remaining agile and flexible to try and respond to the unfolding implications of the pandemic and, and its recovery. Um, you know, we are in a very, very volatile economy at the moment. Um, we are seeing um, uh, some pleasingly, some some uh, some good signs of, of economic recovery as and uh, jobs market recovery, but you know as as we saw back in uh, back in in July when we thought we were through the worst of it, we actually thought that Australia had come out of the pandemic almost um, as as unscathed as as any nation in the world. Uh, and, and only a matter of seconds later, we saw the outbreak in Victoria, and we saw the devastating impact that that had on the Victorian economy, communities, families, and, and people in Victoria. So, what we want to do is to make sure um, that, as long as the COVID uh, coronavirus pandemic is uh, is still an active threat within our economy, to maintain um, flexibility that we can move, so that if, uh, as we have done um, with the continuation in September of the the supplement and once again as this bill that is before us today seeks to do is to extend the supplement past the 1st of, of January. So, Senator, in, uh, in response to your, to your question, um, right now uh, we are very focused on the here and now, the circumstances we find ourselves in, uh, and we will continue to monitor the situation as we go forward, as vaccines become available as an example. Uh, and at that point, um, you know, and we will continue to make decisions that reflect the economic conditions that are with us at the time. But I would reiterate the level of uncertainty that exists within uh, Australia, as evidenced by what's happening around the rest of the world, um, means that we will remain um, in this temporary, targeted, scalable, responsive um, mode where we can respond to people's needs um, on an as-required basis. Senator Pratt. Oh, sorry. In that context, you have said you want to respond to people's needs on an as-required basis. You saw fit to note that $40 a day wasn't going to be sustainable in the context uh, of a pandemic. I, I take from what you're saying you're quite prepared to go back to $40 a day and that there's no commitment from the government at all to assess the baseline of what New Start should look like. I want to ask you, please, what assessment the government 
has done of rents in Australia to know how survivable that payment is, of the basket of goods that people need to buy, uh, people's capacity to pay their utilities, as well as their capacity to pay for school excursions, clothing uh, and home telephone and internet connections. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, and in response to the question from, from Senator Pratt. Um, the decision in March to put in place a, uh, the coronavirus supplement for people who found themselves on working age payments um, at the level of $550 recognised that almost overnight the Australian jobs market closed. Um, on the 23rd of March, I think we will always remember that day, um, the states and territories shut their economies down and hundreds of thousands of Australians lost their jobs in the space of a matter of days. Mm. So the response by the government, and, and I acknowledge the support. Oh, sorry. Point of oh, sorry. Point of order. Sorry. Um, the sorry. Minister sadly is not asking my question. My question was specifically about the rate of New Start, not the supplement, and the adequacy of that payment without the supplement to. Um, meet people's um, daily needs. Senator Pratt, you've reminded the minister of the question. I'll, I'm sure she'll return to that. Uh, and and minister. through you, Chair, perhaps on the point of order, um, I'd draw your attention to the, um, the preamble to, mm. to Senator Pratt's question mm. where um, she made reference to the fact um, of the increase in the, uh, in the payment because of the coronavirus mm -hmm. supplement. And I was just trying to explain to her why that had been put in place. Um, and uh, the explanation around the additional $550, it, and it was for an extraordinary set of circumstances. And I was actually, before you uh, took a point of order, I mean, I was about to say um, and would acknowledge the fact that those opposite were absolutely 100% um, um, behind the actions of the government to be able to put in place all of those measures that got put in place to help Australians when they found themselves, when as a country we found ourselves in the situation. And, and want to acknowledge the bipartisan support that was provided to the government um, through uh, the management of the, the that early stages of the pandemic. I think all Australians appreciated the fact that we worked together to do that. Um, but as I said, it, it, it recognised the fact the jobs market closed overnight. There were no jobs. Hundreds of thousands of people lost their job, uh, and and that was the reason that we we put it in place along with the JobKeeper um, payments which uh, very successfully sought to keep people re um, maintain their engagement with their employer. Um, in, in, in reference to some of the, the further commentary um, that uh, Senator Pratt uh, uh, directed uh, in her questioning, um, I, I think uh, I would say that some of the things that you are insinuating that I have been inferring by my commentary are, are not necessarily correct. Um, I think if you uh, refer to my previous response to Senator C, when I, I've made it very, very clear, uh, the government is still considers what we're doing in a very temporary um, space, and we're looking at what we might uh, what we might need to do um, to respond to the economic conditions in the labour market, particularly that we are currently um, that's currently before us, and that's why um, Senator Pratt, we. Uh, made the decision uh, for the measures that are before us today in this bill, uh, but most particularly, I mean, the, clearly the most important component of that is the extension of the coronavirus supplement um, post the 31st of, uh, of December, which um, will provide an additional $3.2 billion over that three-month period uh, in payments to Australians who find themselves um, in, uh, on working age payments so that, uh, that they continue to have that elevated level of support, recognising that we are still in uh, a, a COVID-19-affected world, a COVID-19-affected economy and a COVID-19-affected uh, jobs market. So uh, that, is, that is where we are at the moment, and we will continue to work uh, to make sure that we, we monitor the situation. Um, but I'd also um, remind Senator Pratt that um, the constantly um, used uh, $40 a day. Um, you know, oh, oh, I, I think we uh, we all clearly in here always fail to, to recognise 
that very few people are on uh, the oh, base no. payment. In fact, I'm, I'm sure next to nobody is. But it's not just the, the comments that we're getting from the other end of the chamber, from Senator Seawood. But of course, if in Australia has one of the most comprehensive, targeted social safety net systems in the world, um, it is created as as a safety net. Uh, it is created um, as as a safety net. It's not created as a wage replacement. It is targeted, and as part of that targeting mechanism of our, our system. Um, we actually look at the individual circumstances of, of, of people. So, you know, if somebody has children, then clearly they are supported through the family tax benefit system. If uh, if people are in a situation where they are renting, uh, there's Commonwealth rent assistance uh, available to them. If people are on low incomes, and it's not just people on working age payments, but people more uh, generally who are on lower incomes, uh, there are there are many subsidised and, and often free services for them in, in relation to being able to get access to pharmaceuticals, healthcare, etc. Um, as well as Australia does have a, um, you know, a a system in terms of our general healthcare system, our education system. So we have a, a very comprehensive um, welfare system, and it is is very very targeted. Um, and the constant reference to forty dollars a day fails to recognise. Um, all of those other things that are associated, not just payments, but other access to other um, services uh, that would otherwise um, be required to be paid for. For instance, you know, the, the pharmaceutical allowances and supports and, and health care. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. You said in your remarks, Minister, uh, that the government was monitoring the situation and trying to be flexible. Nevertheless, this bill. Uh, on one hand, it retains the current power to keep paying the coronavirus supplement, but it uh, reduces the rate. But it also uh, ceases payment of that supplement on the 31st of March. Why, um, why do, does this bill have this provision in terms of not wanting to keep the power to keep paying the coronavirus supplement if you uh, and it leaves it totally in the government's discretion to lift it or raise it or get rid of it you don't have to pay it just because you've got the power to pay it why is it that you in this bill are seeking to remove uh, the power to pay that supplement minister uh, thank you very much um, uh, madam acting deputy president um, one of the um, the very um, I suppose core understandings when we came into the coronavirus pandemic was um, the powers that were given to me by um, this chamber, and, and there were powers given to the treasurer and the other chamber that were almost unprecedented because of the situation. Um, the basis of that was the inability for the parliament to be able to sit uh, in order for um, it to be able to make um, legislation or, or pass legislation or create regulation. Uh, and it, it has been often a very strongly held view that we should, wherever possible, um, embed um, the, any, any um, powers in primary legislation, especially powers that are as significant as these. So, uh, the reason the government um, has sought uh, not to accept the, the amendment that would um, grant me uh, an extension of quite extraordinary powers in, in this area, um, powers that were very much um, warranted uh, back in the, 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 the turmoil of the uh, initial stages of the pandemic, is because now that we are in a situation where the parliament is able to meet, um, that we believe that, that the power of the parliament should be respected and we should allow the parliament to make those decisions um, when the time comes and when we have more information in relation to what may be required post the 31st of March, because at the moment we, we clearly don't know that. So, um, Senator Pratt, the, the reason why um, the government is not seeking um, to put provisions in this bill to extend those powers is because we believe principally um, powers of that nature and magnitude should be embedded in, uh, in primary legislation. Senator Seawert was on the feet. Sorry. Thank you. Minister, why don't you go back to the issue around $40 a day? Now, you just outlined things that are uh, available to people. So I'm wondering why, if all, those, if all those things are so fantastic, why you put the coronavirus supplement in place in that case, if you think the system is so wonderful? 
Minister. Um, Senator, I'm oh, sorry, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, um, I, I think that one of the things that we probably need to be a little bit careful in here is um, is, is trying to um, elaborate and, and uh, in conflate and inflate, um, you know, the the flowery um, adjectives around what somebody had said. Um, however, what I did say was that um, forty dollars a day is not all of the support that is provided to people who find themselves on working age payments and that the, compre and the comprehensive Order. and targeted nature of our welfare system enables people to receive additional supports that relate to their particular um, circumstances. But in re relation to the principal um, part of your question, um, which was uh, very much the same as the question that I've just been asked by Senator Pratt and um, spent some time going through uh, why uh, we put the $550 a, day, uh, $550 a fortnight, the coronavirus um, supplement, in place in March was because the Australian economy on the 23rd of March closed down, just completely closed down overnight. Hundreds of thousands of people lost their jobs overnight, completely unexpectedly. No one could have had any, could not have foreseen um, what was about to happen to the Australian economy. The government. Well, nobody knew what was about to happen over the, the, the forthcoming weeks. And so what the government sought to do by putting that, that um, payment in place was to recognise there were no jobs. And e even the jobs, if they were there, no one could go to work because of the shutdown and the lockdowns. So we put in place a blanket for Australia to be able to cushion the period of uncertainty so we could get to the other side of that uncertainty so we could make some decisions in relation to um, how we would put in place ongoing supports for the Australian economy. Senator O'Sullivan. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair. Minister, uh, the, what we've seen is uh, the coronavirus pandemic impact people uh, very, very significantly uh, right across the country, and we're seeing uh, the recovery really starting to come in quite strong. Absolutely. But of course, it's uh, mixed across the country. Uh, there's states that were able to open up uh, more quickly because of the, uh, because of the, the health measures were, were dealt with uh, quite swiftly and, and comprehensively. And then, of course, in other states, uh, we've seen in other regions across Australia, we've seen there been a, uh, a delay in the, in the opening and, and so that's, of course, creating an environment where we've got a real mixed response uh, in the economy. Uh, we've got some communities that have, as I said, been recovering and labour markets have picked up. Uh, in my home state of Western Australia, uh, speaking to a lot of small businesses that are operating uh, across uh, Western Australia, as I do, uh, you can discover that uh, things are actually going quite well. In, in fact, some businesses are saying uh, an even better uh, response than before. Uh, there's some real stimulus that's there, possibly because of the, uh, the, the stimulus that this government, the Morrison government, has brought in as part of the overall packages of support that we've brought in to, uh, to deal with the coronavirus pandemic and the, the related uh, uh, recession that, we, that was, we were in for a, a moment. Thankfully, we've, uh, as a country, emerging, emerged out of that. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the, the impact has been felt. But there are businesses across Perth that are, and Western Australia that are they're actually recovering. I, I think of uh, a business uh, in, in my patch, uh, in the sort of southern section of Perth uh, where I live. Uh, uh, Brad and, and Trudy are running this uh, plumbing business. Well, they've actually, because of the, the growth in their area, they're working in the residential market. Uh, of course, that has been simulated because of the, the housing support that we've brought in. Uh, that's enabled those, uh, their business to actually grow, and they've just recently uh, been able to hire a, uh, a new apprentice. They've taken up a new apprentice in the last, uh, in, in the last uh, couple of months, and they've taken advantage of the, the incentives that, that we've provided. Uh, but we, of course, have this very mixed uh, situation because there are there, there, there are issues with uh, some employers being able to attract staff. 
uh, been able to attract staff that are necessary to be able to fill the jobs that they have available, to fill the jobs that they have uh, available for them to be able to uh, to be able to uh, you know, meet the demand that they're actually got. Now we're seeing that in agric agriculture, of course. Uh, we're in a, a harvest time uh, in Western Australia, uh, as my senator, good uh, good friend and colleague Senator Brockman, will be able to attest to because of his uh, vast experience and, and knowledge and background in the ag agricultural sector. Uh, Western Australia is uh, going through a, a good season, but we're struggling. Uh, in this season, to be able to uh, some of them to be able to find the labour, to be able to find the workers that are necessary to be able to uh, take up these jobs, to be able to take up the opportunities, the, the fantastic opportunities that are actually available. And there's a, a wonderful opportunity to be able to go out into the regions, uh, particularly for young people, particularly for young people, uh, to be able to go out into the regions. And there's incentives that are there. Uh, through another program, we know that there's a, uh, up to $6,000 in reimbursements that an individual can receive to be able to relocate, to be able to go out. And you only need to work a, a minimum of six weeks to be able to take up those opportunities. But we have seen, we have seen uh, through this pandemic uh, and through the, uh, the, the resulting uh, economic shock that, that came. Uh, we have seen, because of the support, uh, the extra support, employers say that they are not able to attract staff. Uh, and uh, there's, I believe, a, a whole uh, bunch of reasons why that uh, has happened. Um, uh, of course, with the pandemic, uh, we, we uh, necessarily uh, had to put a pause on, on mutual obligations because the last thing we wanted was for people to be going, turning up to their employment service provider, their job active provider, or maybe if they're in a regional area, a remote area, the community development program, the CDP provider. Uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't expect people to uh, turn up and engage in activities and training and job search requirements if, uh, because of the, the health restrictions that, that were put in place. Uh, and that, that, you know, that pause that was absolutely necessary, that ab absolutely necessary meant that we didn't have the, uh, uh, while there in some cases were actually jobs that were available, but because there wasn't, I guess, that requirement for people, um, some people uh, chose not to, uh, not to take it on themselves to, to get out and, and, and search for jobs, because we hear, we hear of employers saying they advertise, but then no one's applying, no one's applying. But we've, we've, uh, uh, the, the, other, the other aspect was, uh, was you know, at the time we, uh, when coronavirus impact first hit us and as a nation and we're dealing with the impacts of that, uh, the government saw fit and it was absolutely right to provide the coronavirus supplement payment and provide that, uh, that to people to be able to deal with the shock of you know, being told to stay at home, being told to and some people, as we know, were, were stood down from their jobs, and some of them, even as we know, many, many uh, Australians sadly lost their jobs. Now that is a that is a big impact. That is a big impact on individuals. It's a big impact on not just themselves, but of course their families, Order. their families. And uh, and so the support that has been there has been, um, you know, really profound, and it's just been a real game changer for many individuals and many families. But uh, we, we we're hearing and we've heard feedback uh, within the community that, uh, that, there's, uh, that there has been a disincentive, a disincentive to get out and, and be searching for work. And it was important that we followed through with what we said at the beginning when the government, Morrison government implemented the coronavirus supplement. We said it was a temporary program. It was a temporary program. It wasn't to go on forever. It was short. It was sharp, and that was absolutely necessary because uh, if we baked in certain elements, then of course, you know, those disincentives for the individuals, but also the impact that that would have on, upon uh, the, the the budget uh, position, would would be ongoing and be something that uh, future generations, for many generations, would in fact be be having to deal with. 
So the, uh, the following through with the with the, uh, the, the that that commitment that we made that it was just a, a temporary program uh, has been important. So the stepping uh, down of the the coronavirus supplement payment is uh, is a I, th I think a, a very necessary thing to ensure that people are active in actually taking up the many 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 opportunities that are that are available, the many opportunities that are available, and. Uh, my, my, my question uh, to, the, to the minister really is along the lines of understanding you know, if, if someone is able to if someone is able to uh, maybe pick up a little bit of extra work uh, you know they might have, there may not be a job that's that's fully and fulsome available to them at the same level that they were at uh, prior to the pandemic but there, there might be some part time work. Uh, and opportunities, and I understand the, that, with, that this uh, amendment and this sorry this bill uh, amending the uh, the coronavirus supplement will enable individuals to be able to uh, earn up to three hundred dollars per fortnight, uh, and, and whether that's for for job seeker or or the youth allowance. And so, Minister, will those how, how will that work in practical terms? People are able to. Uh, go and uh, maybe get some part-time work and earn that money before it starts to impact them. And what I'd be interested in understanding what happens when, if they actually earn over that, uh, what impact that would have on their take-home pay. Yeah, yeah. Minister, um, thank you um, very much, um, Madam Acting Chair, and, and thanks, Senator O'Sullivan, um, for a comprehensive analysis of, of what is, is an extraordinarily important piece of um, of legislation that. You know, none of us, I think, ever thought we would be in a position where we'd be standing in this place so many times and, and talking about these unprecedented um, measures uh, to support our country through a once-in-a-century pandemic. Um, however, you, there are a number of really important elements in the, the, the um, contribution that, that Senator O'Sullivan just made that I, I would like to perhaps expand a little bit on. Um, uh, first of all is that um, we have seen um, disproportionate impacts depending on where you are, what type of jobs are, uh, are on offer, the type of skills that are available geographically, um, different demographics. And so um, whilst we went into the pandemic with a, a probably a, a little bit of a, a one size fits all response with the, the increase in the, cor or the, the coronavirus supplement, as we're starting to come out of the pandemic, we actually see that different regions, different industries, um, and different groups of people are coming out at a different rate. Some of it, um, some of it, you know, is good news. I mean, it's great to see that, you know, 80% of the jobs that were lost during the pandemic have now come back. But in relation to the, um, you know, the, the, the work incentives that Senator O'Sullivan is, is talking about, we we have certainly seen um, that rural and regional jobs have been. Uh, and rural and regional communities have been much harder hit by an inability to be able to access the labour force, perhaps than some of our metropolitan areas have been. Um, and you know, myself, coming from a rural and regional area, Senator O'Sullivan, have certainly seen the, the you know the great and grave concern amongst um, uh, our, our rural and regional employers uh, and, and their ability to get a workforce, particularly in areas such as um, you know those en entry level jobs, uh, you know, so the lower paid jobs. But also, um, very specifically, in agriculture, particularly harvest jobs, uh, and hospitality. And so we have a, um, you know, have a situation where there are parts of the country that are screaming out for a workforce. And you know, whilst we've we've put in place a number of incentives that came out through the budget, that have uh, have tried to put incentives so that that people, you know, maybe just look at that incentive and think, yeah, you know. I'll give that a go. That that that's worthwhile. Um, you know whether it was the six thousand dollar relocation allowance that was offered to people who were prepared to move from uh, move to, to specific regional areas where harvest labour harvest labour was required, um, or whether it was the um, to, to incentivise young people who were trying to get their independent status by their uh, their work test by getting uh, giving them the opportunity for an accelerated work test measure so that they could go out to the country, they could work in agricultural sector, they could work on the harvest and more quickly um, be eligible for 
um, for being able to get um, uh, uh, independent status uh, so that they were able to, to in some cases, um, to put themselves through university um, in the sub as soon as they were able to do that. So we have tried to do that, but um, you know, disappointingly, I'm afraid it, we have had quite a slow take up of this, um, and you know, would certainly encourage anybody who's listening to, to this debate that um, you know, if they find themselves in a, uh, who are unemployed and they're in an area where um, employment opportunities are, are, are more restricted, there are opportunities if you're prepared to move, and there are incentives and supports in place. Uh, to help you if you would like to move. And I know uh, certainly the farmers of Australia would love to see um, more people come out and, uh, and uh, be prepared to, to put up their hands to do the harvest. And you know, Yes, it is hard work. Um, yes, it can be pretty hot out there uh, in the middle of summer. But um, you know, having been brought up on a farm and picked and cut apricots every summer, you know, it, it, it actually is quite a, a fun place and people in the country are super duper friendly too. So I would encourage people um, to, to maybe have a think. It might not be the job that your you, you know, your your life's ambition job. It may not be a job that um, you know is as uh, as um, engaging or as fulfilling as the one that you may have lost. But um, if you re-engage with the workforce, it, it certainly um, we know that um, if you have any hours reported, um, you are more than twice as likely to come off payment in the short term. Than those people who are on payment that don't report any earnings, and uh, that is probably the most significant and driving factor um, behind the income-free area that Senator O'Sullivan referred to in his contribution. Um, previously, the income-free area uh, um, was at $106 per fortnight, and um, we did see, you know, quite a number of people who were um, were reporting payment, but. The increase to $300 per fortnight um, appears to have had quite a significant inf impact on the number of people who are reporting earnings. Uh, you know, maybe people looked at the, that $300 and thought, you know, yep, it's uh, it's a couple of shifts um, a week uh, and, or a couple of shifts a fortnight, and if I go and do that, I won't lose one cent of my payment um, for the first $300 I earn, and then for every dollar that you earn over the $300 until you reach your cutout threshold. Um, which actually the cutout threshold equates to a $1,257 per fortnight payment um, or, or, or income received by the individual uh, because it only tapers, it tapers off at 60 cents in the dollar. So we were really and we remain really keen as we transition um, out of um, providing um, supports to people to help them cope with the, the impact of the, the intensity of the shutdowns as the, when the pandemic first hit. As we're walking the walk with Australians um, through this pandemic and through this recovery out to the other side, is transitioning so that we maintain a balance between that support that we referred to, but also the incentive for people to get out and re-engage with the workforce, but at the same time a, a, a package of measures that incentivise uh, the creation of jobs. Uh, you know, and only um, this week the ATO opened. Um, registrations for people who are um, interested in um, availing themselves of the, the opportunity that's, that is presented by uh, the job maker um, hiring credits scheme uh, and also um, a very significant investment that's been put into the job trainer program uh, so that we can make sure that the people um, who may not be able to go back to the industries that they were previously working in um, or the businesses that they were previously working in that they have got the kinds of skills that are going to be relevant and are going to be in demand um, as we go forward. Because we know our economy is changing. It was changing before we went into the pandemic, but the pandemic certainly accelerated um, the, the change in the, 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 the market balance between the types of jobs that are, that are in demand. So, uh, Senator O'Sullivan, in, in response to your, uh, your question um, in, in, in summary is that it is about trying to create incentives so people will look up and, and think that it's, it's worth having a go. Keeping in place a, a level of elevated support, recognising we've still got a way to go with the recovery and at the same time remaining agile so that should anything change, when I mean, it can overnight as we well know, that we still remain fleet-footed so that we can change to any situation that may be um, um, brought upon us because of the extraordinary volatility, uncertainty 
um, of this coronavirus pandemic and the impact it's had on our country. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting. Oh, sorry, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President. We've had a change of personnel. Um, can I ask, please, Minister, in the context of your powers to raise the new start rate? Uh, because you said that you didn't want to overstep the discretionary, sorry, the job seeker. No, no, I understand that. You don't. The parliament has the powers to do that, and the government has the powers to make the suggestion to do that. So, can you explain to me the process, please, for raising the rate of JobKeeper substantively? Minister. Um, probably need to just set a little bit of clarification around that. Um, I, I, I have no interface with JobKeeper at all. That's something that oh, the sorry, Treasurer. Um, uh, the, the, the rate of job um, seeker um, has not changed. The, 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 the base rate of job seeker um, has remained the same throughout the pandemic. Um, and you know, for those who are confused about all the names, job seeker is the new name of the consolidated payments that all that were primarily in the past the new start rate. Um, and just by some extraordinary quirk of coincidence, the day that those eight payments came became one payment and became the job seeker payment happened to completely coincide with the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and I think that there, there is in a lot of places a, a misconception that the job seeker payment is a coronavirus specific payment, um, as opposed to it just was accidentally happened to be a, um, a, a payment that was made, uh, or sorry, a name change of a, of a consolidation of payment from the new start rate. So just to put that on the record so we've got clarity around what we're talking about. Um, the powers that we were discussing, um, Senator Pratt, were in relation to the powers that are on offer by the amendment that's been put forward by the, uh, the opposition um, to enable the, uh, me as the Minister for Social Security to have vested in me um, ongoing powers to be able to um, make changes in relation to measures that relate to the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, and there are a number of measures that were impacted. I mean, everybody, um, you know, we all talk about the coronavirus um, supplement, and, and that's certainly the headline thing that we've been talking about. But there are a number of other measures that are contained, uh, which I, I note that you're um, seeking by this instrument to enable me to have the power, whether it be um, to be able to make changes to the, the partner income um, um, taper rate, whether they be changes to eligibility for people to be able to get access to payment. Uh, we have a, a, a quite a large number of people who are currently have access to payment who otherwise would not have access to payment, whether they be sole traders, people who have been stood down, you know, somebody, for instance, who um, has uh, has to isolate because they have uh, the virus, or they are caring for somebody who had the virus. So um, there are, and um, for and another one um, that I had that, that that relates to this power is the uh, the income free area and the ability to. Um, to be able to um, it can it change the rates um, of the, the income free area. So um, the powers that you're, the, 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 the matter that you're referring to in terms of the powers that you are um, seeking to uh, provide to me as the Minister for Social Services relate to coronavirus specific actions that uh, were put in place. Um, and as I said to you, Senator Pratt, the reason that uh, the government is suggesting that we don't proceed with this particular power is because we believe that the parliament is able to sit and as a result of it being able to sit then the parliament um, should be allowed to exercise its, uh, its, its power and responsibility over this type of um, decision because of the magnitude of the decision uh, that we believe that it should be something that we should ask the parliament to make a decision about instead of just vesting that power in the Minister um, for Social Services, but recognising it has been done in the past, and the reason it was done in the past was because we uh, we were concerned that the Parliament may not be able to sit as a result uh, of the fact that um, the coronavirus pandemic restricted any movement of um, us as politicians, um, as we and, well, as every other member of the population was restricted um, in terms of their ability to move around the country. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Minister, and thank you. Mr. Deputy, Acting Deputy President, um, yes, of course. So we we've been through debate on 1149, and of course, many of my questions related to our amendment 116, which strikes out the parts of the bill that repeal the minister's current powers to pay that virus. And so I'd like to stand and move that now. 
And in doing so, I will also move 1162, which strikes out those parts of the bill that repeals the minister's current power to exempt people from the liquid uh, assets waiting period. So, um, Senator Pratt, from a procedural point oh. of view, we already have a question before the chair, which is the first amendment you've moved. So we can't actually move the other amendments until that question is dealt with. But you have the call. Hmm? Uh, no, I, I have moved that already. 1149 has already been moved. Yeah. Okay, so the question is that Amendment 1149, uh, sorry, Amendment 1 on sheet 1149, moved by the opposition, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. So the question is that amendment one on sheet 1149 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator McGrath as teller for the noes. Order, there being 30 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Pratt. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move the remaining opposition amendments. Is leave granted? There being no objection, uh, it's the remaining opposition amendments. Six one. Okay, so you want to just move the one. So uh, yes, so we are moving. Uh, is leave granted to move Amendment One on Sheet One One Six One? Yep. Okay, so I'm going to put the question. So the question is that Amendment One on Sheet Double One Six One uh, stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Oh, okay. um, sorry, sorry, I've just put the question. Um, I, I have moved it. I don't know that I'm able to take the call straight after having moved it. Good, thank okay. you. Okay, all right. So we'll I, Senator Senator Pratt. I ha because nobody stood, I put the matter for debate for debate. So for voting on. So no, no, no. Um, please, you want to speak on it. So please continue. That's fine. We just need to be clear, um, Senators, about, through you, Madam Deputy President, what this amendment does. We've had a significant debate here and now about the fact that this minister does not want to— she says that it's beyond her authority and she wants the commission and the trust of the parliament and she only wants to take action that, uh, that she's allowed to do by the parliament and that too much discretionary power is no good. Well, that is a principle that we can, of course, accept, apart from the fact that this government stubbornly refuses to increase the rate of the job seeker payment. It would be all very well to say uh, we need more parliamentary oversight on these uh, issues, and I don't want to be able to exercise too much discretion to give power to give money 
to people uh, within, in the course of this pandemic. Now, I'd be the first to admit that this amendment wouldn't be necessary if the government just got on and raised the rate of job seeker. I put the question. Minister, you're seeking the call. Thank you. Just in, re in, in response to that, um, I just wanted to make it very, very clear that what this amendment seeks to do is, is it has got nothing to do with um, what Senator Pratt just alluded, that it was some power for me to increase the rate of job seeker. That is not what this amendment does. What it seeks to do is it gives me the power in relation to the job seeker supplement and it gives me the power in relation to other measures that sit around that, such as the taper rate for partner income, accessibility for different eligibility categories to be able to get access to payment uh, and the income-free area. It does not address the rate of job seeker. So the question is that uh, Amendment 1 on sheet 1161 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. The ayes have it. Ring the bells for four minutes. Hello.
Stop the bells. So the question is that Amendment 1 on sheet 1161 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McGrath as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order. <clears throat> there being 30 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is negated. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I now rise to move uh, amendment on sheet 1164. This amendment calls on the minister to ask her to consider extending a beneficial regulation power which has been used to increase the partner income test increase the amount of money that a per person can earn before they lose the payment and make it easier for sole traders and the self-employed people to access unemployment support. Now, the minister has uh, said a lot in this place about uh, the fact that uh, extra support has been extended to sole traders and self-employed people uh, through the JobKeeper and JobSeeker payments. However, the government in this legislation doesn't want to extend uh, that power. So we are here calling on the government to consider extending that power on an ongoing basis, again, so the government can be flexible in responding to the needs uh, of people. So, for example, uh, earlier in the year, at the beginning of the pandemic, we negotiated a general regulation power with the government, which Labor pushed the government to do. Uh, and the government rightly used that power to intervene to help Australians st struggling uh, in the time of coronavirus. This included paying students and apprentices the coronavirus supplement. Uh, this was particularly important because uh, students and apprentices uh, also uh, would have lost access uh, to their uh, part-time work and, indeed, like uh, New Start would have gone down to the uh, base rate. It also enabled the minister to double the partner income test to around $80,000. This helped households where one income earner had lost their job and there are around 100,000 households that benefited from this change. It also enabled the minister to increase the amount a person can earn each fortnight before their payments start tapering out from $106 to $300. And as I highlighted before, the government's been very happy to talk up the support that they've given to sole traders and the self-employed in accessing this support. So if the government says it wants to do the right thing, monitoring the situation and keeping uh, Australians supported, 
during the time of coronavirus, then you should be doing these actions. Just Order. as 116 uh, calls on the government and enabled the government to keep making higher payments, here again the government should be allowing itself the flexibility to do the right thing by Australians. We're not worried about too much power being in delegated legislation in the case of the government taking this action, because the government would need to bring back primary legislation to do this, uh, and we would think it would be a good thing to do that. <coughs> Just like the increased payments themselves, we need to see changes that continue long after March. And that is because these changes, uh, the, the impacts of coronavirus, as all economic reports show, will continue a long way uh, past March. There are projections of uh, 1.8 million people unemployed and that that will continue to grow. And as we know, as we all know in this place, the government has already said that it's going to phase out JobKeeper. Now, once JobKeeper is phased out, we then rely on the sustainability of those businesses to pay the wages of their own workers. Now, sadly, some of those workers will end up on JobSeeker payments. And the minister should have the flexibility to enable people in that environment, for sole traders and self-employed people, to continue to access unemployment support. We want to see concessions continue. There will be double the number of people on unemployment in Australia for some time. So the government needs to be held to account on this, and we call on the government to make these changes just as we call on them to raise the rate of job seeker so the question is or unless the minister wishes to respond i'm going to put the question so the question uh, senator o'sullivan uh, thank you very much uh, madam chair uh, the thing that's really stuck out to me throughout this uh, this year has been the the response from the Morrison government has been, uh, uh, you know, has been has been varied and has enabled, uh, you know, a very tailored response to to the coronavirus challenge and the pandemic that we're dealing with. Because we've got mixed we've got mixed cases. We've got we've got all sorts of uh, problems and challenges across the country in dealing with the the, the economic impact of the coronavirus challenge. And the coronavirus supplement has enabled uh, people to be able to provide uh, for their families in that necessary time, having you know, dealt with the immediate shock of maybe being stood down from their job, not having that secure uh, employment because they would lost their job. And the, the coronavirus supplement has enabled uh, them to be able to meet those important needs. But, it, but it's actually been weaved in as part of a tapestry. It wasn't the only thing that the government did. We, of course, know of the, the JobKeeper payment, which has, uh, when you go around Australia, when you go around, or at least in West Australia, like I've been able to do, and you speak to businesses, you speak to people on the ground, you, you get a real appreciation for the impact that that program had uh, in actually making sure that people were able to remain, remain connected to their employer. Uh, much better than actually going, having to go uh, onto the job seeker payment, uh, because those people were able to remain connected to their employer. And so, what we've seen right throughout this uh, is a remarkable response from the Morrison government in ensuring there's actually a, you know, a tapestry of, of support, uh, a real mixture of, of support, to ensure that that is getting to where it's needed, uh, so that individuals and families are not left high and dry, so they're not just left out on their own, uh, they're actually supported. And we've seen that across the board. Uh, the, the housing stimulus has enabled tradies to keep their jobs. The housing uh, program has enabled tradies to, to keep their jobs. And so I think uh, 
you know, as we're discussing this, the, the, the coronavirus supplement has been uh, incredible to ensure that individuals that weren't able to take up those sort of opportunities that came through stimulus, the opportunity to be able to uh, receive that support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is that, um, are you seeking the call, Minister? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, um, thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, what I would like to, to do in my contribution is um, is to put on the record um, to make sure that everybody in the chamber has absolute clarity around what this amendment will actually do, uh, as well as I believe that this amendment is almost identical to a similar amendment that I think the Australian Greens um, have got um, on sheet. Uh, 1160. What, it, what happened when uh, the Australian government uh, put in place the coronavirus supplement um, in March? The initial coronavirus supplement um, had a provision uh, that said that for as long as the supplement was in place, um, people would be, who came onto payment would not be sought to wait any liquid asset waiting period. It applied to two payments. It applied to job seeker payment and applied to youth allowance other. It did not apply to any of the other working age payments. So when we uh, made changes um, when the coronavirus supplement was uh, due to expire on the 25th of September, um, we sought to uh, we made the decision to extend the supplement. In the process of extending that supplement, it meant that the liquid assets waiting period and the assets test, as they applied to those two payments only, uh, would remain in place. At the time, the government sought the, um, the support of the chamber to be able to uh, remove those two particular provisions, allow all of the other provisions that were put in place subsequent to this one, the, the, the first coronavirus um, supplement provision uh, to no longer waive the liquid asset waiting period and no longer waive the assets test. The cha this chamber voted for that to occur. What this does is it seeks to reintroduce from the period from the 1st of January to the 31st of March a waiving of the liquid asset waiting period for the two payments of job seeker and youth allowance other only. It, I have no discretion whatsoever. It is an automatic um, uh, um, um, action that anybody who comes onto payment um, but, uh, after the 1st of January would, would not be required to, to wait the liquid asset waiting period. So it would not matter how much money that person had in the bank. Um, you know, they could have hundreds of thousands of dollars, or they could have twenty thousand dollars, and um, I have no discretion whatsoever in the provisions that are contained in the amendments on sheet 1162 and 1160 to be able to have a discretion to say, well, somebody who has $150,000 in the bank, and uh, I just would put on the record that there are a lot of people who have, uh, have come on to payment uh, in the last couple of months uh, who are subject to the liquid asset waiting period that do have significant amounts of money in the bank um, and that I have no discretion whatsoever um, in terms of uh, being able to say that this provision only would affect people under a certain level of, uh, of, of resources. Uh, and so I, I just wanted to make sure that this chamber was, was absolutely clear. This is not giving me a power to have discretion to say if you have many hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank you can't have access. You, you, will, you will be required to sit, uh, have a liquid asset waiting period. But if you only have a few thousand dollars in the bank um, over the, the five and a half thousand dollar uh, limit, where you don't have to serve any period as a single, or eleven thousand dollars, you don't have to serve any waiting period as a as a couple. I have no discretion whatsoever. As soon as somebody exceeds uh, yeah, that, there, I have no discretion at all. Um, so it wouldn't matter how much money somebody had in the bank, they will automatically 
be able to get pay, access payment from day one, because as you would be aware, uh, we, are, we currently have the one week waiting period is waived and is, is maintained, um, waived at the moment. So that, that continues to go through. So nobody has any waiting periods if they are eligible. However, I just want to be very clear, this is not a discretionary um, uh, power you are giving me. Um, it is something that is embedded in this legislation that says anybody coming onto payment from the 1st of January 2021, no matter how many liquid assets they have in the bank, will not have to wait any waiting period. So I just wanted to make sure everyone was very clear about that. Senator Patrick. Can I just ask a question in relation to what you just said, Minister? Can you give me some feel for how you have exercised the discretion up, up to date, what sort of considerations that you've made, what uh, uh, sort of circumstances in which you have exercised the discretion? Minister. Uh, uh, Senator, I don't have any discretion. I've never had any discretion. Uh, what we sought to do on the first, uh, in, in March when we put the coronavirus supplement in place was to say, um, you know, so we could get people under payment as quickly as possible for administrative ease. So we, because of course, we, you know, we all saw those long lines around Centrelink, um, and we worked so quickly and so hard to make sure that we we got rid of those. And one of the ways that we did it was to streamline our process. And one of the mechanisms was not to go uh, to require many of these other things that we would normally require under normal circumstances for people to be able to provide proof in, around other circumstances in their life. So we waived a number of the things that we uh, required of them, and one of them was the liquid asset waiting period. So for the period uh, from March to the 25th of, uh, 25th of September, we did have the liquid asset waiting period was waived for everyone. But what we sought to do, um, and was successful with the support of this chamber, was to reintroduce the liquid asset waiting period from the 25th of September. It is currently in effect for people coming on to payment. Um, who are over the threshold that is uh, the, the, of, of the no, no waiting period. What this particular amendment seeks to do is to reintroduce it on the, the 1st of January through to the 31st of March for two payments only, not all of the payments, just those two, albeit two big ones, um, at, with no discretion whatsoever. It's you serve a waiting period or you don't serve a waiting period. Senator Patrick. Okay, so in, in those circumstances, uh, moving forward, can you give some uh, idea of how you would exercise a discretion, assuming this uh, amendment didn't get up? Uh, assuming this amendment uh, didn't get up, so I, I understand therefore that, that a discretion then applies. You, the minister has a discretion. Can you just give me some idea of how that would be exercised? Uh, sorry, Senator Patrick, I, I should have been clear. I, I, I don't have a discretion. What it does is it reverts back to what is the existing provision um, in legislation that says what the, the thresholds around the liquid asset waiting period are. Um, and just sort of as a bit of a, a summary, um, people who have got uh, singles, single people who have got um, $5,500 or less in the bank do not serve any waiting period at all, and couples who have got more than $11,000 in cash in the bank don't serve any waiting period at all, um, and then it's five hundred dollars for every one one fortnight. One. So, and for it's one week for every five hundred dollars, up to a maximum of thirteen weeks. So, um, and it, just as an example, you know, people do have significant levels of their own resources. Um, sometimes when they come on to payment, and I suppose one of the, the, you know, the fundamental underlying premises of, of, of Australia's welfare system is that there is an expectation that people draw on their own resources and assets um, uh, to support themselves um, before they actually ask the, the taxpayer to support them, and that's one of the, the fundamental underpinning of why um, the liquid asset waiting period is in place. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, can I just point out that this isn't in fact the amendment that's before the chair? The amendment before the chair is 1164. I will make a comment. No, it's 1164. Yeah. So, so I, I do appreciate the minister's explanation. I want to make. Uh, I'll con 
I will make a comment on the other amendment shortly, but I figure it's not appropriate to do it now, given that we've got 1164 before the chair. Again, I do appreciate the explanation. Um, Senator Seaworth, I just do remind you of the hard marker at 6.30. So. Yes. So. No, no, keep going. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, just, no, well, I, just I was actually you finishing. Wanted, you say, might run out of time. Yeah. That's all I was Well, saying. no, it'll make life easier for the chamber if we do this now and then we get to that other one. Senator Patrick. Just to be clear, um, as I've been trying to keep up with this, uh, your explanation applied to the last to the last amendment or to the next one? To the next one. One one six two. Okay. Clear. Um, my apologies. I was talking to 1162. I, I apologise. Um, I actually thought that's what I heard Senator Pratt move. Um, the amendment that you're referring to, which is 1164, um, is, is basically gives me the power to consider whether I would, um, you know, like to act in this area. Um, it, it, it has no substantive impact, um, and uh, yeah. So the, the the one that has the substantive impact um, is 1162. So the question is that Amendment 1 on sheet 1164 be agreed to. The, uh, those in that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Ring the bell. Division required? Um, Senator Wong. Do I put a thing over my head? <laughs> uh, subject to the wishes of the chamber, given that the substantive issue that has been discussed might merit, I think, some discussion. Is the next amendment? We're happy to call off the division on the basis that uh, obviously the opposition is recorded as voting yeah. and we're not win aye. Is that right? This is an aye one, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, but subject to Senator Seaworth's views. Senator Seaworth, can I say ditto? Um, yeah, sure. I think we actually need to deal with the other one, the next one. Yep. But can you record us as I supporting will. the? Div yes. Thank yeah. you. Um, so that we don't need a division. So we're going to record. We've done this before. We're going to record the um, agreement of the Labor Party and the Greens Party. The noes. I, I already called it for the noes. Uh, I'm in the. Yep, Senator Seaworth. Thank you. Um, the Greens will be withdrawing. Uh, amend uh, amendments, our proposed amendments on sheet 1160 as they relate to the liquid assets test. And I, I, I just want to explain very briefly why, because we actually very strongly were trying to get the position where the minister um, could ensure that um, the liquid assets test suspension could last as long as the coronavirus supplement, for example, lasted, as long as the pr uh, pandemic lasted. We didn't seek to um, make the liquid assets test um, permanently suspended. Uh, just for the record, we do actually support very fundamental reform to our social security system and, and support the concept of a guaranteed adequate income, which puts the liquid assets test in a different frame. But while we have the current system, we do think there needs to be uh, some issues related to um, the, the the amount of savings someone has, but we very strongly wanted the minister to have the, the discretion to suspend it while we're in this, particularly while we're in the pandemic. So uh, we we thought that the amendment that we got drafted did that. We now believe you. We believe the explanation that it in fact doesn't do that, and so we will be withdrawing it. Um, but we but we particularly want the minister. We want people to be able to access uh, job seeker payment and the coronavirus supplement while we're in the pandemic and the recession because people shouldn't have to wear down their savings. Thank you. So we, we've withdrawn uh, Greens Amendment 1160. Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. The principle of our amendment is the same. We wanted to see the government be able to vary that assets test in the context of doing the right thing by people during the pandemic. However, we don't want to see it deleted uh, entirely so that an assets test uh, waiting period does not apply uh, on a permanent basis. We call on the minister to address this issue themselves, the government themselves, by reform of this issue in further legislation. 
And we'll just, uh, Senator Seward, I'm taking that you've moved um, 116. No, I'm speaking to Senator Seward because we haven't. She hasn't moved that to withdraw it. 116. Okay, I, I move to withdraw. Um, yep. the grant, that Greeners amendment. So the question is that the Greens amendment 1160 be withdrawn. Okay, thank you. And Senator Pratt. I just place on the record that I'm not moving 1162 and that it's withdrawn. I hadn't moved it. Okay. All right. I withdraw the amendment so that it's not uh, moved in the process of the guillotine. So thank you've you. moved that. Thank you. So, Senator Seward. Yeah. Um, thank you. I will move Green's amendments, which are in the form of requ uh, request one and two on sheet 1124, and this relates to increasing the coronavirus supplement back to its original level of $550 a fortnight. Thank you. So the question is <clears throat> that. Uh, the amendment, the request is moved by the Greens, one and two, on sheet double one two four. For those requests, amendments to be agreed to. The, um, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. Aye. I believe the noes have it. Senator Seward. Sorry, um, Deputy, uh, Chair. Um, can I have it recorded that the Greens, of course, supported our amendment? Yes, certainly. So. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? Uh, I believe the ayes have it. So the question is that that the the question is that the bill now be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. <coughs> Report from the Committee of the Whole. The committee has considered the social services and other legislation amendment extension of coronavirus support bill 2020 and has agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister, sorry. <laughs> I move that this bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security, veterans entitlements and farm household support and for related purposes. is going to introduce this bill. Um, the President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Aviation Legislation Amendment Liability and Insurance Bill for 2020 for concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Mm. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Handstart. Thank you, Minister. Sorry. I've just jumped ahead of myself. Um, I'll call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to aviation and for related purposes. So the minister has already moved that. So the question is <clears throat> that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, let's have it. So, yep. so call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to aviation and for related purposes.
So, as no amendments have been circulated, I call the minister. Uh, I move that the bill be read a third time. So, the question is: the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. <coughs> a bill for an act to amend the law relating to aviation and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day No. 8, Immigration Education Amendment Expanding Access to English Tuition Bill 2020, Second Reading Debate. Minister. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. That the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. And I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Immigration Education Act 1971 and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, I move the sorry, are we on the so, no sir. As no amendments have been circulated, I now call the minister. I move the bill be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Immigration Education Act 1971 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day No. 9, Territories Legislation Amendment Bill 2020, Bankruptcy Estate Charges Amendment Norfolk Island Bill 2020. Minister. I move the bill, uh, I commend the bill to the Senate. Sorry. I uh, don't believe there's any amendments before the chair, so I'm going to move it. So the, so the question is: the motion, as moved by the minister, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So we're now on the second reading. Are you seeking the calls? So I'm calling the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the laws relating to territories and for related purposes, and a uh, the bankruptcy estate charges amendment, North Island Bill 2020. Minister. Amendments have been circulated. As no amendments have been circulated, <clears throat> I call the minister. I move the bill be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, I call the clerk. I'm just going to advise people it is now 6.30. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to territories and for related purposes. If you want Bankruptcy to. estate charges amendment, North Island Bill 2020. So. Oh. Okay. You're going to do? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Deputy President. Senators, the time allotted for debate on the bill has expired in accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier today. I will now put questions on the remaining stages of the bill and then put the questions on the remaining stages of other bills listed in the resolution. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. I'll give the clerk a minute. We're all <laughs> Bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. I will now deal with the Immigration Education Amendment Expanding Access to English Tuition Bill 2020. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion, sorry. So we'll, we have dealt with the other bills. I will now deal with the Health Insurance Amendment Compliance Administration Bill 2020. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973 and for related purposes. 
The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973 and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Uh, bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973 and for related purposes. Clerk. Business of the Senate, orders of the day number one. Motion for disallowance of the Industry Research and Development Forestry Recovery Development Fund Program Instrument 2020. Resumption of debate. Senator Rice. Look, as I was saying yesterday, this fund will be subsidising ongoing destructive native forest logging that is clearly recognised as being destructive by the federal court by government conservation regulator in Victoria, by the amazing scientists who have put in decades of research in these forests, just recognised as being destructive by First Nations peoples, by the communities who are living with seeing their precious forests being devastated and putting their bodies on the line to protect these forests. Brave, incredible community groups like Environment East Gippsland, the, um, the South Eastern Forest Alliance, Friends of Leadbeater's Possum, Nitty Nanas of Tulangi, Forest Conservation Victoria. This is what this fund would be doing. So look, I'm actually really pleased that this debate has continued across to today, because just this afternoon I received some answers back from some questions on notice that I asked at estimates in October. And what I asked was what proportion of the forest reserve system was burnt in last summer's fires. And the answer for the worst fire hit areas was really sobering. In East Gippsland, 71 per cent of the forest reserves were burnt. In South East New South Wales, 70 per cent of the forest reserves were burnt. In North Eastern Victoria, 67 per cent. And yet these are the very forest areas that this fund would be subsidising the further logging of. The forests where over two-thirds of the reserves were burnt, where there were massive deaths of precious wildlife, where every single bit of unlogged and unburnt forest that remains is incredibly precious. We would be spending $40 million of our taxpayers' funding to subsidise the ongoing logging of these incredibly precious bits of forest. This logging has got to stop rather than to be propped up by further subsidies, and the regional forest agreements that allow this logging must be scrapped. And look, I want to finish by noting that not only are our forests and wildlife that live in them in a desperate situation, not only have we got logging laws that are resulting in our wildlife hurtling towards extinction, not only do we have this slush fund that we're considering today that would prop up and subsidise native forest logging, but yesterday we saw Senator Mackenzie's bill that would make things even worse. Her bill would mean pretty much open slather to native forest logging. Her bill would completely exempt our logging from our national environment laws in order to overrule the federal court decision that found that logging in Victoria that impacted on critically endangered leadbeater's possums and threatened, threatened greater gliders was illegal. So when you find something that is illegal, they've been breaking the law, what do you do, according to Senator Mackenzie? You change the law. You don't fix it in order to protect these animals. No, you change the law. Senator Mackenzie's bill would be a licence for extinction and should be renamed the Killing Animals Bill. Look, instead of propping up a failing industry, we should be doing everything we can to be protecting our precious forests to acknowledge that we've now got almost 90 per cent of the logging industry is in plantations, to celebrate the plantation-based industry and to be shifting the remaining 10 per cent as quickly as possible out of our native forests, to protect our precious forests, to see them valued for their beauty, 
for recreation and tourism, for wildlife, for water and for carbon. If we really care about our forests and care about how they important are to us, to all Australians and, in fact, globally, we can start caring about and show that care by disallowing this fund today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you. Look, the hypocrisy is actually mind-boggling here today. Absolutely. The Greens, this, this is actually what they're arguing for. We have one of the most ultimately renewable industries in our sustainable Australian forestry industries employing over 200,000 Australians right across the country, $24 billion to our economy, a renewable and sustainable, well-managed, world-class industry. You so and you want to stop it. You want to stop it. You know why you want to stop it? Because the foresters in our regional communities do not vote for you because you want to um, ensure that they and their family have no future. This illogical disallowance motion only reinforces what rural and regional Australia already knows. The Greens are anti-agriculture, you're anti-farming, you're anti-forestry. They've forgotten one in my speech. You're also anti-fishing, aren't you? Oh, yes, yes. Let us not actually harvest the bounty of the sea in a sustainably managed way. Sustainably managed. It's not about raping and pillaging. It's actually about using science and data to set up a regime where we manage these resources appropriately for the benefit not only of the people that work in these industries, but the regional communities that support them and, indeed, the world. The hypocrisy is mind-boggling again because the Greens are in here arguing to shut down our sustainable forestry industry every chance they get. So what? Where will we get our uh, timber products from? Where will we get them from? Will we get them from other countries who do not have the environmental regulation that our industries rightfully are governed by? I mean, to get up in this place time and time again and assume that on either, either party of government is actually not really interested not really interested in ensuring good environmental outcomes for our forestry industry is an absolute misrepresentation of the truth. So you know what happens if you don't use uh, the highly regulated Australian timber products? Where do we get them from? It's a bit like saying, let don't eat beef because it's bad for the environment. Where do you think people will get their protein sources from? Other countries where we're chop you know, rainforests being denigrated, uh, orangutans are threatened species to actually have land clearing laws in those countries to ensure that they can grow uh, protein through beef farming, when here in our country we do it in a sustainable and environmentally um, uh, responsible manner. So instead of knocking Australians and their hard work, knocking these industries and communities, you should be standing up and saying, thank God I live in Australia and I'm very proud of our forestry industry. Thank you. Uh, but, and our forestry industry, I had a few of them up yesterday for my private uh, members' bill that I'm glad the senator mentioned in her contribution, which seeks to amend the EPBC Act to remove the ambiguity and ensure that the relationship and arrangement between state and Commonwealth governments for the last 20 years through regional forestry agreements is not actually being able to be overridden by activist justices that just ignore, that just ignore the regulatory framework of any given state. So I had foresters from Eden, I had foresters from Gippsland, big shout out to Hayfield and Bairnsdale, McNulty's um, in Benalla as well because they care about their children's future. I always hear about, why don't you care about your children's future? I actually do care about my children's future. And I am the daughter of, it's funny you say that. I'll tell you what my background of my family is. My dad was a blue singleted worker, a logger, in a little country town called Marysville. His first job was driving a Bedford truck up and down very, very dangerous roads. Uh, in very, very difficult circumstances. And so I care 
about my children's future. I care about the communities I represent's future, and that means backing in a sustainable and renewable uh, industry such as the Australian forestry industry. And we were very, very. One of the things that these foresters talked to me about uh, yesterday was how tough they'd done it in the bushfires. That it was actually these forestry workers who risked life and limb in actually fighting the fires. They knew the tracks better than uh, some of the fire crews that had been brought in from city areas or from other districts. They knew those forests like the back of their hand. And the forestry industry is not just about uh, producing this world-class fibre uh, and timber products, but it is also about managing our natural resource appropriately, making sure that we do have tracks throughout the um, out throughout our forest, uh, forest areas uh, and making sure they're upgraded so that when we do have a bushfire event we can access those more remote areas easily. And it's the forestry industry uh, that undertakes that task. Um, our government is very, very proud to help rebuild this industry post bushfires um, and the regional communities that rely on it. We don't back away from supporting workers at all. We don't care if you're a worker uh, in a small business. Uh, we don't discriminate against workers. We don't say some workers are more deserving of support than others. And in some of these industries where it is hard manual labour, such as the forestry industry, we very proudly stand with them and ensure that the, the devastation that was wrought on the forest industry, particularly in New South Wales and Victoria, but South Australia, I know, uh, their industry as well was hard hit by the bushfire have the support they need to rebuild and to continue to employ people in this sustainable industry. And we're doing this by providing $65 million in targeted support. The government has established the $40 million Forestry Recovery Development Fund program, and this provides grants of up to $5 million to support processes address future wood supply shortages through innovation and product diversification. One of the uh, great timber product manufacturers that I got a chance to meet with yesterday was a company called Ash. They operate out of Hayfield. And in terms of advanced manufacturing, you could not get better than this particular company. The technology that they've implemented down in Hayfield has meant that they use every single part of a harvested tree, which is fantastic news because we don't want to waste this very precious resource. Uh, we want to be very um, diligent in how we use it. And Ash's um, implementation of this uh, really super advanced technology means that um, they're not only providing hundreds of jobs in the local community, but they're also producing a great product that Australians can use to make kitchens, etc., and not source timber from overseas, which may not as be, uh, not uh, have been uh, as sustainably uh, produced as it is here in Australia. We're providing $15 million for salvage log transport assistance to help Australia's sustainable forestry industries in their immediate recovery from bushfires. One of the greatest frustrations from these foresters uh, that I heard at the time of the bushfire uh, was state governments, particularly in my home state of Victoria, um, not allowing the forest industry to actually salvage the logs uh, that had been cut down as a result of the bushfire. They're just to be left uh, on the forest floor to potentially become uh, undergrowth and um, fuel load for the next uh, bushfire season, which is absolutely uh, abominable. These, this, these foresters that came to see me yesterday were just in shock that city bureaucrats and Labor Party apparatchiks were making decisions about their communities, putting their communities uh, at risk because they couldn't salvage the log, Senator Rice, that were already gone through the bushfire, that were a danger. So uh, we had people coming along with chainsaws to clear it so it was actually safe to move through a community. And rather than letting this industry, that's been so devastated because the resource has been uh, obviously burnt, to actually use that log and to do what they could with it to make a, a sustainable product, um, again, Decisions made outside a community, not having no understanding of how we live and work out there, just uh, beg a belief and cause a whole lot of frustration and probably explain, Senator Rice, why your vote in places like Hayfield uh, is as it is. We're also providing $10 million for the Salvage Log Storage Fund to establish storage facilities for fire-affected salvage logs 
during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I call on state governments who have halted uh, the ability of the foresters to uh, collect and use the salvage log. We're providing the money for storage. We're also providing the money for transport. But we've got to be allowed to actually get the things off the ground. Right? Got to allow them to get them off the ground. So, Jacqueline Symes, um, I hope you're listening tonight. This support keeps mills uh, operational, people employed, and ensures Australia can enjoy sustainably grown Australian wood products rather than what the Greens would like, which, which is unsustainably uh, produced timber products. Uh, they actually would prefer to use. And for Australians who may not be able to afford um, the types of timber products that they can in their suburbs that they represent, but to the average Australian uh, in suburbs right across our capital cities, they are very proud of the richness of our timber product. And I think uh, they should be able to have their kitchens in it, uh, build their houses with it, um, have some great decking rather than using unsustainably produced uh, timber. Every tree that is harvested as part of native timber harvesting in Victoria is regrown is regrown because you know what happens you actually you actually plant a tree and uh, over time it grows again right and so so something that my father did that uh, some of the senators over here actually deride as if you know he was some you know rich guy just uh, doling out the money one of the things my father did after he and his crew went through and uh, harvested the timber for places like um, Mount Buffalo, they then went through in the 60s, late mid 60s, and uh, replanted everything. And so you know what? Those trees. I'm about 50. I am 50. So they're 50 years old now, just ready to harvest. Fantastic, fantastic. Sorry, what was that, Senator? Oh, I'll Order. take that interjection, Mr. Order. President. Oh, Merry it Christmas, Christmas, Senator season. Gallagher. Merry Christmas to you too. Um, Radio. So, <laughs> uh, the sustainable industry supports thousands of rural and regional jobs and businesses, like the ANC Forestry Group in Morwell. The ANC is dedicated to the Gippsland region, and they provide long-term employment for many workers, from truck drivers and machine operators to mechanics and administration staff. ANZ and many others in the forest industry have worked hard to keep their community employed and engaged during these tough times. And our government has been prepared to stand with them, to actually give them the real and practical support targeted uh, to those communities, those forestry communities impacted by the bushfires. And so I think being part of our uh, broader COVID response has been so responsive uh, in these difficult times and has actually responded to each and every industry in a different, unique and targeted way, uh, which has meant we've actually relative to the rest of the world uh, in, in a very good position. This is an industry, as I said, that contributes around $24 billion of economic turnover to our economy each and every year. And we've got hundreds of thousands of jobs uh, in the broader supply chain. 80,000 people are in the industry value chain. Now, we roll these numbers off our tongues as if uh, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Do you know what they are, Senator? They're actual people feeding their families in a sustainable industry, paying mortgages, educating their kids, playing sport on the weekend, uh, volunteering at their local sporting clubs that ho are hopefully— Order. And you know what? There's 80,000 of them in the industry value chain. And the fact that you stand up here and do not care about them, their children's future, I think is an indictment on each and every one of you. Every year, the Australian forestry industry plants around 70 million trees. To guess what? In 50 years, so we can harvest them, and then we can plant them again, and again, and again, and again, because that's what actually a renewable resource is all about. And this is, and the forestry industry is the ultimate renewable uh, industry. That's equivalent to 136,000 football fields, but. I do love my sporting analogies, Mr President. That is more than two seedlings for each and every Australian every year. And the Greens political party, as Senator Macdonald used to call them, uh, the Greens political party wants to shut this down. In August, the Greens and the Labor Party showed their contempt for rural and regional Victorian families in their pathetic failed attempt to shut down Victoria's sustainable timber industry. 
ending native harvesting in Victoria, as the Andrews Victorian government announced on November 2019, is a devastating decision for regional communities. It means job losses, mill closures and negative impacts on regional communities in towns like Orbost and Hayfield, Benalla and Corriong and many, many more. Seven mill owners across Victoria were so concerned by the Andrews Labor government that they formed the Victorian Hardwood Sawmillers Association and, led by Leonard Fenning, uh, who operates Fenning Timber in Bairnsdale, they are focused on promoting the economic benefits of their industries. Group lo groups like AFPA. Order, Senator Mackenzie. Time has expired. Senator Dunningham. And I want to commend Senator uh, Mackenzie on that wonderful contribution from the heart about a great industry on this matter, uh, the disallowance we're discussing, with regard to um, the forest industry and vital support that is needed to actually help an industry uh, that has been hit many times over by significant events. At a time when we are trying to reopen the economy and get people back to work and support regional economies in particular, we have a disallowance trying to pull the rug out from underneath an industry that needs this support. And I'll come to the mischaracterisation of the program. Uh, Senator Rice uh, conflated issues terribly around what the funding in this program would do. Uh, most of what Senator Rice said had nothing to do with this program. It had nothing to do with uh, the way it's been painted in that contribution. In fact, it will go to do a lot of the things that I'm pretty sure Senator Rice, who is a supporter of parts of the forest industry, I'm pleased to acknowledge, the plantation industry, but also the value-add industry in this country. Uh, instead of shipping jobs offshore, we can keep them in regional communities to turn these raw products, these beautiful, sustainably managed raw products, timber products, the fibre that we get from these trees, into wonderful products in this country. That's what this program goes to. But let's look at the history leading up to the need to provide this support. At the beginning of the year, the, uh, the bushfires that hit many parts of our nation uh, had a huge impact on our forest industry. And we're still coming to terms with the actual uh, uh, gravity of the impact felt by this industry. We're still seeking to understand exactly how much of the forest resource was burnt in those bushfires across New South Wales, Victoria, and Kangaroo Island in South Australia. Uh, and in order to properly support the industry, we do need that data. But the fact is we lost a significant amount of resource. So for industry to be able to continue on, to be able to do what it does, to provide jobs in regional communities in a sustainable way, we need to do more with less. There is less timber there to use. And so we have to find ways to support industry to be able to get as much out of that resource as it possibly can. On top of that, COVID, which has had an impact on freight and logistics chains, uh, it's had uh, an impact, of course, on the consumption of these products, hence the need for programs like Home Builder to stimulate uh, home building across the nation. Uh, the impact of the downturn in housing starts, as was predicted before Home Builder was announced, would have had devastating impacts on uh, the timber industry and those th right throughout the supply chain. Uh, and so we need to make sure that they can keep up with demand for this wonderful material uh, when uh, being able to support the housing and construction sector. Again, uh, we only have to look at more recent issues post-COVID, so bushfires COVID. Now, of course, we have issues with regard to exports. Uh, and this is why we need this program, because far from propping up an ailing industry, far from having anything to do with the points of the industry that Senator Rice uh, pointed to and highlighted as what this funding would go to. This is about actually helping this industry innovate to improve its practices, to improve the technology available to it, to be able to get more out of less, to actually not have as much waste, to be able to go and produce new products that new markets might wish to access. That's what we want to do. And Senator Rice says, if only. Well, that is the case. That's what this program is all about. And you know what? We want these regional communities uh, like Northwest Coast Tasmania one day, hopefully through future rounds of programs like this, and I hope there will be many more, to be able to innovate and augment their processes so those hardworking men and women in regional communities will be able to actually use this resource in a better way. I don't know how many timber mills Senator Rice has been through in recent times, 
But I tell you what, there are some amazing advancements in technology uh, when it comes to some of these operations. And what we want to do is take them to the next level so we can compete with other advanced wood processing countries around the world. Senator McKenzie made a fantastic point around what happens when we shut down uh, or at attempt to damage our timber industry here in Australia, one of the best in the world, contrary to the assertions of some of those people down the end there. Uh, we source it from elsewhere. And I suppose this is a good opportunity to point out what we in the Australian government have been doing when it comes to clamping down on illegal logging and the sale of illegally harvested timber products. Recently, we were able to do a series of DNA tests on timber being sold in Australian retail outlets. A number of the pieces of timber being imported from other countries, uh, labelled as certain types of timber, wasn't that timber at all. And so this is what happens when Greens policy comes to the fore. Their major retail outlet uh, in Australia has decided it won't use timber sourced from Victoria because of claims around certain operations, a court case which is under appeal. As Senator Rice well knows, it doesn't mean it's final when it's under appeal. It's actually something uh, being questioned as we speak. And I'm very confident about the outcome of that case, just like I am about the Bob Brown Foundation's case in Tasmania. And I acknowledge Senator Ciccone, who's a massive supporter of the timber industry, the best one in the world. The fact is, though, when we drive this industry uh, offshore, we end up seeing products ripped out of the ground, true deforestation, and consumers here, who still want the products that come out of our forests, don't know where it's coming from. It's not coming from sustainably well-managed forests here in Australia that are replanted, reforested. They come from forests of South America, West Papua, and uh, Senator Rice shakes her head as if it doesn't matter because it's not in our backyard. We don't care. Well, I tell you what, that is a shameful attitude to take because not only are you driving uh, deforestation in other nations, you're driving up unemployment when you damage this sustainable, proud industry. The campaigns that are run, and I often say this, they've moved from the forestry coop to the courtroom with their battles now. It's their new high-tech way of trying to damage a very, very good and proud industry, something that I think they should be ashamed of. Yes, because as Senator Ciccone says, it is about jobs in regional communities. It is about being able to provide for these communities and ensure that they can send their kids to school and put food on the table, pay the mortgage and keep the lights on. But Senator Rice, with her disallowance here, wants us to find any way to penalise this industry. It's not enough that they were hit with the bushfires. And we want to help them get more from less. We want them to be able to get more resource out of the timber that remains in the reserves that they have access to. It's not enough that they've been hit by COVID. It's not enough that we have export issues at the moment. And we want to do as much as we can to value add here, not send our raw product overseas, value add here. Well, Senator Rice says, if only once again, well, my door is always open. Pop on in. Let's talk about a constructive plan to grow this industry. If you're a supporter like you say you are for the 90-odd per cent of the industry, then come on down with a plan to grow the industry, not shut it down, not talk it down, not damage the brand. Senator Rice, my door remains open every day of the week I'm here. Come and see me in Tassie. Let's go and do a tour. Let's go and have a look at the Hayfield Mill. Let's go and actually talk to the people you are denigrating through this motion, claiming that we are propping up an ailing industry. It's an industry that those who work in it should be very, very proud of. And so I do, uh, while uh, imploring colleagues here to vote against this disallowance, I implore Senator Rice to come and work with me. Come and work with Senator Urquhart and Senator Giacconi, Senator Scar, Senator Molan, who I spent last Friday with uh, talking to bushfire-affected communities and all of my colleagues here work with us who are pro-forestry, who actually deal in science. And, you know, contrary to the fact—well, let's talk about science as well while we're on this matter—it was asserted a couple of Senate estimates ago that 20 per cent of all of the forests in uh, Australia had burnt in those bushfires. Well, in fact, as we know, Senator Rice, 20 per cent of a certain uh, biome was affected, not the entire forest estate. And it's dangerous assertions like that. Uh, prefaced with the words, we know. We know X happened. 
And I've seen the Greens in this parliament do it all the time. They speak with authority, claiming something to be true, and there could be a kernel of truth in there, but you know, you get to the end of the sentence and there's a little asterisk. Terms and conditions apply. Don't dig too deep. You know, and we only have to look at the science that was uh, claimed to be uh, proof positive that forestry operations in this country uh, uh, increase the risk of and severity of bushfires. Well, of course, as we know, uh, that paper uh, from uh, some scientists in Tasmania was withdrawn because it was found to be riddled with errors. And this is the thing. Let's talk in facts. Let's talk science. Come and talk to the people who are in the industry, who are proud of the brand they have. Primary producers, Senator uh, Mackenzie mentioned a whole heap of them, they rely on a good brand. They don't want to trash it. You guys are doing a good enough job of that by peddling falsehoods, propping up an ailing industry. We are one of the best in the world. And as I say, yeah. come on out to the yeah. country communities that actually support what we do. The timber in this chamber did not fall out of the sky, Senator Rice, through you, Mr President. It was harvested sustainably. And I reckon, because the forests are still there in response to Senator uh, Seward's question, decimated. Anyway, look, why am I engaging with people that are not going to listen to reason at all? Uh, they have no idea when it comes to sustainable, well-managed, world-leading forests head in the sand approach to what is the world's best forest industry, do everything they can. Uh, let's uh, remember a, a former member of the Tasmanian parliament, Peg Putt, who made a full-time career out of travelling into foreign markets to damage the brand of a sustainable industry. To go around, and I think the organisation was called Markets for Change, well, you know what they were changing from sustainable well-managed forest resources and estates where science underpins what we do to markets where they rip trees out of the ground and don't replant them. And in fact, Senator Rice, on the uh, issue of invitations, while I'm uh, trying to convince my colleagues that this is one of the worst disallowances that's ever come across the table in this chamber, uh, I'd love for you to come down the uh, Arve River with me. There's a coop down there that a group called Environment Tasmania had uh, custody of. They were given funds by the taxpayers of Australia to reforest uh, this particular coop. It's in the heart of World Heritage Wilderness. It's barren because they believe that the practices the forest industry put in place are wrong. You go to the forestry coop next door that Sustainable Timbers Tasmania, formerly Forestry Tasmania, and contractors managed you wouldn't know it was ever harvested. But come down and see what ET, Environment Tasmania, these bleeding heart, anti-job people did to this piece of land. It is barren. There is erosion. You wouldn't know. Well, look, come on down to my office after this and we'll look at Google Earth and you can see what your friends have done. You don't care about the environment. You certainly don't care about jobs in regional communities from downtown Melbourne. So please accept my invitation. You too, Senator. Anyone, come on into my office and we'll look at Google Earth together. Vote against this ridiculous disallowance. Support hard-working men and women in this industry and reopen our economy when we need it most. Stop the madness. The question is, the disallowance motion moved by Senator Rice be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is the disallowance motion moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 39. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, before we move on to the discovery of formal business, Senator Urquhart was going to seek leave. Senator Urquhart. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the leave of absence. Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Farrell for Thursday, today, the 10th of December 2020, for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll now move to the discovery of formal business. <laughs> and I'll commence with motion number 939, Senator Rice. That's all right. Thanks, Mr. Mr. President. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number 939, standing in my name for today, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rice. I move that the following bill be introduced. A, a bill to amend for an act to amend the COAG Reform Act 2008 and for related purposes. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rice. Present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the COAG Reform Fund Act 2008 and for related purposes. Senator Rice. That this bill now be read a second time and I seek, to leave, uh, seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Rice. I table an, an, an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my is remarks. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Rice. I should have mentioned that government, government business matter number one, I understand, is spent. We will not be dealing with that. So I come to matter number 947 in the name of Senator McMahon. I seek leave to amend general business notice motion number 947 before asking that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McMahon. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and ask that the amended motion be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator McMahon. I move the motion as amended. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. We come to 948. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 948 relating to the 2020 holiday season 
be taken as formal. And I'd like to add the name of Senator Davey to that. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Van. Uh, I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come to matter number 954, Senator O'Neill and others? So 954 I've got. Senator O'Neill. Thank you. I ask the general notice of uh, notice of motion number 954 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator O'Neill. Thank you. You move the motion? I, I move the Thank motion. Thank you. Sorry, your microphone wasn't working. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. The Morrison-McCormick government is committed to the Basin Plan. The government has done the heavy lifting and we've recovered 98 per cent of the water required to meet the SDLs. The reports uh, identify that it is Basin communities that have borne the brunt of this achievement. They clearly show that a flexible approach is needed to continue progress, and that is why we have committed to no more buybacks from farmers. We are unashamedly committed to Basin communities uh, and the irrigated agriculture that supports them. Our policies, including the $270 million Murray-Darling Communities Investment Package, are focused on delivery. But thanks. Uh, Senator Urquhart seeking leave. If I could just clarify that Senator O'Neill moved that on behalf of Senator Mariel Smith. Oh, thank you. Thank okay. you. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can I come to now 952? I understand Senator Hanson is not present. If it's not present, then we won't. No one will move that motion. That will lapse. Um, I'll come to motion number 946 in the name of Senator Sheldon. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 946 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government does not support this motion. ABS data confirms that the biggest increase on record to the rate of casual employment in, in, uh, occurred under the Hawke and Keating governments with the level then remaining steady thereafter for more than 20 years leading into the COVID pandemic. Incentivising the growth of stable permanent jobs and higher incomes are two of the key goals of the Fair Work Amendment, supporting jobs, supporting jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2020. The 946, Senator yes. Dunham, on the Select Committee. Yep. That's not what I've got. Okay. Can we go move to another motion? All right. I'll, what I'll do is, can we? I well, leave I the chamber to move to the next matter. 949, in the name of Senator Canavan and several others. Senator Canavan. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 949 relating to restrictions on church attendance at Christmas services be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Canavan. I move the motion standing in my name in the names of Senators Antich, Toker, Mackenzie, Firavanti, Wells, Van, McDonald, Abetz, McGrath, McMahon, Molan, Patterson, Davy, Scar, O'Sullivan, Askew, Rennick, Small, Brockman, Hughes, McLaughlin, Chandler, Bragg, Henderson, Smith, and I also add, the, add Senator Scott Ryan to this motion. Thank you. The question, Senator O'Neill. Um, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Um, Labor supports most of Motion 949 in principle, but will not support the government on its call in Part B for state and territory governments to ignore the advice of health professionals. That's why we have asked the president to call for a separate vote okay. on Part A and Part B this evening. Labor wholeheartedly supports the freedom to manifest one's religious views. Indeed, it's a fundamental right for all. Australia is a pluralist democracy. Christmas is an important religious event for people of faith and people of no faith alike. It's a season that stretches out across the entire population and calls us to gather with family and friends to give thanks for the many blessings of each year and to share reflections of the year past in the season of peace, hope and love. Many Australians will be keen to attend religious services. The first night of Hanukkah will be celebrated tonight. On the 25th of December, and for those of the Orthodox traditions who will celebrate Christmas twice by gathering again on the 7th of January, we urge all states and territory governments to support the largest safe religious gatherings possible in line with health advice in that jurisdiction. Part B, however, we cannot support as it will force state Order, and territory governments Senator to ignore health advice. So I will separate then at your request clause A and clause B, paragraph A and paragraph B of that motion. 
question is that paragraph A, including all the Roman numerals of motion 949, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that paragraph B of that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. In lieu of a division, could we have it recorded that the opposition does not um, support section B? I, Senator Seward. Could you have the Greens recorded as opposing? So recorded, that and component? I appreciate the spirit of Christmas shown by people doing that. Now, I'll quickly run back to 946 if that's been resolved. Um, the question I'm going to put 946, it has already been moved, and I understand the resolutions, that there's been a resolution. So the question now is. That, that motion 946 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could we go to 950 in the name of Senators Rice and Waters? Senator Rice. President, I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 950 before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Rice. Great. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber. I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rice. I move the motion as amended. Senator Dunham. Uh, can I ask leave to make a short statement? Leave is granted for one minute. The official correspondence between heads of government and cabinet ministers remain confidential as they occur and for a period of time afterwards to ensure discussions can be candid and a trust can be built. The question is the motion moved by Senators Rice and Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 950 is amended be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Ciccone, tell for the ayes, and Senator Smith, tell for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, we have two more matters. Please remain in the chamber. I'll be ringing the bells for one minute. The question is uh, now we're going to matter 951 in the name of Senator Watt. And Senator Urquhart will move that. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 951 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government's policy is that past overachievement should be recognised. It was the Labor Party that made carryover a condition of Australia signing up to the second period of the Kyoto Protocol. It was under this coalition government that Australia beat its 2020 target by 459 million tonnes. Question is motion number 951 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The final matter, senators. The final formal motion is matter 955 in the name of Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I inform the chamber that Senator Billick will also sponsor the motion, and I also. Ask that general business notice of motion number 955 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator O'Neill. I move the motion. Question is Senator Dunningham. To make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Safe Work Australia's members, which included the ACTU, decided in March of this year that they did not want Safe Work Australia to progress any non-COVID-19 related work. The Attorney General wrote to ministers to restart the process for discussing the review of model work health and safety laws in the second half of 2020. The ACT and Northern Territory uh, governments requested a further deferral due to caretaker periods. The government will be considering its ultimate position on the issues raised in this motion as part of the SWA process, which it is required to do. It should be noted that workplace fatalities have decreased by almost 53 per cent from a peak of three fatalities per 100,000 workers in 2007. Senator Faruqi. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. The Greens support this motion. We have long called for federal laws on industrial manslaughter. Our workplace health and safety laws are broken. Employers who do not ensure their workplaces are safe must be held to account, and there must be strong deterrence for cutting corners on safety. Action on the recommendations of the reports on industrial deaths should have already been implemented. The government has clearly deprioritized this. The families and loved ones of hundreds of people who have died at work since 2018 deserve to see justice. These workers should not have lost their lives in the first place. They deserve to see the government take action to make sure that going to work means coming home from work safe and sound. Everyone has the right to a safe workplace. The question is the motion moved by Senator O'Neill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. 
Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Four minutes. Well, I did ask senators to remain in the chamber. The spirit of Christmas. Oh, I'll pass it. Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator O'Neill be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Ciccone, tell off the ayes, and Senator Smith, tell off the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 34. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, that concludes the final discovery of formal business. I will say we may have divisions. Um, we will now go on to ministerial statements. Are there, oh, Senator Rustin, you'd like to call first. Senator Rustin. I just seek leave to, uh, to make a short statement to the House. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I just wish, as a matter of courtesy, to inform the House that we are still awaiting a message from the other place uh, that needs to be dealt with uh, by the Senate. I believe that the matter has, of uh, the matter that is the subject of the message, has been dealt with in the other place, and hopefully we'll arrive in this place very soon. Uh, I thank the Senate for its indulgence. Senator Wong. Make a statement. Leave is granted. Senator Wong. I thank the Senate well. What has just been indicated to us, fellow senators, is the pettiness of the Prime Minister, who is demanding this Senate stay for an amendment that the Minister indicated very clearly was acceptable to the government. That is what he's saying. So I want every coalition senator to understand and every member of the crossbench to understand that we are waiting because the Prime Minister doesn't want to have a loss. That's what this is about. The amendment that was moved that the Minister indicated was acceptable, was acceptable is an amendment which simply enables the situation which currently exists to continue, which is to enable the Minister to have a discretion to continue paying the coronavirus supplement. But this Prime Minister is so determined to take from those who have so little that he doesn't even want her to have the discretion. Change. The amendment itself doesn't require the supplement to be paid. It simply continues the power that the minister currently has. A sensible, man, a sensible government, a competent government, a government who didn't want to blame others but actually wanted to deliver for Australians would say, OK, well, we lost that, but you know what? That's OK, because we don't have to do anything. It makes no practical difference. And to be fair to the minister, I accept that she gave me that indication in good faith, because she is right. It is acceptable. But you know, the bloke over there, the bloke over Order. there— Senator Wong, if we're referring Sorry. to the, the Prime Minister— The, prime, the man who is supposed to be the Prime Minister of the country and care about the nation doesn't want a loss. So we all have to stay because he doesn't want a loss on a, on a, on a power which this minister already has. So we will debate this when this comes to that, but I just want to be clear. At a time when Australians have had the year that we have had, when working Australians and those who have lost their jobs have had the hardest year one can imagine, where this parliament has at times come together to support Australians in this pandemic, the pettiness of this Prime Minister is on display as we lead into Christmas. We'll now move uh, on. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Dunningham? Thanks, Mr President. I present four documents as follows. A ministerial statement on behalf of the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management uh, relating to the Natural Disaster Risk Reduction Framework. A response to the order of continuing effect relating to Australia's estimated future greenhouse gas emissions. A response to the order for the production of documents concerning the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's election coverage. And a response to a question taken on notice during question time on 8 December 2020, asked by Senator Kitching relating to pensions and benefits. I seek leave to have the response to the question taken on notice incorporated in Hansard. Senators, with respect to the document that was tabled, about the ABC, I'd just like to make a brief statement. In that letter, in that package of documents, is a letter to me from the chair of the ABC, which is included with a letter from the government. Um, I will be writing to the chair of the ABC because the letter, as you will see if you read it, asks me to exercise a power or consider the exercise of a power I do not have, and that is the non-public tabling of a document. So I don't know how that came about. My office was not consulted. Um, the order for production of documents was directed at the government, but a document was forwarded to me requesting me that I table it in confidence, and I don't have that power. So I'll be writing to the chair of the ABC to explain that, uh, but I don't have any role in the tabling of a document in response to the order for a production of documents. So I just wanted to put that on the record, given the letter does contain that request of me as president. Now we'll go to 20—sorry, Senator Davey. 
opportunity to take note of ministerial statements? Yes. Uh, you are moving to take note of? Uh, the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework. Go, Senator Davey. Um, thank you. Look, this is a really important um, document that has been tabled here before us today. Um, the, the coalition government has um, implemented the first, for the first time in our history the National Disaster Risk, Risk Reduction Framework. I wish we had found an easier name to pronounce, however, um, which provides a guide to national action to ex address existing disaster risks and or also to look into the future. Um, we learnt many, many lessons from last year's catastrophic summer of bushfires. Um, and one of the things uh, we did learn and understand is that as a nation we need to get better at coordination. We need to work cooperatively with the states to be prepared to have an eye on the future and also to learn from the mistakes of the past. Our national partnership agreement on disaster and risk reduction has agreed to invest $261 million over five years for these risk reduction initiatives. But one thing that I am particularly proud of in this framework that I think is so vitally important, what we did learn from last summer's bushfires was how de dependent we are on our emergency services, on our paid emergency services, but more importantly on the volunteers and the charities and the not-for-profit organisations that come together to assist those paid personnel and then to support the communities in their recovery activities. And, um, for, for the first time, we are truly recognising those organisations, but we're also focusing a lens on their mental health and their wellbeing, because these people put themselves out there on the front line, and I don't care if you're an SES volunteer, a rural fire service volunteer or a Red Cross volunteer pouring tea and being the support person at the end of a really tough day for, for the other personnel. But you feel what you're going through and you're working day to day and you are seeing the ravages of the emergency on your friends, on your colleagues and, most importantly, on your community. Last year, um, just after the bushfires, I travelled around the state of New South Wales and went to many bushfire-affected communities. Um, I went down to Malua Bay and I spoke with the volunteers that were coordinating efforts uh, to provide people with the day-to-day -day essentials, people who'd lost everything. I went to Cabago and I met this amazing woman who was coordinating uh, recovery efforts for stock. She was coordinating from all over the state to get stock feed in and then distributing it on a triage basis to those who needed it most. Um, and her efforts should be absolutely commended. I went to Ralston and I met with um, personnel from Indonesia who would come over from the Indonesian Defence Force to help our efforts in our bushfire recovery. And I travelled to Wagga and I met our own Defence Force personnel and I met evacuees who had been rehomed temporarily at our RAF base in Wagga um, and they said that the, the RAF personnel were their, their, flying, their blue angels. They were really uh, spoke so highly. But what, what I saw was that these people put themselves out there. They weren't thinking of themselves, they were thinking of their community. But in the wash-up of all of this, we need to think of those people, and we need to think how they're doing in that wash-up, because during that time they absorbed all of the anguish of their communities, and now it's time for us to help them. So for the first time ever, and I'm so proud of our government and of the Nationals for working hard to invest over $15.9 million to support the mental health of emergency services and workers and their families. We're doing this by providing $11.5 million to the Black Dog Institute and to Fortum Australia so that they can provide specialist mental health support services for those who responded to the 2019-20 bushfires and support for their families. 
We're also developing the first ever mental health national action plan for emergency services workers so that we can work to reduce suicide and mental illness among these vital personnel and the people who put themselves first when we're in times of need. But further to that, our framework is also looking at critical incident planning capability so that next time we are better prepared and we can effectively respond to these critical incidents. And that's not just bushfire, that's flood uh, and that's other catastrophes, cyclones in Queensland. We need to better understand and build resilience within it our, and develop our critical systems so that our first responders are better prepared and better able to hit the ground running. We're also investing in a number of management capabilities um, to assist in this. We are putting $88.1 million towards disaster and resi resilience research. This is vital money. This is going to research not only uh, what causes catastrophe, but also how is the best way to address those capacities. We're also investing in um, streamlining our fire danger rating system because at the moment, from state to state, we all use different terminology, different rating systems. We need to get better as, at working together as a nation. If we've learnt anything through COVID, it is that we are one nation. Borders, when they crop up and they, they become hard borders, they make life incredibly hard. But when you don't have something like a pandemic that you want to be able to shut, when you've got something like a bushfire that doesn't care a toss about a line on a map or about you know, where a river flows, that bushfire is going regardless. And it is so important for us to have the same language because we've got responders doing the same job. So we need the same language. And that's vitally important that we get that right. The National Coordination Mechanism and Emergency Management Australia are also leaning into a number of substantial challenges as we collectively face uh, across this nation. And we're doing so, but what, what we're also doing, and this is really important in the current environment, is we are now incorporating COVID safe guidelines. And this is something we don't think of when we talk emergencies in Australia. Last bushfire season, People were evacuated. They went to the school hall. They're all crammed into that building. The Red Cross came along, served them tea. Salvation Army bought them food. It was fantastic. Imagine if that happened right now in the, in the time of the pandemic. We're already working on developing how we adjust our response to ensure that, uh, that we can do so in a COVID safe way. We, to ensure that we have the hand sanitizer, to ensure that we've got enough space between people, but importantly, to ensure that those people are safe from the emergency and safe from COVID. So we are learning all the time. This is not a silver bullet. And this framework is an ongoing living document, which is so important because we know as technology gets better, as, our nat da uh, as, as, our, as we get more data, as our knowledge gets better, we are going to improve how we respond to emergencies. This government is working really hard to make sure we are at, on the front foot and ready to go, ready to adapt. Um, but I really commend this framework and the report on it to the chamber, encourage you all to read it, and please, as we go into summer and we go off for our, our summer holidays, remember to be bushfire ready. Have your, if you live in a regional area like myself, have your bushfire plan ready. Clear your gutters out, get your hoses ready, be prepared because it's really important. If you're not safe, you're not going to be around to help your neighbours. So uh, I commend the framework to the chamber. I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a very safe, bushfire-ready, flood-ready uh, season. Thank you. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I, must, I, I also would like to take note of the ministerial statement regarding the National Disaster 
risk reduction framework. Uh, and I must respond to some of the things that my friend uh, Senator Davey has said uh, today. She's done a valiant, made a valiant effort to put her party and her minister's position on natural disasters and our preparedness for them. Uh, but I am afraid that there are some pretty important points that she missed in that statement, which do need to be put on the record. Uh, we found out only yesterday evening that Minister Littleproud was intending to make this ministerial statement in the House about the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework. And it can only be interpreted as another desperate attempt from this minister to try to distract attention from his and his government's failure to prepare for the coming disaster season. Uh, I have been on the record now for months, as has the Labor leader, Mr Albanese, and many other members of the Labor team, uh, warning this government about the weather conditions we face this summer and our lack of preparedness for them. Now, we're not doing that out of some political manoeuvre. What we're actually doing is bringing to the government's attention a number of reports and pieces of advice that have now been given to this very government over the last few months about what we're facing this year. The warnings from the Bureau of Meteorology, among other groups, the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC, for instance, <laughs> could not be clearer that this summer we face above average bushfire risk in parts of Western Australia, particularly in the southwest, uh, and also in Western New South Wales. And if we need any reminder that we need to take these warnings seriously, just have a look at what's happening on Fraser Island in my home state of Queensland right now, where we see almost half of the World Heritage listed forest destroyed by bushfire. Uh, and this is before we get to the height of the disaster season in our country. So we know from these warnings that we face bushfire danger in a large proportion of the country this year. Uh, but potentially even more concerning is that due to the La Nina conditions which we're seeing come in, we face very serious and above normal risks of cyclones and floods, particularly in North Queensland and other northern parts of the country, but with floods spreading basically right down the east coast. These are serious warnings. And we remember the Prime Minister received similar serious warnings last year about the kind of fires that were likely to occur in so much of the country, and that's exactly what happened. So you really would have thought that after last year, with the devastation that we saw, the loss of life that we saw, the loss of property, loss of species, loss of forests that we saw, and the huge embarrassment and humiliation to this Prime Minister when it was demonstrated that he just didn't prepare and take these warnings seriously, you would have thought that we'd be facing something different this year. But we're not. And what the minister has attempted to do in this ministerial statement that he's delivered today is to say it's all OK. Um, forget about what Labor is saying, because we've got this National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework, which shows that the government is taking natural disasters seriously and is investing to protect Australians. Well, let's have a look at what's actually happened through this Natural Disaster Risk Reduction Framework, because we all know too well that we can't take at face value statements that ministers in this government or the Prime Minister make about what they claim to be doing, because we know that what they do is they make an announcement, they make a statement. It never actually happens. When you dig into it just a little bit, it crumbles, and it's exactly the same here. The Natural Disaster Risk Reduction Framework was announced by this government in 2018, two years ago. They didn't commit any funding whatsoever for it for another 12 months till mid-2019. And they took another year to get money out the door. So it took two years after this natural disaster risk reduction framework was announced and was claimed to be the solution to protect Australians from natural disasters. It took two years for a single dollar to be got out the door. And 
even now, two years on, not a single dollar has been spent in the Northern Territory, in New South Wales or in Western Australia. So there are a number of states which haven't received a single dollar, and they just happen to be the states and territories that are most at risk from disasters this very summer. As I say, New South Wales and Western Australia, above normal risk of fire. Northern Territory, above normal risk of cyclones. And yet they haven't received a single dollar from this government to help keep them safe through this, this natural disaster risk reduction framework. So yet again, we have statements from ministers in this government who say that they're acting to protect Australians from natural disasters, but you don't have to scratch too deeply to see that it's not actually true. And that shouldn't be surprising to any of us because, as I say, we know there's a tendency from this government to make an announcement and not actually deliver. And even in this space of natural disaster management, it happens. Because, of course, the classic example is the Emergency Response Fund, the $4 billion fund that this government announced 18 months ago, was set up to spend up to $200 million a year on disaster recovery and mitigation. And 18 months on, how much has been spent? Zero. Zero. So that's why we're actually, we've had this ministerial statement from Minister Littleproud today. It's because he knows and the government knows that they've been caught out failing to invest the funds from the emergency response fund that are needed, uh, and he's trying to distract attention and point to anything um, that suggests that he's doing something about natural disasters. But as I say, the problem for him is that it's taken two years for money to get out the door, and even now there are a number of states and territories that are most at risk from natural disasters this year that haven't seen a spent of it. This minister, this government, this prime minister have got to stop talking about doing things, have got to, start, have got to stop claiming to have done things that they haven't, just make use of the funds that are available. There is a very serious risk of cyclones and floods, particularly in the north of our country this summer. There is a bucket of funding that was set up with the opposition support last year to prevent exactly the kind of damage that we're likely to see in a few weeks' time. We shouldn't have to be coming into the chamber repeatedly to point this out to ministers that they've got funds available that can be spent, and we shouldn't have to see what is likely to happen in a few weeks' time, which is that Australians are impacted yet again by disasters that could have been prevented. Uh, it's not too late for the minister to, to spend some of those funds that are sitting there available. He should get on and do it now, rather than making ministerial attempts, uh, statements that attempt to distract attention and overclaim for things that he has done. Senator Macdonald. The Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management a report on the Natural Disaster Risk Reduction Framework. I appreciate that the Chamber is uh, tired and wants to move on as quickly as possible, but I could not sit and let the comments uh, by Senator Watt pass uh, uh, unnoticed. Um, it is a tragedy that for those of us who live in the part of the country where we see a lot of natural disasters—floods, bushfires, cyclones—that we have people from the Gold Coast making commentary around what is primarily state-based risks. And unfortunately, in Queensland, we've just seen Fraser Island burn to the ground. The locals have been begging the state government to take appropriate action to prepare for the bushfire on that World Heritage-listed uh, island. They have been begging the state government to utilise the, the water bombing plane, and yet nothing. But this government, the federal government, uh, guided by the Minister for Agriculture and, and uh, Disaster Management, Emergency Management, has been providing the very tools that we need to provide assistance and support to Australians who have been left unprotected by their state Labor governments primarily. Uh, things like telehealth for mental health services, things like additional radars and weather bureau um, measurements, of flood monitoring. Uh, and in Queensland, it was the LNP government that built levies around towns like uh, Gundawindi and Charleville and Roma that have saved people uh, from um, flood risks and floods since they've been built. Um, in, in 
in North Australia it is very difficult to get insurance. There are people who are underinsured or not insured at all. The ACCC has made several recommendations to provide uh, ways to reduce the costs for Northern Australian people, and yet the Queensland State Government and others won't take the necessary steps to reduce those costs by at least 9.5 per cent straight off with the removal of state stamp duty. So I could not let, uh, let Senator Watt make such outrageous comments about what is required from the federal government when the Natural Disaster Risk Reduction Framework, as presented by the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, has provided uh, $2 billion of support for Australians to uh, manage natural disaster resilience, and, uh, and I commend it to the Senate. Thank you. The question is, the motion to take note of that particular document uh, be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator McGrath. I move, uh, Mr President, to take note of the ABC election review that uh, was provided through an order of production of documents. And I won't take too long because I know we all want to get home, but I'd like to say I'm very disappointed that the ABC, who believe in the right to know, apply that test to everyone else except themselves. I wrote to the ABC asking for a copy of this review. They did not supply it. My office lodged an FOI in relation to this review, and they did not supply it. The ABC only supplied this review, not because I demanded it, because the Senate yesterday passed a motion for the order of production of documents in relation to this review, and this review has now been supplied through what can only be described as a lot of teeth grinding by senior ABC executives, which is why it is so disappointing that the ABC, who did not want this election review to be released, are already out briefing about this election review within mere seconds of the document being tabled in this chamber by the minister on the ABC website, they had a banner claiming um, that the ABC review into, into the 2019 election uh, found that it, was, that it was impartial. Craig McMurtry, their director of news, is already on Radio National talking about this election review, a document that they wanted kept secret, a document that this billion-dollar organisation funded by the taxpayers of Australia did not want the taxpayers to see. Well, the ABC are now out happily briefing about it. And I say to the ABC, you exist because you are funded by the taxpayers of Australia. You are a national broadcaster, and I would suggest that you start behaving like a national broadcaster and not like behaving like some little clique. You should listen to the people of Australia, and perhaps it would be good to listen and read some of the observations in that review about the need for a diversity of voices within the ABC and not it being such a left-wing talking shop. Because I do have a plan for the ABC to be saved from itself, shift their headquarters out of the inner city um, areas, open up the recruitment process, put ads on the ABC, and by that way we'll we will truly see a national broadcasting corporation rather than this sadly depleted organisation that believes it is in its own interest not to release these reviews when it is actually in the public interest to release these reviews. The taxpayers of Australia have a right to know. Shame on the ABC for only releasing this document through an order of this Senate. But congratulations for the Senate for doing so. Merry Christmas, everybody. Are you um, seeking leave to continue your remarks? Continue my remarks. Thank you. There being no other matters, I'm going to move on. No other documents people are taking note of. I have received a message from the House of Representatives returning the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Extension of Coronavirus Support Bill 2020 and informing the Senate that the House has disagreed to the amendment made by the Senate. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I move that the message be considered in Committee of the Whole question, immediately. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I am just awaiting a temporary chair to take the committee chair so that we can commence debate.
Thank you, Senator McGrath, for stepping into the breach. We're up to. Uh, the committee is considering message number 335 from the House of Representatives relating to the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Extension of Coronavirus Support Bill 2020. Minister. Thanks, Mr President. I move that the committee does not insist on its amendment, to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. And, Mr Chair, in doing so, I emphasise the government has brought forward this legislation to this chamber and to this parliament to extend an additional support mechanism that we put in place as part of the economic lifeline that we have provided to Australians through the COVID-19 pandemic. This has been an important part of the comprehensive response provided by our government to this global pandemic. In doing so, it's provided assistance that, from the very outset, our government made clear would be targeted, temporary and proportionate. We have stuck to those principles to guide us through the crisis. In doing so, we have been able to provide the greatest levels of support at the greatest times of need. But it is important to recognise that the scale of government intervention put in place in the depths of the pandemic is not sustainable for the long term. That is why we were clear at the outset that measures would be temporary. They would be targeted and they would be proportionate. And in relation to the job seeker supplement and the job keeper payments, we have been true to those initial principles that we outlined as a government. We have ensured that in being proportionate, we have adjusted them gradually at stages over time. We have always indicated that they would be temporary, and the measures brought forward here have a clear end date of March 30. That is no secret. That is what the government said when we announced this extension, and we brought it transparently to the chamber. The amendments that the House of Representatives has disagreed with would provide for an enduring ability of the minister to continue the supplement. It is not the government's belief that that enduring power is necessary, and certainly not that it needs sit in the hands of the minister in that way. This parliament, this parliament will have appropriate powers, as it always does, in relation to legislation. We put in place extraordinary powers for ministers in the depths of the global pandemic during those extraordinary and dark days. Australia is in a far better place right now which enables us to be here in person debating these things with Parliament having resumed its sittings in the ordinary normal course of events. In these times, it's not necessary for the minister to maintain such powers in an enduring way. We said these, these measures would last until March 30. That's what our legislation does. That's what we're standing by. That is why the government has not accepted the Senate's amendments. Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, uh, Acting Chair. Well, well, what an extraordinary contribution, but not as extraordinary as the statement for reasons. Everybody, hold, you know, hold on to your seats because Mr Morrison wants us to, to not insist on the amendments because he says it is important to respect the parliament. Oh, it is important, important to respect the parliament and deal with in primary legislation rather than regulation. It is important to respect the parliament. I've got two names in response to that. The first, Angus Taylor, a bloke who misleads the House of Representatives, relies on yes. So point of order. Point of order. Senator Birmingham, well knows to refer to members of the other place appropriately. Oh. Senator Wong. You know, that says something about the debating style, doesn't it? You, you, can, you can defend on a technicality, but not on the ethics. Not on the ethics, because you know, you know this bloke relied on a forged document and doesn't have the decency to front up. But he's still there. That's respect for the parliament under Scott Morrison. You want to know the second name? Richard Colbeck. Richard Colbeck. Miss Senator, Senator Colbeck. Birmingham. Senator Richard Colbeck, censured by this, by this chamber, censured by this chamber, walks out when he turns his back 
on the Senate chamber when he's asked to explain his role as minister when so many Australians have died. And now we have the representative of the Prime Minister coming in and doing Mr Morrison's bidding, obediently trotting in here and saying, oh, you know, we have to respect the parliament, so we, have to, uh, we don't want you to insist on the amendment. I mean, what this really shows us is the pettiness of this Prime Minister. What it really shows us is the pettiness of this Prime Minister. Doesn't want to compromise. Doesn't want to compromise. This is a provision, I'll say it again, that the ministers told the opposition she had no problem with. No problem with. Now, I accept that they've been come over the top of your Senate team. I accept uh, that those in the PMO who advised the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, have said, oh, no, we can't, we can't possibly compromise. But the reality is she knew the truth of it. She knew the truth of it. That the amendment that was moved by this chamber simply put the minister in the position she already was, and whereby she had the discretion, whereby she had the discretion uh, to extend the supplement. The pettiness of the prime minister. You see, he's a bloke who pretends to be the daggy dad, but you know what he actually is? He's the bloke who never holds a hose. He's the bloke who never holds a hose. He's the bloke who never takes responsibility. Never takes responsibility and all, is always about the optics and the photo shoot and the headline and the story and never about the reality. And we see that here again today. We see that here again this evening. What do you reckon, Morrison? Yeah, we see that here again this evening where he can't even cop an amendment that his minister knew was, was acceptable because he doesn't want to have a loss. Really? That's, that's, that's what we want the, the, the leader of the country focusing on? This message, these reasons for decision, demonstrate very clearly the sort of man that leads this country. Uh, prepared to talk about respect for the parliament, but not prepared to demonstrate it. Prepared to talk about respect for the parliament, but not prepared to demonstrate it. Uh, uh, so I say to the Senate, uh, we should insist, uh, vote to insist on this amendment. I will also say this, and the Australian Greens know I made this clear to them before. We had a very productive discussion uh, with the government. I'll come back to that. Uh, we have taken a responsible approach to this legislation because we, we believe, we understand how many millions of Australians are uh, relying on exactly. the extension or the continuation of these payments. So unlike Mr Morrison, we're not going to play games. Now I do want to say something about the schmozzle that we've seen uh, in these last few hours, uh, where the government belatedly realised he did not have the numbers to defeat two amendments uh, and were unable to get uh, those um, resolved. And it was in this context that the discussions were had, where the minister made it very clear she could live with this amendment but not with the other one. And to her credit, she did what was requested of her and she explained to the chamber, to the Australian Greens, to the Australian Labor Party, why uh, the government could not live uh, with uh, the second amendment. And actually, I thought you know, it was a schmozzle and the government should have sorted it out earlier and should have explained it earlier, should have made sure it actually could run the procedure and the numbers. But leaving that all aside, you know, we didn't, we didn't take, uh, make a big song and dance about it and tried to find a way through because I understood what she was saying and so did Senator Seward. And how we met. How's this chamber met? Uh, in, you know, with, but how, how is it met by the Prime Minister in the face of that cooperation? Well, he, he's given us the proverbial finger, let's be clear. Let's be clear. He has. Because this statement of reasons makes it really clear there is no substantive reason why the government can't accept this amendment. There has no practical effect, and the minister knew that, and she told the truth. The only effect is on the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison's ego. 
And the fact that he's prepared to do this in this way, with, with a bill that is about the support for so many Australians, says something about his character. It says something about what his priority is. Because it isn't the people who are uh, supported by the bill, it's himself. And that's the consistent theme, isn't it? It's always about him, how he looks, the spin bike, the daggy shorts, the chicken coop, all these great peck uh, uh, peck facts. It's always about him, not about the people we're supposed to be helping, not, what, not, not about the people we're supposed to be representing, and in this bill, not about the people who are doing it tough. It is pathetic. It is pathetic, and it is, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> it is a pathetic display. First, an incompetent display from the government, uh, but we all make mistakes. Worse, worse, it's a display of pettiness and lack of character from the man who's supposed to lead the nation. <coughs> I don't hold a hose, mate. That's who he is. Senator Seaworth. This legislation we know is important, but it's also important that the minister is provided with the measures that may be necessary to deal with what we still don't know may happen. We aren't out of this pandemic yet, and those of our fellow Australians who are doing it tough at the moment certainly aren't out of trouble. We're still suffering from a recession. This is the very least. This is the very least the government can do. They won't raise the job seeker payment. They keep saying, "Oh, let's wait for an economic recovery to see what's happening with an economic recovery." You don't actually need to know what's happening there because we already know the job seeker payment is not adequate. And the government knows that. You should have, for those of that were listening earlier, you should have heard the government tie themselves in knots trying to explain why they brought in the coronavirus supplement when, and denying that the job seeker payment of $40 a day was actually wasn't inadequate and refused to acknowledge that. They know very well that the job seeker payment is inadequate. There is absolutely no excuse not to raise it now. If you need to do a top-up, well, we do a top-up later on, in case something happens down the line. But we know we are never going to come to a situation in this country where 40 bucks a day is enough. It simply is not. So what this amendment did was ensure, just in case, just in case. But no, the government wouldn't do that because apparently the government is always right. Well, no, you're not. You aren't right, and you're not right on the cashless debit card, and you're not right on this. This bill, I'll, let, I'll remind everybody that this bill actually cuts the supplement. Do you think I want to support a bill that cuts the supplement? Not really. I moved an amendment to keep it at what it was at $550 a fortnight. But we're supporting it because we don't want to see people going into Christmas and New Year with, with having to survive on 40 bucks a day. So I'm sucking it up, as are the Australian Greens, when what I'd like to do is knock it back into the ballpark and make you come back with some better payment. That's, right. That's what we want. We want a permanent increase to JobSeeker. So it breaks my heart that we're having to sit here to support a bill that actually, I know, makes people live in poverty if they're trying to survive on this. We know it's dropping people down to below the poverty line as we come up to Christmas. Happy Christmas. We know that the January period is one of those periods where Emergence, uh, essential services, emergency relief, financial counselling is on demand. And yet the government here is cutting the supplement. They dress it up in fancy words, no, we're extending it because it was going to run out. No, Australia knows that come the 1st of January, 
the money in their pockets will be reduced by another 100 bucks. As we run up to March, where people are going to start not being able to pay their rent, they're going to start having to default, we are going to be in a problem here. And we still don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic. We still don't know what's happening with the, with the vaccine. We don't know the future, which is the point the government's made. And yet what you're doing is, is cutting off an option to give the minister the power to, make a few de to deal with a situation that may arise. And the government knows that we are not going to deny people money in the run-up to Christmas and into next year. We can't possibly. It's inconceivable that we would not support at least some money going to those people in Australia doing it tough. This is an appalling way to treat this Senate. It was a very reasonable amendment. We supported it because it was a reasonable amendment. And it's an appalling way for the other place to just kick it back and the Prime Minister effectively kick sand in our face. That's what it's about. While they do over, while they do over so many Australians by dropping them into poverty. Australians will be thinking about that, who are trying to survive on it. Australians will be sitting about, uh, thinking about that over Christmas. How are we going to make our rent payments? How are we going to pay the mortgage? How are we going to continue to put food on the table? And they'll start going out with, without medications again, like they used to do, on the 40 bucks a week that JobSeeker was. Skipping meals, people living in poverty, over a million children dropped into poverty, Order. further into poverty. Order this on the is, left. This is not good Order. legislation. Order on the left. Order. Senator Seward has the call. This is not good legislation. But we have to support it because we don't want to see people literally go hungry. Senator Patrick did was first. Uh, he was first uh, for, 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 for his very. S Senator Patrick, to help me with the chamber, could I please give the call to Senator Keneally, and then I'll come to you, and then I will. Come, then I'll come to, to Senator Rustin. Can we all just get along nicely, please? Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Let's just turn to the words here from the House of Representatives. It is important to respect the parliament. It is important to respect. I want to pick up on the word respect, because this is a government and this is a prime minister who does not understand what it is to respect, to respect the Australian people, to, to respect hard-working Australians who are doing it tough during this pandemic. Right now, in Australia, we know there are 1.5 million people on job seeker. We know that there are 2 million Australians, our fellow citizens, who are relying on the coronavirus supplement. And while there is promising news about vaccines. We don't know when a vaccine is going to come. We don't know what is going to happen in the economy over the next few months. We know this government spent $15 million to come up with one word, come back. They think the economy is coming back. They've made a $15 million debt, a bet that it is, but we know the snapback didn't occur. We don't know that the comeback is going to occur, and that's why this chamber, this Senate, believes it is important that the minister has the power for discretion, discretion to respond to changing circumstances. She doesn't have to use it, but she should have that power, and she has even agreed she should have that power. And the leader of the Senate, the opposition in the Senate, is correct. We are here because the prime minister only respects one thing, his own ego, his own standing in the community. He doesn't care about Australians who are doing it tough. And if we want to talk about the lack of respect
from this Prime Minister. Let's talk about Let's talk about the lack of respect he has for Australians in aged care. He gets delivered a report called Neglect, Neglect from the Royal Commission. It talks about older Australians, our parents and grandparents, starving in their beds with wounds, with ants and maggots crawling out of it. And does this Prime Minister respond? Does he allocate the money sufficient to give a a response? Does he ensure that there is a plan in place when a deadly pandemic hits our shores? Does he deal with the fact he has an incompetent minister who is censured by this Senate? No, the disrespect that this Prime Minister shows for older Australians in aged care, that's a sign of his disrespect, not just for the parliament, but for the Australian people and for older Australians in aged care. Let's talk about his disrespect for workers, Donata workers, Donata workers, deliberately excluded from JobKeeper by this Prime Minister and this government. These are Australian citizens who paid Australian taxes and worked hard in Australian jobs, but this Prime Minister disrespected them and discarded them from JobKeeper. Let's talk about the Qantas workers. The Qantas workers, this Prime Minister, disrespected them. 2,000 Qantas workers got the sack this month. Got the sack. Their jobs were outsourced. Their jobs didn't disappear. Let's understand this. This wasn't a pandemic problem. This was a privatization, an outsourcing, an approach by Alan Joyce and Qantas, and they were allowed to do it by this Prime Minister. Qantas was given JobKeeper by this government, and what did they do? This government stood by, no plan for aviation, no plan for workers, and let Qantas disrespect. So don't talk to me about respecting the parliament, Prime Minister. You haven't shown respect. You're not showing respect to the victims of the bushfires. You told us you don't hold a hose, Prime Minister. You haven't even done the decency to deliver one cent, one cent out of the emergency relief fund for bushfire victims. People are still living in caravans on the south coast of New South Wales because this Prime Minister disrespects the trauma of their experience. And let's talk about the lack of respect that this Prime Minister has the lack of respect that he has for First Nations people. He has fundamentally, fundamentally rejected the Uluru Statement from the Heart, the voice to the parliament, the Makarata Commission. They have rejected every cry from the heart from First Nations people. Shame on them. Shame on them. And then the most appalling display last night, as we listened, and I was inspired and I was proud to be a senator in this chamber with the likes of Senator McCarthy, Senator Dodson, and First Nation senators from the Greens and the Independents, who stood in this chamber and spoke from their experience in their communities about the racist nature of the cashless debit card. Don't talk about respect, Prime Minister, when you have fundamentally disrespected the oldest continuing culture on earth, our First Nations people. You have, respect, you have rejected their voice and you have disrespected them. And let us talk about the Prime Minister's lack of respect for veterans. Veterans and their families know the scourge of veteran suicide. They have called for a royal commission. They have demanded a royal commission. They have pleaded for a royal commission. And what did this prime minister do? Did he respect their views? Did he listen to them? No. No, because it's all about him. If he hasn't had the idea first, it's not a good idea. If he can't claim credit for it, if it's not a marketing campaign in there for him, 
He just, he just rejects it. There's no respect from this Prime Minister for our veterans. Don't talk to us about respect, Prime Minister. Don't send a message to this Senate about respect. Let's talk about the lack of respect for workers who helped us through this pandemic. Nurses, teachers, cleaners, childcare workers, police officers, aged care workers. What does he do? What's his Christmas present to them? It is an industrial relations bill that will cut their pay. The Morrison pay cut. That's what workers are getting. Work choices 2.0. It is in their DNA. He has disrespected the workers who put themselves on the line, put their health and well-being on the line to ensure that Australians were able to have fundamental services, retail workers, grocery store workers, the people who stock the shelves, the truck drivers. All of these people are going to get the Morrison pay cut for Christmas. So don't talk to us about your respect, Prime Minister, and the esteem, the esteem you hold it in. If you had respect for people, you would have never introduced robo-debt when you were the Social Services Minister. If you had respect for people, you would have never persisted with robo-debt when you knew that it was illegal. And if you had respect for people, you would have woken up to the fact that thousands of Australians were dying after they got robo-debt notices. This is a Prime Minister that invented robo-debt, proclaimed robo-debt, and banked his false surplus off robo-debt. So don't talk to us about respect, Prime Minister. And if you really had respect, you'd hold your ministers to account. Richard Colbeck, been censured by the Senate. Angus Taylor, creating fake documents and never being able to explain where they came from. Come on. What happened to ministerial accountability here? Excuse what me, Senator happened Keneally. To ministerial Excuse accountability? me, Senator Keneally. Uh, Senator Abetz has. I shouldn't have to raise the point of order. Senator Reyes has a silly smile on his face, which tells us all, at all. Uh, he called out he's a crook in reference to Mr. Taylor. That clearly has to be withdrawn, and nobody has ever suggested that Mr. Taylor fabricated a document. That is a fabrication in itself. Senator Ayers, um, oh, order. Senator Ayers, um, could, order. Senator Ayers, it would assist the chamber if you could withdraw, please. Well, a silly grin is my resting face. But if it assists the chair, I'll withdraw. Thank, thank you. Senator, Senator Keneally. Thank you. Now, if this Prime Minister really respected the Australian people, he would not have bought their votes with his corrupt sports rort scheme. Let's be on, let's be, let's call a spade a shovel here. This corrupt government bought votes in marginal seats with their colour-coded spreadsheets and their corrupt sports rort scheme, and they still haven't. They voted against accountability of Minister McKenzie, no, sorry, Senator McKenzie, fronting up to the sports rorts committee. So don't talk to us about your bloody respect, Prime Minister. Don't talk to us about it. Order. This legislation, this legislation should go back. This, we should insist upon this amendment because it is the right thing to do. And the Prime Minister should respect the will of this Senate. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just, I'm, I'm just rising to perhaps uh, look at this uh, from a slightly different perspective. Uh, I actually don't understand the reason for a vote on, on the, in the insistence because, in effect, uh, the government's asking us to vote to remove a power uh, from one of his own ministers um, to exercise a discretion. And actually, uh, we've heard a few things about different ministers. Minister Rustin is one of the, one of the ministers that I wouldn't uh, suggest would abuse a power, would abuse a discretion. I just want to talk to. Uh, uh, people might recall I, when I rose to talk about Senator Cormann uh, in his valedictory, I talked about relationships. I just want to talk about uh, Senator, Rust, uh, Senator Rustin just over the last uh, few weeks, watching her step up into the role of the manager of government business in this place. Um, 
It's been pretty hectic. We've had some controversial bills, and look, there have been some mistakes that have been made. And uh, I, you know, I don't think uh, anyone could blame anyone. It's a complex task. The, the uh, Minister Rustin has to actually uh, run the chamber as the manager of government business, but also has to deal with her own with her own legislation. And she has been dealing with some controversial legislation over the last couple of days. And notwithstanding, I don't agree with the proposition that had been put forward by the government. What I can tell you is that. In her engagement uh, with me personally dealing with this legislation, it started uh, uh, probably a month or more ago when, uh, when Minister Rustin took me out to show me the technology provider for the cashless debit card, when she organised a cashless debit card for me, uh, when uh, sh she sat down and she ran me through all of the legislation. Uh, so people might note that, that I asked about 50 questions on notice last week that were returned uh, really uh, quickly. Uh, she's been available at any, at any point in time to answer my questions, and she has also. Uh, people might, I think, people appreciate that the minister gave up her, her weekend after a heavy week in parliament last week. She gave up her weekend. She uh, came to me with Sajuna, and she uh, showed me around. Uh, basically pushing her bill. And I can tell you over the last few nights there have been a number of conversations taking place between me, between uh, 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 Senator Rustin and Senator Lambie, between Senator Lambie and, uh, and Senator Alliance, between, Sen uh, uh, sorry, between Senator Rustin and, and uh, Senator Alliance, between, um, between uh, the, the opposition and Senator Rustin. And those conversations have been taking place at all hours of the, of the day and night. Um, Minister Rustin looks tired. Minister Rustin looks, looks a bit battered. You know, I, I've watched your facial expressions today when you, when you realised actually you didn't have the numbers. And uh, whilst People here have to vote on the merits. I, you know, I actually felt a little bit sorry for you, noting the couple of weeks that you had. Look, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, <laughs> the Prime Minister, in picking his cabinet, has to pick good people, and then he has to empower those people to make decisions. And I'm very disappointed tonight that when Minister Rustin made a decision, she made a commitment to. Uh, to Senator Wong, which uh, Senator Wong then transmitted to the crossbench, that actually the Prime Minister didn't stand by her decision, and that to me is, disres dis is disres disrespectful. Okay, whatever you might think about the legislation that was brought up in the chamber uh, over the last couple of days, uh, the carriage of that particular bill uh, was a very difficult. Uh, you know, passage for uh, for the government, and uh, we all got snookered when when finally the numbers weren't available. Actually, Senator Rustin had a backup plan, and actually out, she out snookered all of us. So whilst I don't, I'm not in any way standing and suggesting that that uh, that uh, uh, the the bill that she. Uh, managed to get through the Senate uh, is a good thing. I think she did a good job, and I think it's hugely disrespectful, having her made a decision in this chamber, for that to be overturned by the Prime Minister. Uh, I think that's the wrong thing to do. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, can I just put on the record some clarity around this amendment. The amendment that is being proposed um, would keep supplementary provisions in place indefinitely rather than being managed by primary legislation. Um, and in the contributions Order. from everybody else in this chamber, Order on the left. We, we actually didn't hear very much about the substance of uh, the amendment. Um, instead, what we heard um, was an absolutely vicious personal attack 
on the Prime Minister. Uh, what we heard from Senator Keneally was I think she traversed just about every single subject matter that's ever been before this chamber, Order. with the exception of Order. the matter that was before the chair. Order. But I, I think you know when we first brought this uh, this particular um, uh, measure into the chamber back in the height of the coronavirus summit on the 23rd of March, um, we asked this place to give me the power. To be, able to, uh, to be able to exercise these powers in the absence of being able to come back to this place to seek for this place to make the decision as it normally would. And I'll quote to you, um, you know, Senator, Senator Gallagher, I'll quote your own words back to you. When you stood up in this place, when Senator you gave Pratt. me the power to be able to, uh, to have this particular measure, you said it was an unprecedented broad power to the minister. And you said we did believe that this needed an expiry date because of the significant powers that are being delegated from legislation to regulation. We are seeking. It has been extended. We have. It has been extended, but we are seeking. So it Senator is Keneally. rather a, a rank hypocrisy to come in here and then come in here. Coming in here and then arguing and arguing the fact that somehow. Somehow, um, that we have. Uh, Order. I'm having a little trouble hearing at the moment, Mr. Chair. But um, we Minister, believe. Minister, Minister, can you take your seat, please? Yeah, we Minister, can you take the seat? Can we please have order? I'm having trouble hearing the minister, and I'm two metres away from the minister. Please, everybody, we're almost there. I can see Santa, um, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, and I just want to put on the record that, um, you know, despite all that's gone before us today, the government believes it is an unnecessary amendment because, uh, the, because it, it gives me the power to retain an instrument to make a power indefinitely, indefinitely when the parliament is, ex is, is sitting uh, as we speak. And additionally, the Senator amendment Pratt. engages highly technical legislation. And uh, if you pass this amendment, it would actually have unintended effects, by the way, of inadvertently ceasing some elements of the social security law linked to Senator the payment Watt. in the supplement. So can I just say this power-making provision was initially put in place due to the unprecedented circumstances being faced by the COVID-19 pan pandemic and the uncertainty around the ability for this place to sit. In this case, it. So circumstances, senators, have clearly changed Senator because Watts. the parliament is sitting. We're here today, and the parliament is sitting. And so, if the government Senator decides Pratt. to extend any measures past the 31st of March 2021, in response to circumstances that we might find ourselves in at that time, we will seek to legislate through the parliament in the usual manner Order. because Please. we do respect the power. Of this parliament. Thank you. The question, order. The question before the chair is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the, the noes have it. Ayes have it. A division required. Ring the bells.
Mm. Oh, I did wonder. Uh, stop the bells. Order. Order. So the question is order. So the question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order, there being 35 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Minister. Thanks, Madam Chair. I move that the resolution be reported. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister uh, be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. No, you gotta get us. The committee has considered messages, message number 335 from the House of Representatives relating to the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment, Extension of Corona Support Bill 2020, and has resolved not to insist on the amendments made by the Senate to which the House has disagreed. Minister. Deputy President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So we are now on to end of 2020. Christmas and end of year messages. And what a year, are we? Uh, well, I was going to do that next, but we can do that first if you'd like. Okay. Um, well, let's move to um, committee memberships. Um, if they're so, 
Um, well, we're going to have to start with those messages. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Thanks Mr. President, and, uh, and indeed, it's that time of year, even if it doesn't always feel like it as, uh, as we approach it. Mr. President, it has across Australia been a time this year when, in some ways, it brings to mind the tale of two cities, Dickens' phrase of the best and worst of times. In Australia, as we approach the end of 2020, we can have enormous gratitude and thankfulness for the country in which we live and that all Australians live in. When compared against the rest of the world, our nation has come through what has been the most challenging period the world has faced since World War II, far better than most others. We have done so with, with typical Australian resilience and capabilities and compassion. It though has been the worst of times for many around the world, including many in Australia. This year, as we pause, many of us will think of those who have lost loved ones as a result of COVID-19, have suffered loss, personal loss, financial loss, loss of jobs, loss of businesses, the many challenges that many Australians have faced. So this year, Australians can look back knowing that their resilience, their efforts, their coming together throughout this year has enabled many Australians to withstand the circumstances far, far better than the rest of the world. And there is much to be thankful for, but also much that we should be respectful of, mindful of and pause and give thanks, but also uh, give a sense of reminding ourselves of the losses that have been occurred. In getting through this remarkable year, we in this place owe enormous gratitude to many. Whilst the world has faced a pandemic unlike any other for a century, this place has had to function unlike at any time in its history. And so we pay thanks, first and foremost, to all of those who have enabled our parliamentary institutions that were never designed to face the type of environment we have, where travel became restricted, where ability for members to attend became restricted, and yet we have managed to function through it all. We have functioned as a result of the effort of those who manage these places, and of course we pay particular thanks to the parliamentary staff to those in the Department of the Senate, led by our clerk and all of the deputy clerks, but to the teams across the board and across the parliament who have enabled us to meet and to do what Australians have required in the most challenging of circumstances. They have adapted, and we need only look around this chamber to see the large black screens staring back at us as a reminder of the fact that this is a very different image for the chamber than it was at the start of this year. In doing so, no doubt we have learned much in terms of the way in which we can operate, particularly when it comes to the engagement of committees and other processes to get the most efficient and effective use of our time. I think all the teams of those working across the parliament, not only the clerks and their assistants, but of course all across the parliamentary departments, those attendants across the chamber who have had to again bear particular burdens of managing the rearranged seating of managing the restrictions in terms of access, and we pay tribute to them alongside others who have had to do similar. The comcar drivers, the security staff, the cleaners have all had to adapt in this building to changed work patterns, regulations and restrictions as a result of COVID-19. We acknowledge those in the background, the building maintenance, the Hansard staff, of course the various people uh, working right across the building who make it all hum and tick, whether it's at a normal time or at an extraordinary time. I also want to place on record our thanks particularly to all of the staff of all senators. This again has been a very challenging year for them. As Australians have been doing it tough, as measures and radical interventions have been put in place to keep people safe and to keep their economic position secure. Our staff and the staff across many government departments and agencies have had to be on the front line of responding to Australians in their hour of need. 
to providing them with advice, with compassion, with assistance. And they have done so, I know, across all political offices, all political parties, our staff will have helped many constituents navigate the support that was available to them to get them through their toughest hours and times. And I thank all of them, as I do across uh, the public service, uh, for their work in stepping up, responding and often performing duties well outside of what they were employed or expected to do. Can I acknowledge, particularly with uh, nearly all of the state leaders in Canberra tonight, the fact that we have also had to call upon much cooperation between the states and the Commonwealth this year. Uh, the advent of the National Cabinet uh, that has allowed for a faster, quicker, more responsive approach to Commonwealth state cooperation than old COAG mechanisms did has been a good thing. It is hopefully one of the lasting positive changes that come out of this terrible time. Uh, it's not perfect. Uh, and of course, the Federation still has its battles, uh, but I do acknowledge that the states and their cooperation has been important to all of the efforts that have been made across the board. Returning back to, uh, to the Senate, uh, of course, uh, I have uh, taken on this role as leader during the course of this year. I want to acknowledge firstly my predecessor, uh, Matthias Cormann, and thank him for his leadership and service over many years, as we had done uh, at the time of his departure. But I do particularly also want to thank uh, the current leadership team in Senator Cash and Senator Rustin and, of course, uh, the whips led by Senator Dean Smith uh, and his team of whips, Senator McGrath, Senator Brockman, Senator Perrin from the National Party, who have all done an outstanding job during the course of this year. Ours is a coalition, as we all know, and I particularly thank Senator McKenzie and our National Party friends uh, for their partnership and, Bridget, for your work alongside me in, uh, in leading and working with the coalition and for all that you did and with Matthias as well uh, during a year that has been a tough one at times. And to all of my Liberal colleagues, I thank you very much for the support that you have provided to Michaela and me as we have stepped up into the leadership ranks and supported us uh, and, of course, across the board the hard work in the Senate committees with the committee staff that all senators have performed in a range of different ways. Uh, I thank each and every one of you uh, for that. Looking around the chamber, we have disagreements. That can be fierce disagreements at times. We've witnessed some of that even tonight. But it is also the case that in this chamber of this parliament, nothing is ultimately achieved without cooperation. And as fierce as the disagreements get at times, that is something that we all need to keep in mind, uh, that we need to find ways to work together to get things done for the betterment of our country. Our country can stand tall in the world as an influential nation, but one that faces very challenging times right now. Yes, we've stood up to the threats of COVID better than most, but we also find new strategic challenges in our region that will present challenges for some time to come. I congratulate Australians for the resilience they have shown this year. All members of the government, I'm sure all members of the Senate, are proud of the way in which Australians have adapted, responded and survived. We want to see them thrive and succeed in the years to come, and our cooperation in this place will be important to getting them through that. To those who will, as most Australians are, celebrate Christmas and the Christian Christmas, we wish you all every success, every happiness, every blessing in your celebrations. To those who will celebrate other festivities through this period of time, we wish you every happiness through your celebrations. To all Australians, we hope this is a time that people can give thanks for the presence of their loved ones. Remember those, whether from COVID or other causes, that they have lost throughout the course of the year in the past, but come together be grateful for being Australians, for being in our great country, and all commit to making sure that 2021 is a year in which the recovery that is underway uh, is something that helps us all on the journey to further success and prosperity. Mr President, to you, thank you for your leadership through this great year, challenging year, uh, and we wish 
you, your loved ones, and all senators a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Senate for the opportunity to place some remarks on the record as we end the parliamentary year. <clears throat> well, much has been said about the challenges of 2020 and the impact of the pandemic on everyone's lives, and certainly the Senate has found some extraordinary ways to continue its work. But the, adjust the adjustments all of us have made to our work have been trifling in comparison to the shock and challenges faced by so many of the people we serve. Nearly a million Australians unemployed, one and a half million on JobKeeper, 1.8 million on JobSeeker by the end of the year, and those lost to coronavirus and those who mourn their loss. Uh, the 685 Australians who died in residential aged care, Australians who lost loved ones and homes in the bushfires of last summer. This has been a year that has been tough, a year defined by tragedy, by loss and grief for too many of our fellow Australians. Our job here is to do everything we can to help. Our positions carry great privilege and in return they demand accountability. They demand responsibility to help and protect our fellow Australians. Uh, I'm very proud to lead the Labor team in this place, and I am grateful on beh their behalf to place some uh, thanks and season's greetings on the record. I start with you, Mr. President. Can I say personally how much I've appreciated the opportunity to work with you again this year? This president is a principled, trusted custodian of the chamber, and I'm grateful for your constructive and cooperative manner, your uh, extraordinary efforts to maintain the operations of this place, including working with states to facilitate the movement of senators for parliamentary business. Whilst occasionally we may not live up to the standards you set, only very occasionally, your commitment to upholding these is, uh, is um, to the benefit not just of this place but to the Australian democracy, and I know you understand that. I want to thank the Deputy President and Chair Committee, my, my dear friend Senator Lyons. Who, takes, who does an enormous amount of work behind the uh, scenes uh, and also in the chamber as deputy president and chair of committees. Uh, she brings a calm, practical and inclusive approach, and I think we saw that in a difficult debate last night, and I thank her for that. I did tell her she wasn't allowed to leave. Um, <clears throat> it is very important work, and I want to acknowledge her and thank her for her work. Uh, to my counterpart, uh, Senator Birmingham, uh, obviously we have a, for Christmas a freshly minted leader of the government in the Senate. Uh, Senator Birmingham is the fourth leader I have faced. Is that right? Somebody wrote that. Is that actually true? Can I wish him a successful and short stint as leader of the government? <laughs> I also, it was a joke, Michaelia. It was a joke. <laughs> She's looking so serious. I also acknowledge the deputy leader of the government, go, government Senator Cash. I, and uh, acknowledge her promotion to that role. Uh, on my own side, can I first start with uh, uh, Senator Keneally and say how that I am particularly grateful to my uh, Deputy Senator Keneally, who is, and we saw it again this evening, a tireless, fierce advocate for the Labor cause. She is relentless in every aspect in seeking to hold the government to account uh, for, for, for example, for its promise to have Australians who are stranded overseas home by Christmas. Uh, she knows personally the pain of being kept apart from family by the pandemic, the most difficult of times, and through which she has kept going. So, Christina, I hope you have time with your family this Christmas, and I hope you have the time and space to remember and celebrate your father. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't ask for better sisters uh, to be in the trenches with than Senator Keneally and, of course, the manager of opposition business, Senator Gallagher. Um, uh, she has extraordinary skill, finesse and diplomacy in performing one of the most gruelling and complex jobs in the parliament. Her EQ is high. Mine is not. She does her best to make up for it. Did you notice that my colleagues didn't laugh at that joke? Though, though? I particularly thank her. <laughs> they said, oh, am I supposed to laugh? I particularly thank Katie for the critical role she's played in the COVID-19 Select Committee, which is one of the most far-reaching programs of work I can remember. So thank you for that. to that. Uh, can I also thank the staff of Senators Keneally and Gallagher, who are highly effective and diligent, dogged at times, and a pleasure to work with. I thank my the, our opposition whip and deputy whip, so to Anne Urquhart, Senator, Senator Ciccone and Senator McCarthy. Uh, they're a fantastic team, uh, and I thank them and their staff. Uh, my staff have said, I hope the only bells you hear over Christmas are on Santa's sleigh. <laughs> uh, can I thank my team? I thank my team for um, your commitment this year. 
uh, it is a privilege to uh, hold the position I hold, and, and uh, it makes the job so much easier knowing I have such an incredibly committed, capable and talented group of individuals supporting our effort. Uh, Anthony Albanese said this week that this is the most talented Senate caucus he can remember, uh, and he was right. So thank you for your work. To all colleagues in this chamber, in the spirit of the Christmas season, I extend my best wishes to all of you and to your families. Uh, those who love us endure a great deal, and without uh, their care and support, we wouldn't be able to do our jobs. Uh, I do want to thank the clerk, uh, the de uh, Richard Pye, the deputy clerk, Jackie Morris, Tim Bryant, Rachel Callan, and Tony Matulik, the John Begley, and all of the staff of the Department of the Senate. Uh, thank you for the work you do for the Australian democracy. Thank you particularly also to the secretaries of committees and staff of secretariats because I know how much your workload has increased. Thanks to the chamber attendants. We really appreciate um, uh, the work you do and the way in which you keep this place going. And I'm sorry my knee keeps hitting my button and you keep having to come over and see if I want anything. Thanks to all at the uh, Department of Parliamentary Service, particularly services, particular thanks to the um, Parliamentary Library, PBO, and of course also Hansard security maintenance and ancillary staff who work, the effect it, work to ensure the running of, this, of the House, of the Parliament House. I always want to mention the cleaners. Um, grateful to the work of the hardworking cleaners. Uh, we know how essential their job is to maintenance of the, our health and well-being, uh, and they always deserve more uh, than they are paid. Thanks to all uh, who work, who support what we do inside and outside the building, including the Comcar drivers, and I thank also uh, the parliamentary security team and the AFP. To the press gallery, this is, this is hard, these are hard times to work in the media, and I acknowledge the uncertainties and pressures you work under. Uh, but your work is so important because there is no democracy without you. To staff of Labor senators, I want to express my thanks. We are privileged on this side, I'm sure. Um, all, all senators would say this, to be supported by outstanding people, outstanding people. And their efforts are reflected in so much that we do, in the speeches that we deliver, the policies we de develop, uh, the operation of the institution and, of course, our ability to serve our constituents. For many staff, it has been a very demanding year. And I want to say that I recognise uh, that personal sacrifice is regrettably often so much a part of the job of being a political staffer. Uh, we are all very grateful. Can I extend my personal, express my personal gratitude to my whole team, ably led by Tom Mooney? And finally, to all the Labor members and supporters throughout Australia, including our friends in the Labor movement, on behalf of the Senate Labor team, I extend our gratitude, our solidarity, and I hope that the holiday season is a happy and safe one to you all. <laughs> to you all, who, comrades, all comrades who work inside and outside of this place, who can can you it's a term of affection <laughs> to those who work those comrades in our movement who work inside and out of this place in service of the labor cause who understand that labor governments change the country and who are working to make a federal labor government a, re a reality i thank you for your commitment your values, your aspiration, and I wish all Merry Christmas, everybody. Yeah. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. What a year the world has had. On behalf of the Australian Greens, I express the love and support to all Australians who have suffered this year. What a binfire of a year. Uh, to the formalities uh, here in the parliament, President, can we start by uh, thanking you for the important work that you've done this year to keep the chamber mostly civilised and focused during a particularly chaotic and challenging time. This has been an extremely testing year for everyone, and you have personally done well to keep it ticking along, as has your family, um, and you've been fair and patient, and you must remember to buy the trampoline for the kids for Christmas. Um, I'd like to. Uh, 
extend the Greens thanks to Clark Richard Pye, to the Deputy Clark Jackie and to all of the amazing staff at the Tables and Procedure Office, um, to Tony, to both Rachels, uh, everyone in the drafting office. Thank you for your tireless work. Um, to the Senate staff and, of course, the lovely attendants who keep this place ticking over, who thankfully don't have to bring us glasses of water anymore. We can get our own water now, so that's uh, halved their workload, at least in my uh, instance. Um, thank you very much for the work you do for us, but mostly on behalf of the Australian people. You go about your business professionally and with purpose and with patience. Have a wonderful break from all of us over the Christmas. Uh, thank you next to the gardeners. They make this place look absolutely stunning and they shine a little light onto how our public places should look. And being able to steal a few moments every so often to wander outside brings a much needed perspective to our decision making in this place. I'd also like to thank the Parliamentary Budget Office, the Parliamentary Library, of course the comm car drivers, the security staff, the baristas um, and the chefs at the trough who make fantastic chips and the Department of Parliamentary Services staff for all the service you give us uh, all hours of the moon, morning, noon and night. Uh, particular thanks, of course, to the cleaners. Um, what a year to recognise the value of cleaners, of teachers, of health workers, um, and to the IT teams for their immense efforts in keeping uh, democracy operating safely during a pandemic, particularly as we've transitioned to remote parliament. Remote parliament was a long time coming, and you did a remarkable job in getting a bunch of technophobes, um, for the most part, to successfully dial in, um, sometimes with cats and pets and other uh, children in the background, which was also delightful to see. I look forward to future discussions about the opportunities for greater participation and diverse representation that remote parliament could provide. Um, thank you to uh, the colleagues from all sides of this chamber. Um, thank you for your commitment to our nation in performing these roles. Um, we know it's not an easy job and we acknowledge the work that you do to represent your constituents, in particular um, to the crossbench as well. Um, thank you to all of the staff of all of you in this building and it's important that we keep those staff safe in this workplace from harassment, from bullying um, and ensure that their interests are best protected. I look forward to working more on that collectively as we resume next year. Um, thank you, of course, to all the engaged citizens in our electorates who contact us with stories, with ideas, with sometimes robust critiques. It's critical to democracy that we remain connected to the people that we represent. I'd, of course, like to thank my wonderful Greens Senate team, uh, all true friends and passionate advocates. Um, a particular thanks to all of our green staff who keep us on track and special mention uh, to Claire, to Colin, to Rod, to Jay and to my staff, uh, Jess and Justine, who come here to Canberra. Um, we couldn't do any of this without you. It's been a big change uh, this year for our party with a change of leadership and the wonderful member for Melbourne, Adam Bant, has handled this year marvellously despite a pandemic and working on the wrong side of the building. Um, and we we're also pleased to welcome our fierce new senator, Lydia Thorpe, who, I might add, makes this place majority female for the first time in its history. I want to particularly thank Rachel, our whip, um, for the power of work that she does not only to advocate never-endingly for vulnerable Australians, but to also wrangle the bunch of us, some of us easier than others to wrangle. I think Rach is the best whip in this place and probably will be the best whip that this place ever sees. Um, I, on a personal note, I want to say thank you uh, to my daughters and my family for their love and support. The work of everyone in this place comes at the cost to our family, and uh, none of us could do this without them. My oldest daughter graduated from primary school yesterday, and I'm very much looking forward to giving her a cuddle and celebrating tomorrow. I'm sure everyone's similarly in that boat. Thank you all for the sacrifice and the commitment and the passion you bring to these roles. I'll just sign off by saying to those of you who don't believe in Christmas, not mentioning any names, happy non-denominational, gender neutral, environmentally sustainable, socially responsible holidays. Uh, for the rest of you, happy Christmas. <laughs> Senator McKenzie. Oh, well, I believe in Christmas, but um, thank you very much. I'd like to associate the Nationals with all of the wonderful words that have been uh, mentioned tonight. 2020 for regional Australia has been a tough one. Started it with the drought. It's broken in a lot of places, which has been fantastic, and we've seen bumper season, bushfires, floods, uh, and obviously COVID. 
um, where if you're in a border town, you couldn't, as Senator Keneally had to um, experience, be with loved ones at very difficult times. Um, you're separated. And I know there's so many of us around this chamber, around our uh, nation, who are very thankful premiers have finally opened the borders and that they can actually catch up with their very dear um, family and loved ones at this particular period. Thanks to our government for actually making the tough decisions and steering our nation uh, as best as possible to protect lives and livelihoods. And I think it, relatively uh, to the rest of the world, we can be very um, confident that the right decisions were made. Thank you to the opposition for supporting our government uh, in many of those very, very difficult programs that have supported uh, Border Australia. Thank you to our frontline workers uh, with respect to COVID. Um, it's scary sending your loved one onto the front line, and I, uh, we just want to say thank you to them. Thank you to the, all the staff of Parliament House. You keep it ticking. Um, it hasn't been an easy year. To the CFA, the RFSs, thank you. Um, Simon, thank you very much for your leadership of the government in the Senate, um, and I look forward to working <coughs> with you very closely on behalf of our two uh, parties within a strong coalition in 2021. Uh, Vale Matias, uh, the he, legend, uh, but he's been with us much. <laughs> no, no, well, he's left. Okay, Penny, he's left the building. It, no, no, I'm not saying. Okay, all right, it's all right, it's late. Um, I want to say thank you to the fantastic National Party Senate team. We have rocked. Like, we've done very, very well on behalf of our communities and the people that sent us here this year, and I'm really looking forward to you all getting a good rest and uh, recuperation and coming back fighting in 2021. Thank you to Paul Murray for letting Matt arrive late to his Daily Sky interview <laughs> today. Um, and just wish everybody in the chamber, all your family, a very blessed and sacred uh, Christmas season. Thank you. Thank you.